Graphic Audio presents Don Pendleton's Mac Bolan. Narrated by Jeff Baker. With performances by Terence Aselford, Nanette Savard, Richard Rowan, Casey Jones, Thomas Penny, David Coyne, Christopher Walker, and Mort Shelby. Mac Bolan, number 81, Deep Treachery. Adin Sayal feared he was about to finally pay for his role in the rape of Kuwait. It wasn't anything he could explain, at least not in rational terms. There was the sudden knotting in his stomach, an inexplicable coldness in the chest. It left him wondering if he was the right man for the job, chosen as he was out of nowhere by the one who called himself the messenger. Incredible. There he was, less than 24 hours away from tasting ultimate revenge, and fear was threatening to eat him alive. Pull it together, he told himself. It's just a routine border check. So why was he so riddled with doubt and anxiety? Before he was swallowed up by the night, the messenger had told Sayal to hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. In other words, Sayal thought, no sacrifice for the jihad was too small in the eyes of God. Perhaps all sacrifices, whether great or small, had humble origins in a man's personal commitment to truth and righteousness. Sayal's search for sacrifice had begun six months before, when the messenger had come to him out of the dark, a nameless, shadowy man with all the answers. He gave Sayal a whole new identity. The messenger provided all the necessary visas and passports that would allow him and his two fellow Iraqis and their families to establish themselves in Montreal. Enough cash was waiting for them on the other end to get the ruse started in earnest. They were instructed to build a life as a family of rug weavers and pottery makers, start their own shop and blend into the urban scenery. In short, remain quiet and humble, going along with the western flow, until they were called upon to act. And if they had to, they were to sacrifice their own women and children. No exceptions. After all, this was war. The messenger had made it sound so easy, so simple, so right. Vengeance for all the wrongs and injustices inflicted on Islamic peoples the world over. In fact, the messenger seemed to know so much about Sayal's former life as a Republican Guard colonel that, even though he was Sunni Muslim, he began to think of the messenger as the twelfth Imam, just like a Shiite. They believed in one holy descendant of Muhammad, who had never died, remaining hidden in the world until the time of the great calling for all Islamic peoples. And the messenger had stated it was long since time for all Muslims to put aside their personal and ideological differences, uniting to triumph over the great Satan and regain their former glory. Sayal drew a deep breath and decided he had a simple case of jumpy nerves. He opened his eyes and, of course, the border checkpoint was unchanged. He slowly rolled ahead, closing the gap between his minivan and a red Toyota with New York plates, then waited in the dark again. Try as he might, he couldn't get rid of the fear. The first indication it might all go to hell right here at the border between Quebec and New York was the three state police cruisers parked on the American side. The second bad omen was coming into sight up ahead, framed in the headlights, the shadowy forms of three customs agents marching in lockstep with a uniformed cop. The foursome regarded his vehicle and passengers from the distance. Sayal curled his fingers around the steering wheel, heart pounding. Beside him, Ali Basrat gave his jaw a nervous massage. From directly behind him, Sayal heard the older brother, Abdul Basrat, speak in Arabic, as Sayal had earlier instructed. I count three cruisers. Where are the other policemen? Sayal looked into the rearview mirror, searching for the right words to tell them all there was nothing to fear, even though everyone in the van knew that that was as far from the truth as they were from Baghdad. It was difficult to stay calm when fifty-some pounds of plastic explosive was packed inside the door panels. It was even more nerve-wracking for Sayal, since he had the hell box in his coat pocket. The C-4 was wired up to one radio frequency, ready to blow their target along with themselves to paradise, leaving behind nothing but a smoking crater. Abdul's wife, Sisara, 
and their two teenage sons, Naim and Jabal, were squeezed in beside the former tank commander of the 1st Republican Guard Brigade. Cesara was a dark-haired beauty, and as instructed by the messenger, she had forsaken the traditional black veil and abaya, wearing instead a white blouse, blue jeans, and a suede jacket. Her hair was tied back in a ponytail, revealing stunning beauty that made Sayal think privately that it was a sin for her to even consider wearing a veil. While both sons were outfitted in baggy pants and Montreal Expos baseball caps, worn backward, of course, the uniform of the day for the rebellious young Westerner, the men were clean-shaven, short hair, windbreakers and jeans, no beards, beads or kafias, nothing at all that would point to their nationality. But if Sayal was under the illusion that they could just blend in by wearing Western fashions, his hopes were fading the longer the troopers stood and stared at them. Sayal wondered if the cop was memorizing the license plate, preparing to run a check on it. A moment later, he was sure, as the trooper and two of the customs agents turned and disappeared inside one of the guard booths. Ali kept rubbing his face. See how the customs man simply waves the other vehicles through. A quick look inside, no search, no examination of any bags, smiling, waving. All Western faces, American or Canadian. Have a nice day, welcome to America, he says. He will look at us hard. He will ask us questions. Sayal was growing angry and more nervous. He wanted them to shut up. But sure enough, Abdul had to keep the anxiety ball rolling. I heard on some news program how American police engage in profiling of drivers. You drive up I-95 from Florida, you are black or Hispanic, you must have drugs, just like that. They think they are God because they are on the side of their so-called law. They may even detain us. They have that power. We have Arab passports. We must be terrorists. They have computers inside those booths. They are sure to be hooked into INS. Pray to God our new identities hold. If not... Stifling the urge to lash out and tell them to stop braying like old women, Sayal watched on as the customs agent went through the motions with the Toyota. Something about the trooper didn't feel right. On the ride down from Montreal, the former Iraqi Republican Guard colonel had expected little, if any, traffic going into America from Canada at that early morning hour. He was right on that count. There were only three vehicles ahead of them. The American customs man gave the visas, driver's licenses, and registrations a cursory exam before waving the other vehicles through. No search of the interiors. Everything quick and routine, just as the messenger's contact promised. They were next, and Sayal's gut told him it was all about to change. Suddenly, Sayal saw the future, and somewhere in his heart, he believed it was linked to his past. It was easy enough to rationalize the plunder. When Sayal led the rolling waves of Soviet T-72 tanks into Kuwait, he knew it was the richest per capita country on Earth, pumping out something like a billion barrels of oil a year. Kuwaitis had grown rich, fat, and soft, protected by the great Satan, simply because they were sitting on all that fossil fuel, which was under land that rightfully belonged to Iraq anyway. Still, it wasn't the spoils of war that threatened to release the ghosts of the past. No, it was the blood on his hands. How many Kuwaitis had he tortured during the seven months of occupation? How many had he hung, naked and upside down in the police headquarters he'd taken over as his command center? How many genitals had he burned off with either cigarettes, lighters or electrical wires? Another glance at Sisara, and he wondered if she knew the truth about her husband. How many Kuwaiti women had Abdul raped, then mutilated and decapitated, hanging their heads from lampposts for their husbands, brothers and sons to see? And Brother Ali? Well, the stories about him were nothing short of legendary. Ali seemed to enjoy trepanning Kuwaiti skulls and cutting out their brains. The customs man was knocking on the driver's side window. Everyone give me your passports. Fayal put on his best kiss-up smile. Good morning, sir. How are you this morning? The customs man accepted all the passports and visas. Uh-huh. Looks like you know the drill. The drill? Never mind. Sayal saw the customs man look past him toward the glove compartment. Sayal felt his heart lurch. The false compartment fixed beneath the glove box hid an Italian Spectre submachine gun, a 50-round box of 9mm parabellum rounds up its snout. Sayal saw the man studying the glove box, then felt his own hand twitching. 
If the agent reached for his holstered sidearm, Sayal would haul out the Belgian BDA-9 double-action pistol that was fixed in a makeshift frame under his seat. Abdul would go for his own BDA. I also need to see your driver's license and the vehicle's registration, sir. Ali opened the glove box, and Sayal thought he would scream in horror when one edge of the false compartment gave way. Thinking quickly, Ali gently cupped the palm of his hand beneath the edge and somehow quietly fastened it back on. No luggage, sir? Good. The customs man had been too busy looking around the interior, studying faces, actually smiling like some fool at Cesara. No, my sister-in-law's mother. She lives in Albany. She has fallen ill, and we left in a hurry. Oh, yeah. I thought you people all lived under one roof, uh, one big happy family. Sayal managed a tight smile and thought, and don't forget the camel. Just joking. Uh, give me a few minutes, sir. The customs man started to walk away, inspecting the passports. Sayal heard Ali speak in Arabic. They know. Has someone tipped them off? And everything changed forever in the next heartbeat. It was as if a dark cloud dropped over the custom agent's face as he wheeled, hand falling over his pistol. Know what? Who would tip us off about what? Sayal was stunned. It was so silent in the van, he believed he could hear the collective beating of hearts. Yeah, that's right. I understand Arabic. I'm a go for van. All of you get out of the van. Right? Bragging killed the customs agent, giving Sayal enough time to snap up the Belgian BDA and thrust it out the window. Sayal blew half the man's face off, then glanced at the rest of the passengers in the van. Go with God! Sayal barged out the door, sighting down the pistol as the trooper came out of the booth, his own pistol out and barking. There was no turning back, no driving on. It was time to go to paradise, take as many of the infidels with them as they could. It was little more than a flash in the corner of his eye, but Sayal caught Ali cutting loose with the Italian SMG, and the younger of the Basrat brothers was falling. Sayal marched ahead, pumping out round after round. It was the fourth shot that slammed through the trooper's forehead and sent him toppling back into the booth, legs folding under him like rubber. Sayal heard the repeating thunder of Abdul's BDA. It ended, though, as quickly as it began. Beside the booth, two shotguns exploded the darkness. Sayal was vaguely aware of the cracking din of pistols before he found himself falling. His right arm flew away, ripped off at the shoulder by 12-gauge buckshot. Funny how he felt no pain as he found himself staring at the stars. Don't move, asshole! It was awkward reaching across his body, delving into his pocket. Something like fiery needles began digging into his legs and stomach, causing him to flinch and twitch. They were shooting him up, he realized, as he felt the warm stickiness of his life's juices hitting him in the face. Shadow figures rolled his way. Good, a little closer now, he thought, as he flicked the switch to activate the radio signal. What the hell is he smiling about? I am smiling, infidels, because I am about to blow all of you straight to hell! He felt a sensation of lifting up to the heavens, toward paradise, the screams of a mother and her children lost in the din and the darkness. The roar and thunder from above made him flinch in his seat. The jets were on simple nighttime maneuvers over the Chesapeake Bay, screaming inland over Norfolk for any one of the many naval and air bases in what the infidels called the Hampton Roads area. But that hellish shriek of turbofan engines had been causing him nightmares for a solid two months, reminding him of a day he so desperately wished to forget. They had been holed up in a motel in Virginia Beach since landing in America, waiting for their contact to give them further instructions. For two months, he'd endured the near around-the-clock shriek and thunder of the fighter jets. Two months of recurring nightmares where he saw winged lions roaring out of black clouds, parting on peals of thunder, the beasts surging out of jagged fingers of lightning. He heard himself screaming in the nightmares as the winged beasts descended on him. But just before they clamped their jaws over his legs and arms, he always jolted awake, thrashing. A vision of the future, he wondered. A warning from God? Or guilt over having been one of the few survivors that day? More than a decade later, and Hafiq Muswat could still see the highway of death, still hear the terrible thunder of the B-52s, the snarling of the 30-millimeter chain guns on the Apache gunships, 
The hideous wailing of men burned alive in the cabs of fuel tankers or torched inside the hulls of T-72s. The buses and vans, stuffed with plunder, lifted and hurled for hundreds of yards across the desert by the American air attack. The vision of hell on earth was so vivid, it could have happened five minutes ago. As they drove for the gate to the new Vepco plant, he might be reliving the horror again, but this time there would be a permanent closure. No ensuing nightmares, no jolting awake in a cold sweat. The van's wheelman, Farik, had been there also, and Muswat looked over, hoping his brother in jihad had not seen the fear and doubt on his face, relieved to find his comrade focused on the gate ahead. Brothers in holy war. It had indeed been a long and frightful journey just to arrive at this point. They were two of a handful of survivors of the retreat from Kuwait City when the sky had rained fire and death on the road to Basra. Somehow they crawled off, left countless others dying. Somehow they eluded the Marines and the roving fighter jets during the long weeks when they had trekked back to Baghdad, only to find it in ruins. And worse, their immediate families had perished during the bombing by the infidels. With nothing left to lose, searching for something, anything to give their pitiful existence meaning, they had moved far away from the demolished Baghdad. The next stop was the desert village of al Buswaj, to the north, where they settled in with relatives, the two of them eventually finding work with the execution squads. Thirty dinar per Kurdish head wasn't much, but it went a little ways toward dulling the edge of their rage and hate. The nameless shadow man came to them one night, just over two months ago. He gave them instructions, identification papers, and cash enough to ensure their relatives were comfortable. The younger cousins wouldn't have to stalk the dangerous and cunning Kurds for blood money. Then they left for America, intending to take two eyes for one. There it is. Muswat followed Farik's gesture to the skeletal towers, the high tension wires that made up the electrical power grid. All things considered, it seemed an unlikely target. He would have preferred to stroll into one of the hotels, even a crowded restaurant in Virginia Beach, cut loose with the compact Ingram Mac-10 now in his lap, killing as many infidels as possible before he committed martyrdom by cop. Orders were orders, though, and someone else was footing the tab for their ticket to paradise. And since it was the off-season, he couldn't imagine giving it all up to God on a nearly deserted resort town of penniless drifters and bums no one would ever miss. He glanced over his shoulder into the shadowy back of the van and saw the two 55-gallon drums, the universal radiation signs staring back at him. The lids were ajar, but since both of them were going to perish when he touched off the 300 pounds of plastic explosive beneath the tarp, there was nothing to fear from exposure to radioactive waste. With any luck, the waste would take to the air on the fireball and be quickly dumped into the reservoir the power plant used to supply water to the superheating chambers below ground. And if God was truly smiling on them, maybe the Chesapeake Bay itself would become a vast body of poisoned water. A number of questions nagged at Muswat's mind. Who exactly was the messenger? Who was the contact in America? And how did he get his hands on radioactive waste? Why a power plant? If the idea was to knock out power to Norfolk or points beyond, well, there might be a transformer or two in the power grid, but the majority of the power station was below ground. Well, if they were being used as a statement, so be it. He had been informed there were many others out there right now doing the same thing they were about to do. War had been declared on the great Satan, and that was good enough for him. A lone security guard stepped out into the light washing over the booth. Go with God. Go with God. Framed like some frightened animal in the headlights, the guard froze, then dived off to the side as Farid crashed through the gate. Even though the power plant had to stay open around the clock, there were only a few vehicles in the sprawling lot, a line of vans with Vepco painted on the side. Not much by way of personnel, but the living here would be left with their own vision of hell for some time to come. He wished them many nightmares. Farik whipped the wheel hard to the left, barreling straight for the razor-top chain-link fence of the power grid. Muswat glanced into the side-view mirror. He saw the security guard running after them in vain, his mouth working frantically over his handheld radio, arms flapping. The man looked to him like some flailing chicken in a suit. 
The steel skeletons loomed as Farik roared ahead. 20 meters. 10. This was it. A few more heartbeats and they would sail to paradise. Allah Akbar! Farik seemed to vent every last bit of rage and hate he felt toward the country. Pulling out the detonator box, Muswat lit up the red light and thumbed the doomsday button. Boston. Boston was familiar turf for Mac Bolin, an old hunting ground where a Green Beret sergeant had cut his teeth on mafia blood, what now felt like a hundred lifetimes, a thousand battlefields ago. Bolin had been jacked up on adrenaline ever since he had started the watch and wait phase at Logan Airport's Terminal E, the International Arrivals Building, waiting on flight 346 from Heathrow. Perhaps it was the rumblings of fear echoing out of the State Department, the CIA, and the NSA that the borders of America were being poked and prodded by suspected terrorists searching for openings to slip into the country and do what? Two weeks ago, an Arab man of undetermined origin was arrested at the Canadian border with Vermont. His van was loaded with a crate of AK-47s and enough C-4 to blow away every resident inside three square city blocks. Was there a connection to a larger, more insidious scheme? International terrorists sweeping into America, armed to the teeth, prepared to commit suicide just so they could blow up some landmark, slaughter untold, innocent citizens? No one could say for certain, but the cyber wizards at Stony Man Farm were hard at work seeking out some answers. Times had changed. It was a different game now. Nuclear blackmail, industrial espionage, shaky alliances with old foes who were now skipping off with all manner of classified intelligence. The faces of the enemy changed, Bolin thought, but they still did what they did best. The memories of his own baptism by fire wanted to come back, but the soldier locked them up in the deepest corners of his mind, where they all belonged anyway. What was done was done. The men in the Lincoln town car that Bolin was tailing knew they were made. A shadowy head turned back in his direction every few blocks. The soldier had followed Habib Najim right out of the terminal. A cabbie whose assistance had been assured by Bolin's Justice Department credentials and a 20 spot, waited by his sedan. Once outside the terminal, Najim, masquerading as a Lebanese jeweler, had climbed into the waiting town car. The two men in that vehicle now shot out of the Callahan Tunnel and headed south on Washington Street. Destination unknown, intent yet to be determined. Bolin thought back to his talk with Hal Brognola, the Justice Department liaison to the President of the United States, who ran the sensitive operations group out of the super-secret Stony Man farm. The rumor mill had been churning since the arrest of Mr. Mystery Arab, who had promptly clammed up. Brognola had worked his contacts inside the FBI and the CIA, but came up with more questions than answers. Najim had been tracked from Beirut to London, where the FBI and Interpol had him under surveillance. Najim was a suspected bagman for various Islamic fundamentalist groups, the identity of Najim's lord and master unknown, but the Lebanese provided cash, contacts, and phony passports for a few of the more militant Muslims so they could move freely about to scheme, kill, and blow things up. Brognola had ordered the FBI team tracking Najim to back off ready to insert his own man who would pick up the Lebanese once he hit Boston. And there Bolin was, sent out to get a few answers. As usual, when the mission involved asking tough questions, he assumed the snatch and follow-up interrogation would be done the hard way. In the event that it all went to hell, meaning one or both of his targets decided to stand and fight, the soldier had come prepared. The standard hardware was packed beneath his knee-length black leather trench coat, the Beretta 93R in shoulder rigging, the mammoth 44 Magnum Desert Eagle autoloader riding on his hip. Stowed in the trunk, the nylon war bag carried everything from a secured sat link with fax to a variety of grenades, skin-tight black suit, and HK-33 assault rifle with modified M203 grenade launcher, spare clips, a mini Uzi, two law rocket launchers, and a stubby multi-round projectile launcher. Mr. Fidget number one shot them another look as the wheelman bored the town car down Washington. Bolin thought he saw Najim bend to reach for something on the floorboard. Bolin's mental radar began blipping. 
Chinatown was Boston's financial and retail district. Even with all the glitz and glitter of fashion and money, Boland noted the shadows of street people shuffling around. The executioner put them out of mind when the luxury car's wheelman started playing games with the traffic lights. Once, then twice he slowed when the light flashed yellow, then tapped the gas and blew through it when it changed to red. With no serious traffic around, the soldier had no problem staying glued to their bumper. They were running scared, and Bolin wanted them that way. At some point soon, they'd make a stand. When the town car swung onto Essex, it barreled along a block or so, then tore into a vacant lot. The wheelman barreled out the door, brandishing a compact SMG, maybe an Ingram Mac 10. Game time. The executioner ducked beneath the steering wheel and floored the gas. A mental calculation of range and position of target, and the soldier aimed the grill of the big sedan straight for the subgunner, ready to squash the guy into roadkill. Whatever silly bastard named Boston, the cradle of American independence, should see it today, he thought. It was a freak show out there once a man crossed the imaginary boundaries of the city and took a stroll through Roxbury, Dorchester, or Jamaica Plain. No, Delta Force Colonel Bob Powers didn't think Paul Revere would rein in his horse and salute the crack dealers, pimps, and prostitutes, tip his tricorn hat to all the addicts, petty thieves, and gangbangers and do-rags. Well, these days, Boston was pretty much just like any other city in America, except he just couldn't tolerate the phony, staid, upper-crust face the town's self-proclaimed elite put on for the rest of the country. Hell, Sam Adams had his name and face plastered on a beer, and the ghost of John Hancock headed up an insurance company. Well, soon he'd take another little sojourn for justice, do his part to make Boston a kinder and gentler place for the town's elite. A fleeting chill hit Powers just then, but he cut off the angry memory before it took shape in his mind. If this didn't go down right, by the numbers, he knew he was finished. The alleged targets were Palestinian terrorists, four in all, holed up in a Bowfront Victorian in the South End. The house was empty, of course. The Palestinians gone two hours ago to hunker down in a safer haven. But only Powers knew that. A silent shadow, Powers led his four-man team up and over the low chain-link fence. They moved down the side of the house in a crouch, HK MP5 subguns leading the way. Powers gave the hand signal to hold up at the back edge and hit a button on his chronometer to light up the time. Fifty seconds and counting. The FBI special agent, his partner of sorts, it sometimes galled him to even think of his name, was right then in Detroit, doing the same thing the same way, with the same expected results. A glance over his shoulder, and Powers found Jameson giving him a look. Before moving in, Jameson had voiced the one question Powers would be later called on to answer. Why was the surveillance team called off two hours ago, sir? During that time, the tangos could have cleared out. If the kid only knew. Well, there would be an answer to that one, Powers thought, but the real truth could never be known. Not to Jameson or anyone else. Powers put a finger to his lips shook his head at the young commando. They were up and moving, gaining speed as Powers led the way up the back steps. They split up, two ready to go high left, two low to the right once the door was crashed. They flanked the door, listened to the silence around them. Just as Michael slipped the battering ram off his shoulder, Powers found it, exactly where it should be. Waving Michaels off, he took his mini flashlight, shone the beam on the thin red cord curling out between the jam and the door. Fall back! Powers gave it a few more seconds, knowing it had to go down in perfect sync, aware his own butt was in the pan and about to get fried. War always called for men to sacrifice their lives, and this raid, as bogus as it was, was no exception. He didn't think he could live with himself if he gave up his own men to further his personal agenda, but figured the world wouldn't miss a few overpaid feds. Some of them cut down, or in this case, blown all to hell and back in the line of duty, would be just another statement to the ones who thought they were in power. Powers was bounding down the steps, tapping the button of his comlink, raising supervisory special agent Jordan, when he saw the doomsday numbers ticking off to four, three. His men were already vaulting over the low fence, scrambling for deeper cover behind a vehicle parked in the alley. Jordan, it's a trap. The house is wired. What the... Powers was sailing over the fence when the world erupted in fire and thunder behind him. 
He landed hard on his helmet, senses pulverized by the roar of the blast, the superheated windstorm of the explosion racing up his rear. Even as the wreckage rained around him, the sky above lit up like the 4th of July. Powers felt extremely pleased with himself. He put on a good front for the troops, but the best was yet to come. Detroit. Detroit was nothing but a vast industrial sewer as far as Special Agent Paul Greavy was concerned. Factory smokestacks spewed clouds of noxious gas into the air, while spill pipes pumped poisonous sludge into the Great Lakes. The city itself was a savage wasteland of crime, corruption, and drugs, not too unlike most big U.S. cities these days. Greavy had spent all of two days in the town made famous by the automobile, and already he couldn't wait to get the hell out of there. He could only imagine the hunting expeditions his partner could undertake here, indulging his killer instincts. Back to business, he chided himself. He was pretty sure his partner had already paid Motown a visit sometime in the past. We haven't seen the first sign they're even still inside, sir. Before, they left at least one light on in the living room, a man posted to watch the street. The lights are out. The place looks deserted. Your point? I don't understand why you ordered the surveillance team pulled off the block two hours ago. The big SAC hoisted the weight of his Kevlar vest with a shrug of his shoulders, cradling the HK MP5 subgun in massive hams. Take a look at where we are, son. Their black van had just come to a stop on Michigan Avenue, west off Burner Highway. The worrywart, Agent Klieger, was a pink-faced, scrubby kid, not a full year out of Quantico, staring out from beneath a balaclava helmet that appeared a half-size too large. Two more agents, Chalmers and Bitsdale, were hunched, eyes shining in the soft overhead light with either fear or pre-combat nerves. Greavy couldn't say. Another van of agents was one block north, ready to go as soon as he gave the word over his comlink. Even before the dickless wonders in Washington saw the need to put together and finance a formidable, experienced, and skilled counter-terrorist unit, Greavy knew he'd need to offer up cannon fodder at some point if he was to pull off his own agenda. Too bad, he decided in a rare moment of regret. Klieger had placed at the top of his class at Quantico all around, especially out on the firing range. Young wife, a baby on the way. Well, he may or may not live out the next minutes. Fate was a fickle bitch. Sir? The kid still didn't get it. Maybe he wasn't all that smart after all, he thought. Maybe Quantico had lowered the standards these days. Son, this is Crack Central. No one sleeps in these neighborhoods. I didn't want a van or an unmarked car spotted by some lookout who would sound the alarm all over this godforsaken hellhole. Our three Palestinian friends would just sashay out the door and drive off. Might be another week if we're lucky before we could pick up the scent again. Uh, yes, sir. I, I understand, sir. Good. Any more questions, gentlemen? That was that. Knuckles started popping as fists tightened around the subguns. Time to do it. Greavy tapped the button on his comlink. Frontside bogeyman to backdoor tigers. Come in. Agent Jackson's voice patched through. Backdoor tigers all looks quiet on the northern front, sir. We're ready when you are. Synchronized now. Thirty seconds and counting to reach your positions. I'll give the word to slam and wham. Go. Greavy led the charge out the side door. They were running shadows, dashing across Michigan, Greavy watching the red brick house that was dark and looked as abandoned as he knew it was. Sure enough, a shadow here and there broke into a dash down the sidewalk. FBI was stenciled on their jackets, and Greavy knew there were at least five, maybe more major crack houses operating on that one block alone. Of course, the human watchdogs had no idea. He could care less if their homies and their whores smoked themselves into the ER. Something far more serious than a simple drug raid was going down. Greavy hit a crouch, adjusting his throat mic as he waved his team past. Go! Go! Press the door! Go in shooting! Don't look at you hostile! Get Miller Dancer! Something had gone terribly wrong, and Greavy's mind seethed with a slew of questions that would probably never get answered to his satisfaction. This was his baby, one he had elected a week ago to give away to the opposition, show them he could play ball, fair and square. Now his man on the other side had decided, for whatever reason, to make it all into some grandstand showdown. Greavy watched his troops storm the front steps, one of them moving on the front door with a battering ram. 
A part of him wanted to feel shame over what he was about to do, but another voice told him he'd come too far to turn back now. He pulled out the small box. If his boy had decided to snip the wires, Greedy depressed the button. Boston. The cyclic rate of any machine gun tended to ride the barrel high. Whether it was panic, lack of experience, or simply haste to get the job done, the shooter started high, his first line of slugs wasted on the top half of the windshield, a few more rounds rising to slash off the edge of the roof, when Boland ended the hard man's stand before he could correct his error and try again. The town car's door absorbed the weight of the shooter on the launch, glass blasting over his sailing form, the severed door spinning away. Bolin caught a glimpse of the hard man slamming into a dark wall beyond, pinned there in a sloppy crucifixion for a couple of eye blinks before he slid to the ground. The executioner shouldered his way out the door, the Beretta 93R out and tracking. Najim was also getting it together right then, hauling into view an Ingram Mac 10. Down but not out, the wheelman was stirring to life, rising over the roof of the town car. A dark red hole blossomed between the wheelman's eyes, his face appearing stark white, etched in a permanent scowl as it was framed in the town car's headlights. Death to America! Najim held back on the trigger, sweeping the barrel, clearly spraying and praying he'd score flesh. Bola, crouched and scuttling for the rear of his rental, was more than willing to oblige the Arab's death wish. You will not take me alive! We are at war with you! This is only the beginning! Enough. Bolin knew the magazine would burn out, and a split second of an echo of the din and the sudden silence was all he needed. He got it. The problem was, Najim was there and ready with a pistol as Bolin rose. The Arab shot went high and wide, a slipstream of hot lead grazing Bolin's earlobe. The executioner made certain he got it right the first time. Najim's head snapped back as if he'd been kicked in the jaw and he toppled out of sight. Bolin knew it was pointless to search the dead, confiscate any passports, any other ID. Even Stony Man Farm, he suspected, would hit a dead end if they went into cyberspace, hoping some detective work would track down the source of their phony credentials. The game here was as dead as Najim and his wheelman. Bolin didn't see the point in getting corralled by Boston's finest, while Brognola went to the red tape mat to get him free. The soldier was sweeping the glass off his seat when his cell phone with its secured line trilled. There was only one frequency, tied into a series of cutout numbers. Brognola either wanted a sit rep or had some news. Bolin punched send, settled back behind the wheel, checking the dark stillness of the empty lot, listening to the silence. Striker? I'm here. It's already started. Atlanta. Happiness was a vast sea of slaughtered infidels. Nasir Abdil's search for his own version of true rapture, though, was stalled by a traffic jam on Interstate 75. He bit down a vicious curse over what he perceived as another slap in the face by fate. But maybe not, he thought. Perhaps he could work this snarl to his advantage, create the kind of carnage he craved to wreak all of his life. Still, 33 years of hardship and disappointment seemed to have trailed him to America, and he couldn't help but wonder if this was just another Zionist dagger in his side, or was God merely testing his resolve, his courage to do what he'd been called upon to do. Either way, he would decide the issue in a few short minutes. He had come too far, suffered too much to let this opportunity escape, along with his rightful seat in paradise. He gave silent praise to God for seeing fit to at long last bless his struggle. It hadn't always felt this good. For as long as he could remember, he had wondered if his life, half of which had been spent languishing in the squalor and filth of the refugee camps on the West Bank, watching in helpless rage while his brothers and sisters starved to death, was nothing but a wasted and empty existence of poverty and bitterness. Even though he'd struck out on his own years later, a car bombing now and then, a skirmish with Israeli soldiers maybe once a year. It had all felt like more of the same endless, angry running in circles, searching for some way to fight back against the oppressors of his people. Funny how all that changed overnight, 
when the Palestinian had finally caught the break of a lifetime seven months ago. It seemed he was chosen for greatness after all. He was going to be shipped off to America, flown straight out of Beirut, with a student visa from the man who had come out of the night, the one who called himself the messenger. An established Palestinian family would take him into their home in a suburb north of Atlanta. Do not worry about the details, he'd been told. It was all taken care of. Have faith. Go with God. He would find glory in America, he was finally told, but it would come at the ultimate cost of his own life. His wife and four children would be provided for by the messenger. Palestinians in Beirut were prepared to receive his family into their home to build a new life. Abdil figured he had nothing to lose and everything to gain by striking his own major blow against the great Satan. The previous night the call had come in. The unfamiliar voice gave him directions to go to a bakery owned by Palestinians. There he picked up a package, received his instructions, in writing, of course, since it was a well-known fact the American FBI was everywhere, and returned to his temporary home. There he burned his written jihad orders. Sleep never came, visions of his final day on earth going to paradise on a blast of glory that would send countless infidels to hell, fueled a living fire in his belly the entire night. Tomorrow is here, and it was a good day to go to God. I'm sorry, buddy, but we sit. I still got to run the meter. The cabbie was shrugging, shaking his head, trying to act apologetic as he turned on the time meter and the numbers began clicking off every few seconds. Abdil was certain the American was wondering whether he could afford the fare. Happens twice a week, freaking Atlanta traffic. It's some of the worst in the country, I know that. I tell you what, all you need is a fender bender and we could be stuck here for an hour, maybe more. Sun won't even be up for another 15, 20 minutes. I swear I don't know where all these people come from anyway. Whole town's just one huge parking lot. The cabbie spat tobacco juice into a coffee cup scratching his beard, wiggling around in his seat, eyeing the frozen lines of cars. Abdul saw brand new minivans, Porsches, a Jaguar. There was one American to a car for the most part, space and privacy a luxury every single American appeared to enjoy. Burning with resentment, he eyed a couple of fresh scrubbed men in fancy suits, yammering away on cell phones, winding up for a big day, no doubt, making deals fattening up personal bank accounts. Americans, he thought. How could they have so much when he had so little? He was a man, a holy warrior in the eyes of God. He should have been blessed with the wealth and all the creature comforts and pleasures they seemed to take for granted. The cabbie didn't know it yet, but his passenger was in charge of the immediate destinies of everyone around them, was about to invade their personal space forever. And even with the Atlanta skyline no less than a mile ahead, Abdul so close to his objective, he decided an abrupt change in plans was in order. He'd been instructed to find a crowded street corner, even a deli, some place where a throng was gathered. He searched the faces in the cars beside them again, beyond the obvious irritation on their faces of being forced to sit in traffic. They looked lifeless to the Palestinian, as good as dead, he thought. Abdul cursed them. You say something, buddy? The Palestinian found the cabbie eyeing his long, tattered green raincoat, his scraggly mane of curly black hair, the unkempt beard the manager at the restaurant where he'd slaved as a busboy had always insisted he cut, and under threat of termination. Terminate this, he thought, feeling the weight beneath his coat wrapped around his torso, all of it wired up and ready to blow with one touch of his finger on the button. From his coat pocket, he took a hundred-dollar bill. Leaning forward, he let it slip from his hand, fluttered to the seat beside the cabbie. What's that for? Your silence. You some kind of smart ass? You sitting here thinking maybe I'm thinking you can't pay? Were you? Before the cabbie could prattle on and spit more of the vile brown substance into his coffee cup, Abdil made his final decision. This was as good a place as any. I have been in this country my first time for seven months now. I look around, I see a few who have much and too many who have nothing. They want, they take, they whine if they can't have it. They watch your abominable talk shows, the ones where so-called guests boast about their indiscretions and marital infidelities. Your own children even bragging about their disobedience and rebellion. What the... People disgust me. You are nothing more than animals to me. 
Here, if you do not have money, you have no fame, you are looked down upon, if you are even noticed at all. You even turn your women into whores and wonder why your families fall apart. What the hell are you talking about? You some kind of commie religious nut? Where are you from, anyway? Spring Hill. I know where I picked you up. I am from Palestine. Where? You wouldn't understand. What I believe, what I feel in my heart, is beyond you. You know something? I tell you what, you can take that hundred and stick it up your ass and get the hell out of my cab. Abdul produced the small box from his coat pocket, held it up for the cabbie to see. The American's gaze frozen in the rearview glass. <gasps> this is a detonator box. Opening his coat, he smiled as the American's eyes widened in horror at the sight of the red wires lacing the bundles of white bricks, the cabbie's lip quivering, coffee cup disappearing as he snatched at the door handle. If you wish to kick me out, after you. Boston. It just got even worse, Stryker. One or two more like this. I don't even want to say the words martial law, but we're getting close. I'll know just how close after I talk to the man. After what little Brognola had filled him in on, Folan didn't see how it could get any worse than what he'd already heard. But if the Congress, Senate, and the President ordered the military to seize control of certain cities, roll in the troops and the tanks, the soldier knew it could prove a fatal first step toward anarchy. It would be a first in American history, could well signal the beginning of the end for democracy if military law was imposed. The big Fed had already informed the soldier that a van carrying three men, a woman, and two teenage boys had gone up in a fireball at a border crossing between New York and Quebec not more than two hours ago. For reasons unknown, the van's driver had shot a U.S. customs agent. The facts were sketchy, but first reports Brognola had gleaned from his sources at the FBI indicated the customs agents and three New York State troopers might have been prepared to search the van. The FBI was hunting through the cyberspace that linked the border crossing with the local state police barracks and the INS office in Manhattan. A gun battle erupted. A man with a machine gun cut down by shotguns before the driver, wounded during the exchange, had touched off what amounted to a suicide bomb. The van apparently rigged with so much high explosive, only a single witness was left alive near the crossing. A Canadian man, who'd seen the whole incident unfold as he approached the border, apparently hadn't been off the cable news TV cameras even long enough to take a leak, telling and retelling this tale of terror to an entire nation now just waking up. At almost the same time that the U.S.-Canadian border was shattered by violence, another suicide van had crashed the gate at the Virginia Electric and Power Company plant in Norfolk. In the process of blowing them halfway across the Chesapeake Bay, the tremendous explosion touched off by the fanatics had left nearly a quarter million people in the Hampton Roads area without power. Before he learned any more, Boland had cut Prognola short, telling him to call back in 15 minutes quickly filling in the big fed about his own terminal encounter. The executioner needed to put distance between himself and the two dead Arabs, find some private space where he could talk to Brognola without having to worry about Boston cops. The dark alley between the red brick tenement buildings and the old West End now appeared to give Bolin the best temporary sanctuary he could find. A quick search of his surroundings, and Boland found he was alone with the grim, disembodied voice of Brognola on the secured cell phone. Breaking news on CNN. A taxi cab just went up in a fireball on the expressway going into Atlanta. Seems whoever touched off the blast got sick of sitting in a traffic jam, decided to take out 15 people, two to three times that many wounded, a number of them critical to serious. The soldier felt the familiar cold rage nodding up his gut. The FBI choppered in from downtown Atlanta were on the scene, it sounds like, before the wreckage even stopped falling. Dexter Cab Company's log for pickup fares that morning was rifled through by the FBI, who promptly traced the suicide cab bomber back to a quiet little suburban home outside Atlanta. The passenger in question was Nasir Abdil, Palestinian, here on a student visa. They know he's been in Atlanta seven months, worked as a busboy in some steakhouse, 33 years old, which kind of puts him a little beyond the tender age of your average freshman. 
Naturally, the family he lived with knew nothing about the monster they had sleeping under their roof, but that investigation has only just begun. If there's anything the family's hiding, I'll bet my pension they'll find it. Stryker, I take it your silence indicates you're wondering just what the hell is going on. Someone has declared war on America, Hal. They're sparing no expense to make it happen. Three separate attacks, three different locations. You don't need to be a genius to figure out this one. A sophisticated network has been set up, and someone on the home team is pulling the strings to make it happen. You don't get into this country with a suspicious background, melt into the scenery, get your hands on what I have to assume is military ordnance, probably plastique, and just walk around until you decide to set it off. They're well organized, financed, and entrenched. It's a safe and scary bet. There are plenty more of these fanatics out there, loading up even as we speak, probably waiting on their marching orders from whoever got them into the country. Not trying to sound flip in the least, but I didn't see Scully or Mulder out in the hallway, Stryker. Am I hearing the makings of some vast conspiracy theory? Trust no one? I can't say 100%, not now. But I saw Najim and his buddy. I know you want proof. I'm playing hunches. But Najim stated war has been declared on the great Satan. He wasn't just coming to America to get himself killed. He was on a mission. <sighs> Fanatics shooting up state cops and customs agents, suicide bombers blowing themselves up, killing innocent people in the process. What the hell goes through the minds of people like that? Most of the victims probably wouldn't know a Shiite from a Sunni, an Imam from a Sheikh if you drew a picture. And the perps believe God is going to welcome them straight to his open arms if they slaughter the innocent? I don't need to walk through their heads. I just need to see this stopped before it gets worse. And it's only just begun. It damn sure reads that way. Well, you haven't heard what could be the worst of it yet, Stryker. My sources are telling me the Vepco plant was somehow contaminated by radioactive waste. The area has been quarantined by a special Navy hazmat unit. A Pentagon source of mine has informed me that either uranium or plutonium dust or irradiated water taken from a light water reactor was an ingredient in the Big Bang delivered by the suicide bombers. They could be looking at an ecological nightmare down there in Hampton Roads. They know the reservoir has been poisoned by radioactive waste, but they're not sure about the Chesapeake Bay yet. Either way, that power plant is going to be shut down for a long time, maybe forever. I know, the big questions keep piling up. You're probably wondering where to go from here, now that Najim chose martyrdom. I'm way ahead of you. It's called SCTU, Special Counter-Terrorist Unit. Boland listened as Brognola explained. When he heard it was a joint FBI Delta Force operation, Boland had trouble buying the concept that some of the best commandos around would team up with feds in the spirit of patriotic cooperation, but shrugged it off as simply that. Or maybe not. SCTU had been active and operational for ten months. The President of the United States had approved the Congressional bill and funding to cut SCTU loose. Of course, the President knew all about the covert Stony Man farm operations, privately sanctioned its own top-secret war against criminals and terrorists, homegrown or overseas. Boland couldn't be certain what the man was thinking. Chalked it up to politics as usual, his thoughts echoing Brognola's opinion. Perhaps the Oval Office wanted to show the American public he had heard the cries of alarm about terrorists charging onto U.S. soil. Any home runs hit by this SCTU? I know you don't have much idle time to channel surf the cable news stations, but about two weeks ago, SCTU tracked down and took out a major cell of Arab terrorists in Chicago, burned down another cell in Cleveland. The terrorists went down shooting to a man... After some intense digging and backtracking by the FBI and a team here at the Justice Department under my direction, it turned out they were small-time Yemeni terrorists. How they finagled their way into the country, where the visas and passports originated, counterfeit paperwork is my guess, we don't know. We've hit a dead end. Yemenis, Palestinians, it looks like someone has marshaled the Arab world together. Right. Someone, as you suggested, has made them see the light. Stop killing one another. Get over their own personal differences. One saber, one jihad, one common enemy. Us, as in U.S. Just what the Arab world needs. Another Mahdi promising them paradise if they march out there and slay the infidel. 
What else do you have on this SCTU? Do I detect a plan of action? I'm working on it as we speak. Well, it's pretty much need to know, and I've had to twist a few earlobes just to scratch the surface. Even the media is screaming all over the place about black ops in our backyard, and they don't have much more than speculation and rumors at this point. Talking heads doing what they do best. Government conspiracies, spooks with guns, black helicopters over the suburbs. Extreme measures for extreme times. Well, a memo just came across my desk. I put a call to the commander of this SCTU to confirm it. About the same time Vepco was going up in flames and that van went up at the border, two simultaneous raids by SCTU in Detroit and Chicago went to hell. Both targeted safe houses were blown up, someone from the inside touching off the blasts. Eight dead FBI agents, two more clinging to life. Sound to you like the bad guys knew the opposition was coming? Nothing would surprise me at this point. What have our own people come up with? I've got the farm working up the background on the two men who run SCTU in the field. With Abel and Phoenix in the field and presently under the gun, they're pulling triple duty, but I've shoved this one to the top of the priority list. They're hacking through the files over at the State Department on all known terrorists, big, small, in between. Bear and the others will also comb through the Interpol, CIA, and NSA files. If I can get concrete identities on the fanatics gone to hell so far, they'll run a background check. Organizations, movements, associations, all nine yards. If there's something that smells about either man who heads up SCTU, you'll be the first to know. But I was thinking, since you're in the neighborhood of one Delta Force Colonel Bob Powers, I'm going to pull some strings on my end to see you pay the man a little visit. I'd like more than a handshake on this one, Hal. I'll see what I can do to get you on board. We know about bin Laden and his global reach. Any others like him out there who have the connections, the money, and the men to mount a terrorist offensive like we're seeing now? Funny you should ask. Another item Kurtzman and company are working on is an Omani sheikh, Aman Nafud. Seems he was third in line to be the next sultan until he got antsy to take the throne. Rumor is he murdered his brother in some fit of rage. He's known to be in exile in Sudan. Nice place for a killer to hole up, especially one with a few bucks to grease the locals. Yeah, Sudan is at the top of my list for vacation spots. Anyway, a CIA contract agent working out of Khartoum has been keeping his ear to the ground about the food. The word is that a lot of weapons are moving in and out of the country, with sightings of a few of the more well-known faces in the fanatic Islamic world tasting the nightlife around Khartoum lately. One thing I've learned is this sheikh is protected by the military junta over there. Get this, the so-called elected president, you won't talk about election fraud, heads up what they call the National Salvation Revolutionary Council. Translation, a bunch of thugs with guns. He has publicly listed an address for the People's Palace where his friend the sheikh can get his fan mail, money, guns, or whatever. Only the scuttlebutt from Langley is the Sheikh has female uh, groupies imported from all over the world. Almost all of which, you can imagine, are dumped, kicking and screaming into the Sheikh's lap. Sounds like one big party. And the Khartoum government has no problem airing over their radio and television the Sheikh's strong opinions about the West. It was one of several reasons the Sultan, I'm told, had some problems with Nafud taking his place, meaning taking control of all the oil that comes out of Oman. Oman needs U.S. military bases over there. Well, you know the situation. Anyway, I should know more on a number of fronts as soon as I touch base with the farm. Boland's mind, buzzing with questions, began seeing shadowy pieces of some dark puzzle wanting to come together. Lights strobed in his side view mirror. A boost of adrenaline hit his veins, and he found the police cruiser already gone, shooting past the mouth of the alley. Dawn was breaking over Boston and Bolin knew he needed to leave the shot-up rental behind. Get moving. Get back to me in an hour, Hal, and get me that intro with the SETU. I have something to run past you, but I want to get a read on this Delta Colonel before I make a decision. Brognola signed off to go work his usual magic to latch Bolin onto the scent of the enemy. Only this time out, the soldier heard the rumblings of the dark clouds of some conspiracy every instinct he'd honed to perfection over the years warning him some deadly shadow game was just around the corner the executioner hopped out of the rental 
retrieved his war bag from the trunk and set off to acquire another set of wheels. He would search out a motel where he could set up his own one-man command central, wait on word from Brognola. A new day hadn't even quite dawned, and already the dead were piling up. Unless he put himself on the right track and fast, the soldier feared the worst was yet to come. The war had started, on American soil no less, and that alone was bad enough. But the enemy, whoever it was, had yet to find out just what the executioner was capable of. reports on the shocking attacks that occurred in various parts of the country earlier today. She wasn't too shabby, he thought. A little too squeaky clean for his taste, and not much behind the eyes. He saw something vacant in those baby blues, a naive PC view of the world. When she carried her spiel over to the body count, upping it by another two corpses since her last report, injecting what he decided was the sort of contrived horror reserved for just such scenes of carnage and tragedy. He wondered if that's how they taught it these days in Journalism 101. Buck McClintock finally hit the mute button. The opening shot had been fired, and that was pretty much all he needed to know. Actually, CNN was reporting three opening salvos. A third of the nation was now awake and reeling in confusion and terror. Soon the echoes of outrage and fear would be heard from coast to coast. Americans would be wondering if some apocalyptic doom was hanging over their heads, ready to fall from the sky and snuff them all out where they stood, or drove, or shopped, or dined. If they only knew, he thought. Hell, he didn't even know the bigger picture, and he was on the inside. McClintock unfolded his muscular 6'3", 220 frame from behind the huge mahogany desk, with the sound off on the giant screen TV, it seemed an even more impressive and ominous sight. Terrified faces flashed by on the screen, lips moving, hands flapping at the horror, everyone confused and numb with shock, the masses and uniformed officialdom alike trying to make sense out of the carnage. It looked as if at least a dozen or so vehicles were still burning on the Atlanta Expressway, police choppers soaring over the light show of cop cars, fire trucks, EMT vehicles. An overhead shot from a news chopper, zooming in on the destruction, revealed the first of many black bags getting zipped up, loaded on a gurney, and rolled to the coroner's van. So this was jihad, he thought. It started. Former FBI agent Josh Monroe took in the slaughter zone with a fascination that made McClintock stop and pull up short beside the two men in the wing chairs. No shit. McClintock studied the man closely, wondering just how insane Monroe was, but already knew the sudden violence and brutality the man was capable of. It had gotten him kicked out of the FBI with no pension, no future, nothing but bad memories. Such was their lot. But he'd always believed suffering did indeed build character. The stocky, buzz-cut Sam Jansen cracked his knuckles, the ex-ATF man chain-smoking, as if the killer habit would pull his nerves together. <sighs> now what? Could somebody in this room kindly define our role from here on? Another glimpse at the big screen in the corner of his office, still more police cars and another ambulance, slowly wending their way through the bottleneck of vehicles behind the police barricade, and McClintock moved to the bay window beside the wet bar. Buck? I heard you, Sam. And? Relax. Smoke another cigarette. It was incredible, he thought, staring out at the thickets and scrubby brush, the thinly wooded slopes of their valley in Brewster County, how what was promised was actually now in motion, delivered, no less, by a foreign enemy. Things were only heating up, though, he suspected, inside and beyond the walls of their compound. As if Mother Nature herself were angry at something or someone, he noted the sun was rising over the sawtooth ridges of Dove Mountain, and already the bright wash of light promised another unusually scorching day for that time of year. Even for the rugged, moonscaped wilderness of southwestern Texas, it would be hotter than a furnace out there in a matter of hours. McClintock clasped his hands behind his back, taking a long moment of silence, scouring through his thoughts to try and find an answer to the man's question. What could he say? They knew the truth had accepted their role in whatever the bigger scheme, as small and undefined at times as they might find their part, several years ago. As unbelievable as he found it now, 
the present had its roots in a few angry remarks, a tongue loosened up by whiskey and beer in a yuppie pub that fateful day near Capitol Hill. Even though it eventually cost him his job, guarding what the rest of the country might view as the most important and powerful man on the planet, the former Secret Service agent believed he had simply spoken the truth, drunk or sober. He'd seen up close and personal all the perks, frills, and special interests that came with being enshrined in the Oval Office. The previous administration, the one he was supposed to protect with his own life, had disgraced itself before an entire nation, but few knew just how far, wide, and deep the real shame cut, how ugly and sordid was the whole truth and nothing but. Well, the whispered rumors of drug use, late-night orgies in the pool, talk coming through the grapevine about far-reaching conspiracies and cover-ups, even murder, were something he had originally wanted to believe were fabricated lies by the sore losers in that other party. Not so. He'd seen a lot of it with his own eyes, soon found himself completely and permanently disgusted by the indulgences of prima donnas who said one thing but did another. Well, he hadn't signed on to be a pimp, look the other way, wink and grin as if boys will just be boys. Unfortunately, a few pairs of the more noticeable yuppie ears, their lips forever pressed to the buttocks of some congressman or senator, had overheard the indignant railings from a real man on the front lines. The young and the spineless had quickly gone scurrying to tell all, leaving him with the bitter taste in his mouth that told him he was finished as a Secret Service agent. Following that forced but quiet resignation, there were the follow-up anonymous phone calls in the middle of the night, the white envelopes with only his name typed on them stuffed into his mailbox. For months, the voices in the mail kept coming out of nowhere, the threats implied. He was to keep his mouth shut about what he'd seen during his tour of duty, but the message loud and clear that they could make him disappear, no one the wiser, warning him it was best to see no evil— as luck or fate had it, and often he wondered which it was, a few good men had come to offer him comfort back then. News, good or bad, fact or fiction, always traveled at light speed in Wonderland. They were law enforcement officers for the most part, a high-ranking military man here and there, joining in the late-night clandestine bull sessions. Only they weren't just a bunch of good old boys slugging down Jack Daniels and ranting about a changing world. These were men of power— and they could make things happen. They had. It turned out a plan was in the works all along, and they were personally interested in seeing him survive getting cashiered out of the Secret Service. If he played ball, asked no questions, a donation would be placed in his bank account. If he was serious, he would move to Texas, where a large compound was being erected. A private enclave, where men of like vision would gather and discuss the future while awaiting their orders. If he looked at it now, he might believe he'd signed a pact with the devil. No, the truth was he'd been hand-picked, just like the thirty-two other members of the group. The man with the plan, as he'd come to think of the FBI agent, had to have kept running files on the chosen ones, seeking them out when the time was right, when they were all at their most vulnerable. To a man, McClintock knew they were all divorced, their children scattered across the country. Money, alcohol, or legal problems had plagued them from their previous lives. All of them were retired or forced to quit from various law enforcement agencies or different branches of the military. Disillusionment was the bond gluing them all together. That, and looking forward to the day when they could strike back. But at whom? Where? And when? Turning McClintock stared at his two most trusted comrades. He felt his stomach lurch for some reason at the mere sight of them aware that he was looking at mirror images of himself. Buzz cuts could never hide the gray around the temples. The hot Texas sun could only further deepen the scowl lines around the mouth and eyes. They looked old, tired, the eyes still glowing with anger and determination, the only sign they shouldn't be put out to pasture yet. He looked away, glanced at the phone on his desk, checked his watch, wanting to distract himself from their probing stares. Marching orders were on the way. The call should be coming through any minute. The men should all be up by now. I suggest we go have breakfast in the mess hall. Company is expected shortly. Who? Another nameless Arab with more orders for us to move their merchandise around the country? We have enough helicopters and private jets out there now to start lifting a few eyebrows. McClintock ran a meaty hand over the bristles of his buzz cut. What's the matter, gentlemen? 
getting cold feet. Buck, let's face some facts here. I don't care if our private airfield is FAA approved or how many people you've paid to keep their mouths shut or how much agrees the sheriff and his deputies to keep their eyes peeled for men in black. You've rounded up every member of our group from all parts of the country on short notice. Shabby as some of the lives of our members are, some of them still have jobs, people at home that might question their sudden disappearance. Jansen, you are losing your nerve. <laughs> Not hardly, my friend. But now that it's started, knowing what our part has been so far, if any loose tongues start wagging out there, we might find ourselves going up in flames like Waco. You're worried about the Fed stumbling across some guys out on the range firing away with legal registered handguns? Or is it the stash? Yeah, it's not what's here that troubles me. It's not the others that concern me. We're covered among ourselves. Hey, we're just a men's club, right? Right. Nothing draws attention to us. I don't even want us referring to ourselves beyond these walls as God's crusaders. All right, all right, stop fidgeting. If you want me to put your fears at rest, the stash is buried so deep you'd need a corps of army engineers with nuke-powered mountain diggers to unearth it. From the beginning, I've been ordered to keep up a benign appearance. That's why we never distribute literature. We stay off the Internet. We don't recruit. We don't get drunk in bars and sound off about Zionist conspiracies or hurl around racial slurs. We don't wear cowboy hats and boots or drive around in pickup trucks with rifle racks. We put on a legitimate face. We go on with quiet, law-abiding lives. We are businessmen. We run a legitimate trucking company. We own and operate our own airport. Yes, I know what we really do, what we really move around the country, but... Yes? We will be landing soon. McClintock locked onto Jansen's stare. It was time, he decided on the spot, for him to find out exactly what their role was in this scheme. I'll be waiting. You seen the news? Yes, and? I think this would be a good time for us to have a talk about the future. Sudan. Aman Nafud watched the feeding frenzy. From his position, standing on the parapet, looking out beyond the wall of the pool, he watched raw meat being tossed into the crocodile pen, or hung out on poles by the more adventurous. The Omani figured the lieutenant general soldiers could have fed half the population of Shaluks and Nur in the south for an entire week. But this was Sudan, a nation divided by the Arab North and the Black South. Race relations, though, were probably the least of Sudan's woes. The largest country in Africa, plagued by mass starvation, genocide, long periods of searing drought and never-ending civil war, Sudan was one of the most dangerous places on earth, where life wasn't even weighed on the cheap scale of things. If there was any question about that, all he needed to do was sit through one more of Saeed's public screenings. Almost every night, he recalled, Saeed would order all the men, including the 30-odd force of soldiers guarding the People's Palace, into the sprawling living room. While Saeed drank cognac and toyed with the vast array of medals on his uniform, he gave a blow-by-blow -blow narrative for each killing, every gruesome torture inflicted on the rebels of the Sudanese People's Liberation Army. Knowing the kick Saeed derived from his snuff films, it only made sense to Nafu that the lieutenant general who headed up both the National Salvation Revolutionary Council and the National Islamic Front, would treat his pet crocodiles better than most men might treat their wives. On that score, it was believed the man had, in addition to his four wives, at least two dozen concubines and mistresses at his beck and call. With something like over a hundred bedrooms in the palace, the sex play, both marital and otherwise, went on almost around the clock. Nafud found himself wishing Saeed at least had the decency to move the crocodile pen farther from the pool. One of the soldiers held out a pole with a squealing chicken impaled on a steel tip. Nafud turned away before a croc boiled out of the water to make quick work of the squalling bird. How many men whom Saeed believed had double-crossed him, or who needed intensified persuasion during an interrogation, had been thrown into that pit? He shuddered cutting off the mental image before it ruined what had been a pleasant afternoon of indulging himself with several of the imported beauties, Europeans, Swedish no less. As he tried to turn a deaf ear to the crocodiles, he looked out over the arid plain beyond the palace gate. It was desolate, barren country for the most part, but there were points of tropical vegetation beyond the high granite razor-topped wall ringing the complex. 
Nafud couldn't be sure if the palm trees were transplanted here, but knew they were close enough to the banks of the Nile River to live and grow. My good friend Aman, enjoying the view? He was about to step off the parapet, but already a massive shape, most of the bulk and girth confined to the belly, tromped up the steps, cutting off any retreat. The lieutenant general fingered his goatee, adjusted the bill of his cap, smiling toward the pen. He was shorter than Nafud's 5'6", his blubbery mass seeming to want to pop any number of medals and ribbons pinned to his brown uniform. Why was Nafud reminded of some cartoon character whenever he looked at this short, enormously fat man? Oh well, conspiracies had a way of bringing together the unlikeliest of bedfellows. At least he was far removed from Oman, where his father was still raging about the palace, screaming for the head of the son who had murdered Shirak, the beloved eldest who would have been first in line to inherit the sultanate. Nafud had other blessings to count as well. He still had huge, untraceable sums of money stashed in several accounts across Europe. A CIA man had whisked him out of Oman and dumped him off in Saeed's lap. The lieutenant general was more than happy to see his Omani guest fed, housed, and pleasured, as long as he kept the money flowing from a Swiss account into the Bank of Khartoum. And Saeed had proved invaluable in helping to launch the mother of all jihads. It was well known that the CIA trained and armed the SPLA rebels, but they used mercenaries for the real dirty work. And it was a rare dog of war that wouldn't eat from the hand that fed it best. And Nafud and Saeed were feeding their CIA mercenary warhounds filet mignon. Without them, the holy warriors and the merchandise would never have made it into America. Saeed was still grinning at his pets. Admiring my beauty as I see. They say next to the Australian saltwater crocodile, the Nile croc is the largest and most aggressive. Three of them are close to 20 feet. Look, <laughs> there is Muhammad Ali. Sure enough, Nafud spotted the monster in question. Muhammad Ali was hard to miss. The crocodile thrashed over several of his smaller cousins, the beast's raging bulk driving a few of the reptiles down the bank before it rose up and tore a hunk of beef in two. Once they get the smell of blood, have a taste of raw red meat, they will become man-eaters. Perhaps you were wondering if I have proof of that. A special viewing one night? <laughs> the night I break out the good French wine, and you see them serving stuffed shrimp in the casino, you will know you are in for a rare treat. Nafud decided he'd make himself scarce on that evening, fake a stomach virus, no matter how offended Saeed might be. What we have engineered has already begun. Yes. The American news station I have piped in by satellite does not even bother to go to commercial, interrupt their constant parade of coverage. The infidels are blaming all Muslims from Pakistan to Morocco. They want revenge. Only we know the truth, my good friend. But the game is entering into its most dangerous phase. Dangerous for the two of us, that is. Nafud had long since weighed the risks, knew he'd get shoved to the top of the list as the most wanted international criminal since bin Laden. If he was brought to light, he knew the Americans wouldn't rest until he was hunted down, arrested, or worse. You have assured me I am safe. You are, as long as you remain in Sudan. I do not think you will be spending some romantic weekend in Paris any time soon. I have been here for almost one year now. Have you heard me complain? No, of course not. This is our joint endeavor and I wish for my esteemed friend to remain here as long as he wishes. You might never see the American military kicked out of the Middle East, as you so passionately demanded when you were living in Oman, but your desire to strike a major blow for all Muslim peoples against the Western oppressors looks, as they might say, a dream coming true. I saw you looking out beyond the walls perhaps wondering how such a barren, inhospitable landscape may hold vast oil reserves that would rival those of Saudi Arabia or even your Oman. Not quite. Although I am aware of your agenda to see your country become a major oil power... All I need is money, the men, the expertise, and I could begin drilling tomorrow. My money, you mean? It certainly helps. I have already placed a small fortune into your account. Is it not enough? 
Understand, my good friend the Sheik, I have considerable expenses. There are my associates in the NSRC who must be compensated for their continued silence and cooperation. I have my own soldiers I must pay, having promised them more money as their duties multiply for not only myself, but you. There are all these beautiful women I have my traders from Khartoum bring to us from all over the world, expensive women, young, drug-free, some of them even virgins. Do you realize how much it costs for one woman of European blood alone? Then there are my own perks, such as the crocodile hunters to pay for risking life and limb in the Nile. We have our friends in the CIA who have helped us establish a safe pipeline to smuggle both weapons and men into America. You have alluded to contacts the CIA uses as the overseas architects and guardians of your holy war, Americans, I am sure, who have their own agendas. I assume whoever is on the receiving end in America is getting a hefty sum of money. So we are negotiating a new price. Something to think about. I have just received word from our CIA friend. He and two others are on the way. Why? From what I could understand, reading between the lines of their usual double talk, they also wish to negotiate a new price. Now, Food shook his head. Everybody always wanted more money. His money. They have been paid well enough already. They are the ones who share most of the greater risk. No CIA mercenaries, no explosives, no pipeline for all the weapons that were delivered to America. You would also not have the benefit of their intelligence-gathering resources. All of what you just said is true enough. But if I keep having to renegotiate everyone's price, I'm going to start wondering if I am being blackmailed. No, no, fear not. No one, I assure you, is going to hand you over to be returned to your father for certain beheading. Oh, please... Spare me the melodramatic images. And no one will look your way for the jihad that has erupted on American soil. I only wish I could share your confidence. You seem to have all the right answers. But all it would take is for one of the CIA mercenaries to take my money, then suddenly decide it's in his interest to become a patriot or a hero. One of the soldiers had somehow been pulled over the steel mesh fencing and was struggling in the crock pit. Mafoud froze, felt his spine tightening as the horror unfolded. He started to look at the lieutenant general to urge the man to pull his revolver and shoot the beast. It was Muhammad Ali, who came whipping out of the water. Nafud nearly retched when he saw that Saeed was actually smiling at the spectacle. He didn't want to look, but couldn't help himself. Muhammad Ali was roaring up the bank, the soldier slipping in the thick sludge, scrambling and wailing for the outstretched arms of his comrades on the other side of the fence. The crocodile's jaws parted in what struck Nafud as some ghoulish showing off of the rows of razor-sharp teeth. Somehow the soldier found his footing, nearly slipped again before he hurled himself over the fence. Muhammad Ali snapped his jaws shut on empty air as the soldier was yanked over the fence. For escaping his near brushes crock food, the soldiers began laughing, whooping it up, slapping the man on the shoulders and about the head as if the whole thing had been nothing more than slapstick comedy. <laughs> that was close. You want to tell me why you called off 24-7 surveillance on both targets without contacting this office? You want to tell me where in this operations manual it states that you two are authorized to send nine FBI agents marching straight to their deaths? You want to tell me why it appears that the terrorists knew we were coming so they could rig up both safe houses with enough explosive to blow themselves and our people the kingdom fucking come? It was obvious to Powers and Grievy that the FBI commander of SCTU was merely getting warmed up. The rise in volume and the drawn curtains were just two indicators that this was intended to be the mother of all tongue lashings. And the real icing on the cake for Powers was that the television, mounted in the wall, was playing his own disaster drama right then. The word mute was framed just over CNN, he noted. A woman reporter taking center stage with the taped off background of smoking black wreckage being sifted through by firefighters, paramedics, and a swarm of jackets with FBI stenciled across their backs. The colonel suspected it was going to be bad during the drive over. The words, relieved of duty, kept running through his mind, but that could prove to be the least of his worries. Powers was about to claim a seat at the long table, empty except for the hulking, seething mass of Luther Jeffries at the opposite end. 
Don't bother to sit, Colonel. This won't take long. Greavy had made a beeline for the coffee pot. Put the coffee down, turn around, and face me, mister. Greavy did as he was ordered. To his credit, he didn't display the nerves he'd been chewing on since Powers had met him at Logan on the end of the red-eye flight from Detroit. During the drive to the SCTU's command center in downtown Boston, they'd hashed over their cover stories, making sure all the excuses meshed. They only hoped it was enough to snow the commander and keep their own agenda shadowed. Commander Jeffries paused, the veins on the sides of his shaved skull pulsing. Does either one of you have an explanation for how the hell everything got all screwed up? Can either one of you give me a reason why I shouldn't launch a full-scale, in-your-face, up-your-sphincter, around-the-clock investigation before I send you packing? Somebody want to tell me just what the fuck happened out there this morning? Greavy squared his shoulders, face hardening with a determination that told Powers the SAC thought he'd found an opening to launch his spiel when the commander fell silent. Uh, sir, both the colonel and myself... Skip it! Truth is, I don't want to know. Not at this time. Maybe never. Maybe I just wanted to see if you have blood in your veins and not ice water. Sir? The whole program has just been changed, gentlemen. Congratulations. I have just been hit by lightning, thanks to the both of you. Sir? Don't say that again, Grievy. You're starting to annoy me, and the baffled face doesn't wash. Listen very carefully. In case you don't remember, we still work for the Justice Department. Because of this towering inferno you two dropped over our heads, I received a phone call from a man at Justice name of Hal Brognola, who, I hear, wields some mighty clout. Didn't ask a lot of questions, this Brognola, and I found myself wondering why. Seems Brognola has already sent some guy who is to be attached to your hips. In fact, he's already here and waiting to see SCTU's finest. That's why my own search for facts has been ordered stifled. Powers exchanged a look with Grevy. Special Agent Mike Belasco is downstairs in interrogation room B. I understand he's already questioned a few of your people, Colonel, trying to separate fact from any fiction. If I were you, I'd be ready with solid answers, not some bullshit you had prepared for me. Powers didn't like where any of this appeared to be going, especially the part about some clown suit from Justice looking over his shoulder. Sir, I'm not in the habit of making excuses, just so we're clear. I hold myself personally responsible for what happened to those men out there this morning, and I believe I share that sentiment with Agent Grevy. I see. Well, that's good to hear. Jeffries nodded at the television screen, where the body of a fallen FBI agent was being zipped into a rubber bag. You might get the opportunity to show somebody important just how far you're willing to accept your role in that mess. It's all someone else's call right now, gentlemen, meaning if our funding is yanked, SCTU goes swirling down the drain. The commander's fleeting smile, aloof shrug of his shoulders, somehow didn't inspire confidence in Powers. What do I know? Maybe Belasco is simply here to help see that doesn't happen. Give him full cooperation. Everything you've got on any and all ongoing operations here and in other cities. Those are my orders. You're on notice. Dismissed. Get the hell out of my face. Powers trailed Grevy out into the corridor. Just then, Jeffries hit the volume on the TV. Never thought I'd live to see the day when something like this could happen in Boston. Nobody Grevy looked so steamed that Powers half expected him to spontaneously combust. That was too easy. Maybe we're getting set up as sacrificial lambs. If Commander Jeffries has the first inkling... Not here. Powers headed for the bank of elevators, ignoring the curious looks from others in the hallway. We need to have lunch later. The loan. Right. But first we need to go under the microscope of this Wonder Boy from Justice. Powers jabbed the elevator button. Pull it together. Our futures are riding on what does or doesn't happen this next day or so. All things considered, you sound pretty confident, Colonel. We're still in the game. For now. What are you worried about? The Justice Department, for starters. The Justice Department can kiss my delta butt. And your point, Colonel? My point is, I've walked many a time through the valley of death, and I fear no man. I'm sure this Belasco's just another chicken suit pulling desk duty his whole career. End of discussion. Texas. McClintock wanted to slap the smug look off the Arab's face. Twenty minutes he'd been standing with Monroe and Jansen, sweating it out under the broiling sun at the north end of the runway. 
before the sleek executive jet finally showed as a distant white smudge against the burning azure sky to the east. The Learjet had touched down, taxi, had then finally dropped into a long, agonizing, slow roll. Another five or so minutes they had stood their ground, maybe shuffling from foot to foot to work out the nerves and agitation. The turbofan jets kept running hot, gusting fumes and grit in their faces, the storm of noise and wind having forced them to backstep to the other side of the runway. The Arabs had taken their sweet time, maybe enjoying from behind drawn cabin curtains the Americans standing there, sweating and wondering when they'd make their grand appearance. Brazen bastards. McClintock found himself wondering how much weight they really did pull. It was time to find out. McClintock had only met the nameless Arab once, some six months ago, same spot. The call from his own sponsor had come in the dead of night on the secured line. The orders came by fax, with the paper to be shredded as soon as he had memorized the details. Now this shit again, playing lackey to some guy he didn't even have a name for. The short Arab's strange smile made McClintock feel like meat on a hook. If this guy was jerking his chain for whatever purpose, he'd learn soon enough. If he was forced to, he could jam a huge monkey wrench into the whole operation, whatever the hell it really was. Let them come for him. He'd take his pound of flesh before it was all over. He caught himself, aware he was getting paranoid. Maybe this was a straight deal after all. Money changing hands so the game could get launched in earnest. Whatever, the leader of God's Crusaders still felt his patience thinning to a dangerous snapping point. He wanted some answers. Standing there in their dark suit jackets and ties, crisp pressed slacks and Italian loafers, with their long black hair and various styles of facial growth, they looked more like Euro trash than the businessmen they claimed to be. The bulges under the jackets of the two larger Arabs holding their ground behind the short one made McClintock glad he'd snugged the Glock 17 in his waistband, nestled against his spine. Monroe and Jansen were likewise carrying Glocks, ready to go if things turned ugly. This will be our last meeting. The Arab held out the aluminum briefcase, but maintained a firm grasp on a large black nylon bag, bulging with what McClintock sure hoped was the payoff money. McClintock took the briefcase. I have some questions for you, my friend. No time. I have urgent business elsewhere. Make the time. The Arab shrugged. Quickly. It galled McClintock to find himself subordinate to a man he knew was helping to engineer the mass destruction he'd seen all over the news. I want to know precisely what's planned for myself and my men, and if we are in any danger of being discovered here by outsiders. I don't think I need to spell out the details where that is concerned. Your orders come directly from the one who recruited you. I am simply a cutout. You're telling me you don't know shit? I know much. I know your orders, and they are encrypted on the disk inside the briefcase. Same encryption as before. Once you have memorized the names, phone numbers, and locations, and have your men on the way, you will delete the file as before. You have less than 48 hours to get your men into contact with the others. Further orders will be waiting those men. You will remain behind here with half of your force until the job is finished. I get the feeling someone doesn't trust us. How you feel about it is your problem. Believe me, whatever problem I have because of this will become your problem. Is that a threat? It's a fact. Is that all? McClintock nodded at the nylon bag. The Arab looked on the verge of sneering, then tossed the bag at McClintock's feet. That money, it comes from your true paymaster. Meaning one of you people? Meaning a man of vision, far away from here, and whose name will go down in Islamic glory forever. Shit. Is that what this is all about? Killing a bunch of Americans in the name of jihad? You guys pissed because you need American engineers to extract the oil and American guns to make sure you keep it? You sound bitter and disillusioned, like a man who has failed at many attempts to find his own glory. You insolent little camel jockey. Have you and your people at this compound not turned your backs on your own? You want to judge me, but have you not accepted money from me to deliver weapons and explosives by truck across this country? knowing all along many will die in the name of our jihad? I know what we've done. And now you're having second thoughts? The way the Arabs said it, more sure of something than ever, threw McClintock a curveball, making him rein in the hard approach. Was the guy ready to scurry back to this so-called paymaster with word that bringing their militant right-wing delivery boys into the fold was a colossal mistake? 
That money should cover any travel expenses, any necessary payoffs along the way. What will be left is enough for you to either carry on here... Or... Perhaps make your way across the border. Mexican authorities, I understand, are easily persuaded to aid and abet fugitives, if the price is right. So you're saying trouble is headed this way? The Arab made a face, growing weary of the conversation. We have been successful so far, only because the truth has been kept to a select few. At this juncture, too much knowledge would be a very dangerous thing. For whom? For you, for starters. Now who's making threats? I must go now. You have a nice day. Hey, just for shits and giggles, say there's a problem. Who do I ask for? I assume you're asking for my name? If you're a straight shooter like you want me to believe, what would it hurt to give me your name? I have no name. But they call me the messenger. As they boarded the jet, McClintock felt the heat all around, the temperature rising, but more from the fear he smelled in the air than the wrath of Mother Nature. Have a nice day, that's it. McClintock didn't know how to answer Jansen. Why don't you grab the bag, count the money inside, then I'll put it in the safe. I intend to go ahead and play this out, guys. So how come you're standing there looking like you think someone's going to come in here and break it off in our collective butts? McClintock pinned Monroe with an icy stare. Let's get something straight. We were sought out. We took the money, asked no questions. I never meant to come here, hide out, and start up some right-wing group of rifles and rednecks. If we have to play lackey for now, even though that sticks in my craw, I'll do it. You want the money. Always have. I want to finish out my life like I always dreamed. I'll honor our commitment to disperse men, materiel, whatever. If it looks like we're being sacrificed on the altar of some agenda, I'll let each man decide what it is he wants to do. Which is what? Simple. Stand their ground here, fight and die, or take their cut of the payoff and see just how friendly some corrupt greaseball across the border wants to be. McClintock marched off. Boston. The interrogation room was a simple private affair designed with intimidation in mind. There was one table, two chairs. Bolin assumed one seat at the table was reserved for a suspect the other chair for whomever played good cop, perhaps, while the bad cop roamed around, growling threats. There was no one-way observation glass, but there was a small stand in the corner of the white-walled room, holding a full and steaming coffee pot. Despite the austere simplicity of it all, the soldier could smell the stink of fear in that room, a lingering ghost of Grilling's past. After endless years in the hell grounds, he needed only instinct to know that more than just threats had been hurled around in this room. While he waited for Colonel Powers and Special Agent Greeby to show, he helped himself to a cup of coffee. Before entering the renovated 12-story building in downtown Boston, the command center for SCTU, the soldier reviewed the steps leading to his next course of action. After abandoning his shot-up rental, Bolin had quickly acquired another set of wheels, once he'd established his own base of operations in a motel near the Charles River, he'd hauled the Satlink out of its war bag. The Satlink's flashing red light indicated the farm was ready to send the fax the soldier had requested from Kurtzman. The jacket from Fort Bragg on Colonel Powers indicated the man was a decorated war hero, but much of his service record was classified, spelling black ops to Bolin. Greavy also had plenty of medals and an exemplary record as a field agent. The whole picture was a little too clean for Bolin. The field commander's involvement in the double disasters raised too many disturbing questions in the soldier's mind. How could nine FBI agents go up in flames, storming different targeted terrorist safe houses in separate cities, while not one Delta commando suffered so much as a scratch? If Powers and Greeby had been leading their respective attacks, how come they had managed to walk away with nothing more than egg on their faces? The door opened. Bolin glanced at the two men through his dark aviator shades. They rolled in, fanned out, as if they had the drill down, a form of silent intimidation meant to walk a chill down the other guy's spine. Brown leather bomber jacket was Powers, Greavy's muscled bulk filling out the black flight jacket. You must be Belasco. Powers spoke first, but it was Greavy who stepped forward and offered his hand. Special Agent Greavy. 
The grip was a little too forced, hard and prolonged, the big SAC nodding, looking as if he wished to hell he could see the eyes behind the shades. And I must be Powers. Bolin smiled slightly at Powers' attempt at levity and shook his hand briefly. <sighs> Understand you had some problems this morning. Greavy plucked up a foam cup, lifted the coffee pot. It happened. Don't know how. We're still looking into it. We lost nine good men. Family men. I'm sick to my stomach about it. We'll find the SOBs behind it. Behind what? Why, whoever figured out we were crashing the door maybe gave the order to prime both targets. Sounds like you think it might be someone on the home team. I didn't say that. It's an ongoing investigation. So it's a need-to-know situation? When we learn something, you'll be the first to know, Agent Velasco. Look, here's the deal. I'm not here to pick your brains about what went wrong. I'm sure it's something that will weigh on you both for a long time. I'm sure you'll find yourselves getting reamed for weeks to come about losing nine men. I assume you have leads on other suspected terrorist targets. Both men hesitated, working on their coffee. We do. I'll want whatever information you have in three hours. Bolin rose and headed for the door. Oh, and just so we don't get our signals crossed, I'm not here to tell you how to do your jobs. Bolin smiled. Powers and Greavy blanched. I'm here to help. That's it? Did you expect something else? The soldier grasped the door handle and watched them watching him. Time to up the ante. Does the name Abu Aman ring a bell? Who? The suspected terrorist who was picked up crossing from Canada into Vermont. The one SCTU has been sitting on for two weeks. Hell, how did you get that much? We haven't even been able to get a name out of him. <laughs> hey, I only work for the Justice Department. I'm a mere grunt. Besides, if I told you how I came by my information, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I've got an idea. But I want to see how it goes. How what goes? You care to fill us in? Or would you have to kill us? <laughs> Fair enough. Aman is a former Iraqi Republican guard. We learned this because UN weapons inspectors found military records Saddam tried to keep secret. Seems this Aman became a bounty hunter for Saddam. Maybe you've heard. Saddam doesn't particularly care for Kurds. So this Aman lopped Kurd heads for Saddam after the war. Now he comes to America to do what? I'm not sure. He's being arraigned this morning, but you already know that. The soldier made a show of checking his watch. In about ten minutes, actually. The U.S. Attorney and the D.A. have agreed to it. Agreed to what? Bond. Bond? The bastard's been denied bond. We saw to it ourselves. I know. Like I said, I have an idea. You're going to see he's cut loose. Then you're going to follow him. Hope you can smoke out a few more tangos. Maybe a big fish. I was thinking more along the lines of reeling in a shark. And the executioner left them alone with their thoughts. He had just shown one trump card. But if it went down with the Iraqi the way he suspected, a dangerous game was only beginning. A game the executioner didn't intend to lose. Abu Aman couldn't believe his luck. Before arraignment at Suffolk County Courthouse, he would never even dreamed it possible to walk an Iraqi free again on infidel soil. Funny how life worked, he thought, feeling blessed, as light on his feet as a feather, wending his way through the suit and skirt traffic of the courthouse, homing in on the unoccupied payphone. The previous night in his cell, under the heavy guard of U.S. Marshals, he had hit his knees, prayed in silence, imploring for some miracle to fall from heaven, unchain him from bondage at the hands of the infidels. For two weeks now, he had suffered through the abuse of the FBI, seethed inside at their insults to his Islamic heritage, choked off a cry of pain now and then when one of them slapped him in the face, calling him everything from a liar to a bastard son of a camel. He didn't think they tortured prisoners in America, but he wasn't surprised by their brutality and bigotry. War bred all manner of atrocities. No one was exempt from pain and suffering. American FBI agents were barbarians, but he could appreciate their methods. Even when he'd been a colonel in his Republican Guard special unit, he understood the power of fear, the prevailing might of one man's will to dominate others. 
It seemed like only yesterday, but he could vividly recall all the souks in Kuwait he'd personally destroyed after, of course, pilfering what he wanted as booty. He remembered how he'd helped shoot up the emir's palace, participating with a boyish enthusiasm in the mass raping of the wives and concubines after watching his own men shoot down the sun, the idiot having chosen to stand his ground. He could still remember with fleeting pride the brutal but necessary interrogations that went on as his unit occupied the palace in the following months. Weeping women, bawling children, and tired old men would come to him on bended knee, offering him bribes to return their men to them in one piece. He would take their money with a benevolent smile. He was a fair man, after all. He felt their pain. Then he would order them to return to whatever was left of their ruined homes, eventually marching their men back to their waiting open arms. Smiling, he would force the men to their knees and shoot them in the head. The wails of the women pierced his brain as he proclaimed the dead men free forever of their corrupt, self-indulgent emir. A chill walked down his spine. He shrugged off the memories, shaking his head, as a sudden confusing stab of fear tore through his belly. No reason for a dark mood. Triumph against his enemies was just around the corner, beyond the lobby doors of the courthouse. First, he needed a little help to get back on track. He picked up the phone, using the calling card they'd returned with his passport and cash. He punched in the number he was ordered to use only as a last resort. When the phone rang on the other end, Abu Aman hoped today was a new beginning, imagining himself as a warrior free and on the move once more. With sheer strength of will, he tucked the faces of his victims away in some dark corner of his mind, grateful that he hadn't caved to the FBI's persistent grilling. Somehow he'd summoned the strength to stay silent in the face of their insults and threats. He hadn't even given them his real name, simply stating that he was a Palestinian, Ali Fazah just like the passport said. Idiots. Soon he would shove all their threats and intimidation back down their throats. Then again, he might simply want to count his blessings. The list of charges against him was so long he got a headache just thinking about them. The FBI had told him he was looking at life in prison if he didn't cooperate by naming names and revealing the places where his co-conspirators were holed up. What could he have told them anyway? that some nameless shadow had appeared in his village in central Iraq in the dead of night, given him cash, a passport, and a new identity. Once in Canada, he'd been given instructions over a payphone by yet another man he'd never seen. No one was around when he picked up the explosives at a warehouse. The arrest at the Vermont border was like some distant bad dream. Amon, thanks to someone posting a half-million-dollar cash bond, was a free man. God had answered his prayers. In Arabic, according to his instructions, Amman recited the password. The Munazala has only begun. He didn't find it strange that he was echoing Saddam's call to arms during the Great Patriotic War. Munazala referred to the battle against the infidel evildoers. Even in defeat, Saddam lived on. Surely God was reserving a special destiny for the Iraqi people. I see where you are calling from. I know who you are. Amman balked. How could... American technology, of course, some form of caller ID, the voice checking the area code, a computer tracking down the number to its exact location. Quickly explain your situation, but be careful what you say. I am free on a half-million-dollar bond. Who posted it? I inquired, but the magistrate said he did not know. I assumed it was... Silence! You do not know who set you free, who put up that sort of money? You do not find that troublesome or strange? Suddenly the day didn't look as bright as it did a minute ago. If one of his own people hadn't come to his rescue, he wondered, then who had put up that kind of money as a secured bond? You will wait there in the lobby. I'm sending someone with further instructions. Amon looked around the bustling lobby, some hot rage he couldn't fathom welling up in his gut. He longed for an AK-47, a dozen banana clips, grenades, Better yet, he wished he had some of those shaped charges he'd fixed to several of the Kuwaiti emir's oil wells. If his luck was about to sour, his life would prove a dismal failure if he didn't find a way to at least go out as a glorious martyr. Abu Aman felt his paranoia taking hold of his senses as he slowly melted into the swarming crowd. Silently, he began to pray, instinctively aware he was still a long way from being a free man. 
It took a good two hours, but Bragnola had worked his usual magic to spring him on. Bolin knew the clout the big Fed commanded. He was liaison to the President of the United States for Stony Man Farms covert ops, and if the man had to personally issue the order to set him on free on bond, the judge might find himself looking for work the following day. The bond itself existed only on paper. No money or collateral found its way to the magistrate, and the order from Bragnola's office was to inform Amon there was no known source for his sudden freedom, if he even bothered to ask. The special prosecutors and the judge would probably grumble about it over a martini lunch, but Bolin needed to make some noise, starting now. The FBI agent Bolin had borrowed from the intel gathering team at the SCTU command center had kept the soldier posted on Amon's movements over a cell phone. It didn't matter to Bolin if word got back to Powers or Grevy about his next move. In fact, he wanted it that way. The FBI agent had informed Bolin of Amon's thirty-second encounter with another Arab, who had already left the building. Sitting behind the wheel of a Jeep Cherokee he'd purchased off a used car lot, Bolin saw his target practically fly down the courthouse steps, hit Somerset, then proceeded south on foot. Driving through any big city was tough, but Boston was tougher than most. The streets were a jumbled maze, cutting through forty-story buildings, asphalt obliterating what used to be narrow village lanes during the days of Paul Revere. The way Amon was throwing looks over his shoulder told Bolin he was searching for a tail. It wouldn't be difficult for the man to shake Bolin, but if he had to, the soldier would park in an alley, grab the war bag off the back seat, and set off after the guy on foot. He knew one of two things was going to happen. Whoever Amon was running to meet would either take him back into the fold, or persuade him to tell them if he'd talked to the FBI, before they killed him. The executioner wanted to see Amon live at least long enough to answer a few choice questions. Grevy was watching incredulously as Power shoveled calamari, oysters, Rockefeller, and seafood chowder into his face. How the hell can you eat at a time like this? According to Powers' watch, the food arrived promptly at 11.20 hours. He appreciated the swift service so far, and made a mental note to leave the waitress at least a twenty, depending on how things went from there. As for Grevy's lack of appetite, he couldn't expect the FBI man to understand the basic principle of food where a warrior was concerned. In the field, under combat conditions, soldiers went without eating for stretches of time that the average man could never tolerate. And when food was available, it often wasn't worth feeding to Aunt Judy's poodle. Grevy could never imagine waiting in ambush, being forced to piss himself because he didn't dare to even breathe. Screw it. Why bother? Behind Grevy's mask of worry and irritation, Powers saw what he'd long since come to think of as the glint. He took a sip of Heineken, holding the look, and wondered if the man was calculating some new angle of intimidation to keep him on a short leash. Like that was possible. Perhaps this was the perfect moment to clear up a few matters, Powers thought. The Italian restaurant, with its red checkered tablecloths, reminded him of a mob joint he used to frequent in Brooklyn. That was where he had first encountered the glint. I understand the veal here is some of the best in town, but I was thinking I'd order that scampi and mussel special. Grevy glanced around and leaned forward. They'd taken a corner booth close to the noisy kitchen so their conversation would be drowned out. Cut the crap, Colonel. I didn't come here for the fucking veal. We got problems, and I suggest we begin addressing them or we may find ourselves in the proverbial world of shit. You may think you know men, warriors, whatever, better than I do, but it's as obvious as shit to me that this Belasco is more than just another desk jockey looking to impress his boss. I thought we already discussed this. <laughs> You're the one who was so anxious to have this little powwow. But I'd also like to eat. You can talk and eat at the same time, can't you? Grevy settled back and Powers clearly spotted the glint. I'm going to be real frank. Don't tell me. If I go down, you go down. Thank you. Took the words right out of my mouth. Good to hear we're still on the same page. I wasn't aware this had become a pissing contest. Is this where we go back to Brooklyn? Is this where you tell me about how you have the mother of all blackmail angles? It doesn't have to get ugly between us. <laughs> no... Now that you mention it, I was thinking I could always pay you off to get those picks back. I'm even willing to negotiate on the negatives, up to, say, uh, 30% of my cut from our foreign friend's final payment. 
It's gone way too far for a simple cash transaction between us. Funny how you should say that. I mean, it's always been just about the money for you. For me, it's a matter of principle. Oh, please. Spare me the flag-waving routine. Honor and duty and manhood. The savages out there devouring mom and her apple pie. I know what you are. Do you now? A stone-cold killing machine who wants the world to be exactly the way he wants it or else. What do you think would happen if somehow those pigs found their way down to brag, Colonel? Hey, you're the war hero. The ultimate tough guy. I think you'd be proud of your accomplishments. Want the whole world to know. Yeah. I'll start writing books like that SEAL guy about my exploits. Tell everyone how big my stones really are. A smile. The glint shining brighter empowers his face. You're the hunter. America's antidote to crime. Making city streets safer. Wiping out the drug-dealing, pimping, whoring, thieving scum of the earth. <laughs> Which reminds me, I'm getting that itch again. Need some release for all this testosterone buildup. We've got Belasco to deal with, Colonel, whether you think so or not. You need release that bad, try a copy of Playboy and some soap. I can't spare any more peace of mind while you head out for Roxbury tonight and whack some do-rags. Powers favored Greavy with a mean grin. What about my peace of mind? Since we're being frank and all, why don't we talk about how you took that away from me when you were working the FBI's special task force on organized crime in New York? or whatever the hell you called it. So I put you under surveillance. It was an accident. So you said. I just happened to look like one of the Don's button men. You were just tailing me. You're lucky I did it on my own instead of assigning a half dozen agents to follow you around where you made New York a safer place to live. That depends on your definition of luck. Grievy went on as if Powers hadn't spoken. I watched as you executed. What was it? Six gangbangers? Told them you were a cop, lined them up against the wall? Don't get me wrong. I don't really have a problem depriving this country of scum. It was the woman you shot. I always wondered why you did that. Remember how she begged for her life, screamed at you? She had four children? She was just a user, not a dealer. Powers couldn't bring himself to answer. When he'd shot her down in that alley, one bullet to the back of her head, it felt like he was gripped by a force beyond his control and reason. The trigger finger had a life of its own. She was just another crack whore. Kids half starved, fatherless, probably abused. They're probably all dead by now. Or strung up on dope. Or in jail. How do you know all that? Maybe she would have been busted eventually, forced by the system to get clean. She and those kids could have had a chance. Aren't we, Mr. Sensitive, all of a sudden? Powers forced the trembling out of his hand as he stabbed at the calamari. Well, what do you know? The great colonel, the hunter, sees the truth and turns a blind eye. You're really starting to irritate me, friend. I can't believe I'm hearing this from you of all people. Why? Because sometimes I agree with your perspective on the world? Well, you're right about one thing. I want our foreign friend's money. No matter what I say or do, that won't change. Grievy watched Powers squeeze lemon over his calamari. You know, Colonel, I'm thinking you brought me here just to mess with my head. Maybe you believe you can out-con the con. Maybe you want to take what you have squirreled away and hit the trail. Now you're a mind reader? Am I right? The answer is yes, no, and maybe. My ass is the one over the fire, Colonel. That's because you're the genius who set this whole thing in motion. You were the one used a couple of disgruntled CIA agents stationed overseas to get the ball rolling. You think it was just coincidence you met him in that bar? I can see it all now. Three great minds conspiring to remake the world. Hatching up a conspiracy so vast and buried so deep hell should be a script for the X-Files. Look, I put in the time, I invested the money. I took the initial risk with a little outside help. Just so happened a few easy pieces fell into place. Yeah, like our outside help being forced to flee his own country. Allah happened to be smiling your way, that is. Now our way. Speaking of which, how about our next payment? You check the wire transfers? I'll know something by the end of day's business. So... Does it bother you we had to sacrifice those men? Only if I think about it. But it was worth it, huh? The bad guys believe in us now. The cutout for our overseas source wanted to show his superior we were on the level. Since we took out a few of theirs to put up the smoke screen and make SCTU look legit, he wanted us to prove we're willing to offer up a few sacrificial lambs on our side. What are you crying about anyway? We didn't lose a single Delta shooter. You see me crying? When I went to the can, I called about a man. He's been freed on bond by an anonymous party. Half a million cash. Kind of strange, huh? Especially after our encounter with the Justice Department. 
So maybe Belasco's boss pulled some strings to set him free. What about it? This would have gone federal anyway, considering a domestic terrorism angle. Anyway, we finagled getting Amon handed over to us. Well, Colonel, if Amon is picked up by the cell here in town, and Belasco's on hand to sniff them out, are you aware how much damaging intelligence about the operation they have stored on disk? Names of contacts, even phone numbers, and locations of safe houses in other cities? Encrypted. Yeah, I've seen their so-called encryption. Any reasonably competent hacker could break it down by the time you finish your soup. And you're thinking our names will pop up somewhere in cyberspace? It's a possibility. So let's throw Belasco a bone, keep him busy. Say you take him on a little outing tonight. Pick out one of the remaining three safe houses. Have him lead the charge. Who knows, we might get lucky. Chicken soup could catch a bullet. Why does it sound like I'm going solo for this little sideshow? I'm getting tired of having to repeat myself. Tonight I'm unavailable. End of story. You're saying you want to take a stroll through Roxbury? A most pleasant way for me to spend the evening. Unwind. Get myself refocused. You want, I'll take a few pictures so you can fatten up your portfolio on the hunter. You're going to bring us down? No, I won't. We'll brief at 8 p.m. I'll even run this one by Luther. And how are you going to make yourself scarce? I'll think of something. Got a tip about another safe house. Struck out on my own, last second thing. Too dangerous to bring on the team. Wanted to check it myself first. You get all the answers, don't you, Colonel? Where are you going? You'll have to excuse me. One of us needs to take care of business. For some reason, I've lost any appetite I might have had. Suit yourself. But find out about our money. Powers eyed Greedy for a long moment. He was sick of the arrogance he'd endured from Greedy in the two years that had passed since Brooklyn. Even worse, as a warrior, he could never feel at ease when he knew his own destiny was under someone else's control. Well, perhaps it was time to force the issue. Going out for a hunt was meant as a demonstration that Colonel Powers was still his own man. He knew Greavy believed he had the upper hand with blackmail. But if Powers did pack up and split, well, life on the run was better than life in D-Block at Leavenworth. Greavy was right about one thing, though. As far as Powers was concerned, it was all about the money. He'd paid his dues to God and country, and it was time to collect what was coming to him. There was a beachfront paradise already bought and paid for, with white sandy beaches, tropical drinks, and young cooperative women. There were two problems, however. First, too many people knew too much about the conspiracy to slip terrorists' weapons and explosives into the country through the Texas Trucking Company. Then this justice guy had showed up out of nowhere, looking at them funny from behind his aviator shades. At some point, a link in the chain was going to get broken, and someone was going to squeal. When that happened, Powers would be prepared, make sure his bank account was fat enough to carry him away. Good luck finding him. Enjoy your lunch, Colonel. Powers watched Greavy march off, fuming. Nothing settled in the SAC's mind. The Colonel went back to work on his soup, then hailed the waitress to his table. With a full belly, he thought, he shouldn't have any problem out there tonight, making America a little safer. He felt sorry for whoever turned up in his path. After someone bounced Boland's potential informant from payphone to payphone, a black Lincoln Continental had finally picked up Amon several blocks from the Charles River. Because of the vehicle's dark-tinted windows, Boland had no idea how many people were inside. He maintained his tail, roughly five car lengths behind as they rolled down Beacon Street. Busy streets would either hinder the soldier's progress, maybe cost him his pursuit, or it would lend his SUV the appearance of just another link in the traffic chain. If he'd been made, his quarry gave no sign. Another ten minutes of holding his course, turning north toward the river, and he saw the Lincoln enter what looked like an abandoned industrial complex. The car stopped near a concrete loading dock running behind a three-story red brick warehouse. Doors flew open, and the dark-suited driver got out, while another swarthy, similarly dressed man exited the passenger side. Bolin cut the wheel, spying a gap between two grimy block-like structures when he saw the passenger fling open the back door and haul out Amon while eyeing the SUV. Amon's handler didn't give any indication he was set to panic. The executioner didn't care either way. The soldier was primed for a straight-on bull charge. He was going in blind, of course, but experience had long since showed Boland that a blitz was only as good as the man on the giving end. 
More times than he could count, Bolin had proved a master at dishing out wholesale slaughter. A simple show of overwhelming force flung in the face of an enemy usually shaved the odds in his favor. Of course, once bullets started flying, all bets were off. Bolin parked the SUV, shed his topcoat, and opened his war bag. The sleeveless nylon vest was the next best thing to combat harness under impromptu conditions. Slots, pouches, and webbing were filled and fitted with a mix of flashbang and high explosive grenades, spare clips for the HK-33 and sidearms, two 40mm grenades as backup for the M203, which was already stuffed with a high explosive round. No sense in getting caught short on firepower. Two sets of plastic cuffs, and Boland was out the door to go in search of enemy blood. Leaving the war bag behind was a risk he'd have to take, but there didn't seem much by way of human traffic in the area, and no sound of machinery indicated a workforce in the vicinity. It was as if this chunk of turf by the river was an eyesore the city planners wanted to ignore. When the noise of the shooting started, it would, he hoped, confine itself to this deserted wasteland. Locking the SUV, the soldier headed out, rounded the corner of the building, and found his quarry had disappeared inside the warehouse. Aware that there could be human or electronic eyes watching from anywhere in the vicinity, the soldier made swift tracks through the open gate. On the way in, he glimpsed a sign that read, Leland Trucking. He'd have to get the farm to check into the ownership of the property. The place was an obvious haven, maybe some staging point for a terrorist attack. Slinging the assault rifle around his shoulder, the executioner palmed the Beretta 93R, the sound suppressor already threaded in place, the selector mode set for single shot. At the farthest north end of the building, a minivan was parked near a dumpster. There could be as many as four or five men in the building, plus the two he already knew about. Then there was Amon. The soldier was hoping to take one or two alive for questioning. With any luck, this might be a gold mine of intelligence. Only one way to find out. The first assailant nearly flew out through the open loading dock door. The SMG tracking Boland's way told him they were geared up, waiting for the mystery invader to make his move in. The gods of war chose that moment to smile on the soldier, offering up a steel support beam in his path. The soldier went low, thrust himself around the opposite corner of the beam and tapped off a 9mm parabellum round. One down and out of play. Beretta stowed, Boland took the assault rifle and bored ahead. Boland had a working knowledge of Arabic, and in the frenzy of bellowed demands, he heard someone give an order to delete the files. His gold mine was just around the corner. Gauging the distance to the voices, Boland primed a flashbang grenade. Crouched by the open doorway, he chanced to look around the corner. Another hard man, charging toward the doorway, made eye contact with Boland for a heartbeat, bringing his stubby Ingram Mac-10 to bear. Boland beat him to it. A flash of frantic activity, guys wheeling his way, and Boland saw the swarthy passenger from the Lincoln grab him on by the shoulder. Another hard man was charging past the group, cutting a beeline straight for a set of stairs. Doomsday numbers ticking off in Boland's head. He lobbed the grenade, glimpsed it bouncing up, dead center in a group of four, maybe five. It was hard to tell since he was driven to cover. Even though he was well shielded, the soldier slid a couple of yards farther down from the hornet's nest of bullets snapping into the doorway. Two million candle power was set to light up the warehouse, rendering the enemy senseless. He looked away, squeezed his eyes shut, and slapped his hands over his ears. Charging low through the doorway, he noted four badly mauled hard men immediately ahead, teetering around in the smoke, hands grabbing at blinded eyes or bleeding ears. Amon was on the ground, clutching at his handler's leg, as if beseeching deliverance. The executioner moved ahead, took in the target area. He spied a lot of empty ground, a few crates stacked here and there, some 55-gallon drums, a scattering of workbenches, the catwalks free of potential combatants as far as he could tell. Bolin directed a short burst of 5.56-millimeter lead toward one of the hard men, stitching a ragged crimson line up his left leg. In the next few seconds, Boland dropped three more shooters in a heap of tangled limbs. In the meantime, Amon's handler had somehow managed to free himself from his prisoner's clutches. Suddenly, before Boland could adjust his aim, the man jammed a pistol into Amon's ear. Fighting down a curse of frustration, Boland tapped the HK-33's trigger and hit the handler in the shoulder. No sooner had the man toppled than Boland was looming over him kicking his PPK pistol away and drawing a bead on the man's face. I counted eight. Anyone else around? What? His hearing was most likely damaged from the grenade blast. 
Bolin placed the muzzle of the HK-33 between the handler's eyes. I don't like having to repeat myself. Eight of you, including Amon? The man appeared to focus. Yes, eight! Consider yourself warned. I don't give liars a second chance. Bolin reached down and flipped the man over on his stomach. Oh. Ah, ah, ah. Fastening his prisoner's hands behind his back with the cuffs, Bolin set off for the stairs in pursuit of the information he'd come for. The injured Arab assigned the task of deleting said information had crawled out of sight behind a partition that shielded the stairs. Jacked up on fear and pain, the wounded man began capping off shots from a pistol. Wood flew in Bolin's face as he reached the partition. He had no time for some Wild West standoff. Standing, Bolin moved to the bottom of the steps. Halfway up, he found the air of a pulpy red mess, but still fumbling for his pistol. The executioner began ascending the steps, setting his sights on an open doorway to what appeared to be an office. Topping the steps, he saw two computers beyond the doorway, a wall map of Boston, a fax machine, and a shredder. Bingo. Sudan. The horror show was starting earlier than usual. The sun hadn't even set over the barren plain beyond the People's Palace of Sudan, and already Nafud saw Saeed had tied on half a load, the bottle of cognac in his pudgy hand three-quarters empty. The lieutenant general wobbled his flabby girth toward a giant screen TV, roughly as large as two king-size beds, his belly jiggling as he chuckled and waved the remote around at his guests and soldiers. I am glad all of you could attend the demonstration of our noble fight against the SPLA savages who wish to destroy the government of Sudan. As if they had a choice, Nafud thought sourly, noting the tense looks and lowered gazes among the bankers. A few of the officers chuckled, looking proud and expectant, as if ribbons were about to be pinned on their already over-metaled blouses. Nafud thought he was going to be sick. Standing beyond the ring of soldiers, officers, and the two CIA mercenaries, he sipped from his glass of Merlot. He hoped enough wine would wash away the queasy churn in his belly, generated by anticipation of the film to come. Trying to shake the image of gaping crocodile jaws from his thoughts, Nafud took a moment to look around the sprawling living room. He wondered what sort of madness could generate these opulent surroundings. He wondered how such wealth, obscene even by his own standards, could be seized by a few men who no more value the lives of their countrymen than they would a cockroaches. Then he reminded himself, this was Sudan. Here, death and suffering were the only constants. Here they starved to death daily, by perhaps the thousands. The UN and the Red Cross had long since publicly admitted the stupidity of turning over cargo planes heaped with food and medical supplies to a bunch of patronizing soldiers on the tarmac. The soldiers promptly handed it all over to the likes of men like Saeed, who turned around and resold it to cronies in Somalia or Ethiopia for hefty sums of cash. Forget this sudden epidemic rise in HIV. In Sudan, they died in droves from treatable diseases such as malaria, TB, or syphilis. The vaccines and antibiotics were confiscated by Sudan's ruling body, then sold for a few more dollars that went toward financing their campaign of genocide in the Black South. Nafud knew all too much about Sudan's plagues. He had learned all he could about all the bacteria and disease carried by ticks, worms, and mosquitoes, hoping to protect himself from any one of a dozen illnesses that could prove fatal if they run their course. Nafud squinted against the glare from all that glittered around him. Everything was trimmed in gold or silver, from the bar and adjoining whirlpool tub to the banks of wall mirrors and the railings of the winding marble staircases hugging the north and south walls. The hanging chandeliers were perhaps half the size of some small cars, and they were made from cut diamonds, not crystal. The floor was polished white marble that blindingly reflected the twinkling blaze above. Was that a vague shadow of his reflection on the floor? Did he look troubled? He looked up toward the oversized couch, which was made from a bizarre mix of leopard and lion skin on a teakwood base. It was shaped like a horseshoe and big enough to comfortably hold 40 men, although only the upper echelon officers and an assortment of bankers and other businessmen from Khartoum were deemed worthy enough to have front row seating. 
A dozen or so soldiers now worked their way around the couch or offered cocktails from silver trays to those lower-ranking officers left standing. A few of the soldiers looked a trifle surly at being relegated to waiter duty, serving up drinks and enough caviar, suckling pig and oysters to put his own father's lavish indulgences to shame. Nafud was grateful there were never any women in the viewing audience. Saeed had enough common sense to realize that the outrage and horror might dampen a woman's willingness to please his sudden urges. Searching out something to distract him from the spectacle of Saeed, Nafud spotted the small contingent of imported beauties still out by the pool. He gazed longingly through the French double doors at the lounging nubile flesh in the dying sunshine. Nafud sighed, seeing a few pairs of tender ripe lips lingering on crystal goblets, blonde hair glowing his way in the fading light. He felt the heat stirring in his loins and wished he could excuse himself to go in search of some more pleasant way to pass the time. He couldn't, and not just because Saeed would notice and take offense. The CIA war dog, Cragen, had moments ago whispered he needed a moment alone to discuss something. The grizzled, white-haired mercenary claimed it was urgent. Nafud suspected it would turn out to be simply haggling over more money, but there was something else he'd read in the merc's tone that left him wondering. But what? Fear? The lights! Turn them down! Nafud caught the dark looks exchanged among the bankers and smiled, grateful he wasn't alone in his disgust. The lights dimmed, casting little more than shadows around the living room. Then a picture of death jumped out of the crowd with a jab of the remote in Saeed's hand. A row of skulls, either half bleached to rotting by the sun, or the flesh picked clean by the vultures and the ravens, Nafud couldn't say, was lined up behind Saeed, who stood there on screen, grinning into the camera, an AK-74 cantered across his medallioned uniform. He then looked set to wretch, but somehow kept the smile in place before he produced a thick bandana and wrapped it around his nose and mouth. The smell of death is all around me. Some of my soldiers vomit from a stench I can only describe as something coming from the very bowels of hell. I urge them, as their leader, to always stand tall, to take in the smell as a smell of triumph, of our destiny as holy victors over the savage hordes here in southern Sudan. The scene cut to soldiers with machetes, lopping off the heads of dead rebels. Some of them didn't look any older than 16, 18 tops to Nafud, two of them balking at driving their machetes through an exposed throat until an older soldier walked up and nudged them with his AK-74. But he'd overheard the rumors about youths during the drunken retelling of war stories by officers here in the palace, how they were kidnapped from their schools, sent to the front lines, fight or die. It also occurred to Nafu, the lieutenant general always showed himself to the viewing audience after the bodies were piled up and the blood had long since stopped running. The man never looked ruffled or adrenalized in the eyes after his alleged close encounters with death. Not even the first bead of sweat on his face, not a stain anywhere from head to toe, the uniform so crisp and clean it might have just been pulled out of the closet. Saeed always claimed some heroic leading of the charge after the fact, but Nafud was dubious. The camera moved on. Nafud saw a few jeeps burning near the teak forests on a dirt trail littered with corpses. More than a few of the sprawled black bodies were still being worked on by vultures. Nafud noticed with mounting horror that the scavengers seemed to have some preference for eyeballs. Crocodiles with wings, he thought. Nafud spotted Kragan slowly backing away from the viewing audience. Everyone, including Saeed, was too engrossed to notice. We know the SPLA is being funded and armed by outsiders. Who these saboteurs are, we do not yet know. Everyone here knows what a croc that statement is, Nafud thought. We are at war, gentlemen. Plain and simple. The savages are knocking at our back door, and we must stand and fight or perish. Ask yourself, if you find these scenes too horrible to watch, would God want us to tuck our tails between our legs like gelded whelps, allow our enemies to plunder our homes, claim our women, enslave us? God despises the coward. Nafud winced as the film's action cut to a night scene a setting he knew all too well. 
A jerky roaming light barely revealed soldiers shoving black rebels through a mesh gate toward some huge thrashing mass. Nafud choked down the acid bile in his throat. Cragen, he noted, appeared to enjoy the spectacle of men being eaten alive by crocodiles. The merc sipped from his glass of bourbon. There is some possible trouble you need to be made aware of, Sheik. Nafud glimpsed an expression of smug arrogance on the merc's bronzed, heavily lined face. The bargaining was about to begin. Cragen paused, worked on his drink, his silence fueling the Omani's rising irritation. And? I think there's going to be trouble for you in the days ahead, only I can't be 100% certain. Listen to me, before you get all bent out of shape and have the lieutenant general looking our way, here it is. Two of my most trusted men have suddenly disappeared. They know a lot. They know I've funneled in those huge deliveries not only from my own employers, but from close personal contacts of mine in Europe and parts of the Middle East. They know the shipments in question fell into your hands and were rerouted to your sources in America. You have trouble, I have trouble. Is that what you're implying? The trouble is that one of these men made off with a set link that can communicate with my American employers over a secured line. They might have passed the word on that all's not what it seems in Sudan. Meaning fingers will point this way. Perhaps some commandos will come hunting for me. That's certainly a possibility, especially if the weapon shipments are connected to their point of origin. My employers can tend to play God. Sometimes they have eyes and ears not even I can find. Is this blackmail? No, no. This is a business proposition, Sheik. I'm going to be staying here at the palace another two, three days until some details are ironed out between us. Such as more money? It would certainly be incentive on my end to see you stay free and breathing. What are the chances of you finding these two potential troublemakers? Slim to none. Unless, of course, I cared to take a full battalion of men into the bush and root them out. That would be a suicide mission. The problem there, you see, is that a few of the higher-ups in the SPLA leadership are aware their CIA friends have duped them, gave them a serious shortage on weapons and promised funding. Both of which, especially this funding, went into your pocket. <laughs> hey... We all have to look to the future, and mine doesn't include dying in this shithole. And this business proposition? I have a jet under wraps. I'm taking out the transponder, installing an anti-radar housing, mapping out a safe flight path. Now I'm going to have to chat at some point with the lieutenant general, clear up a few matters with him. Say he's sad to see you go, or feels some duplicity on this side. A hefty wire transfer to his account should take care of any hurt feelings. Or he might feed us to his pet crocodiles. Mmm, won't happen. I can be quite the salesman when I want to be. And just what are you trying to sell me? Life. Why don't we, meaning you, me, and Saeed, sit down in private later and discuss a plan that would make all of us happy? I'll think about it. You do that. I'll need more details. What you think you know about some possible attack by U.S. commandos. I didn't say that was going to happen. Hmm, but it could. During my tour here in Sudan, I've come to understand two things about this shithole. One, life is cheap. And two, anything is possible if the price is right. Hey, you were the one who bailed from your country. You were the one hatched the jihad that is now underway overseas. You were the one marched out a known and wanted freedom fighter to do your recruiting. I'm not looking to spook you any further, Sheik. But I can tell when a guy's concerned about his future, scrambling in hope of saving his ass. I'm saying the game here in Sudan is dead, played out. We could all fly off into the sunset free, rich, and happy. I'm here to help, not hurt. Nafud wanted to tell the man he was already rich, but watched in silence as the CIA merc passed in front of him, then wandered toward the bar. The Omani didn't know what to believe, much less who he could trust. But if there was some trouble headed his way, then it might be in his best interest to secure some other safe haven. Nafud wanted to at least live long enough to see the jihad fully erupt in America. Then he became aware that his gaze had somehow settled on the sight of a rebel getting chomped on by a massive crocodile. Nafud grimaced, looked away when the rebel was hauled beneath the churning waters, body and screams vanishing beneath the thrashing foam. Now... <laughs> now that is what I call food for thought. 
Boland's search of the command center ate up nearly five critical minutes before he found the lockbox in a cubbyhole walled up by loose brick. The box was empty except for one floppy disk. The soldier was eager to grill his prisoner and decided not to boot up one of the computers for a look at the contents of the disk, which was more than likely coded anyway. He'd turn over the disk to the cyber wizards at the farm. Aaron, the Bear Kurtzman and company were the best at cracking encrypted intel. HK-33 at the ready as he descended the stairs, Bolin listened to the silence beyond the partition. Something felt wrong. His instinct for trouble was itching. Hitting the bottom of the steps, he cautiously moved out into the open, only to find his prisoner was nowhere in sight. The soldier looked up to see his prisoner launch himself into a swan dive off the catwalk. Bolin dashed out of the way just before the Arab slammed headfirst into the concrete he'd just been standing on. Brains went all over the place. The spread-eagled body twitched for a few seconds, then went still. <sighs> Shit. So much for taking a live one. The soldier had two quick calls to make. First, to Brognola, who would alert the farm that the disc was coming their way. Then he'd contact Commander Jeffries. Since Agent Velasco was unofficially in charge of SCTU, the soldier wanted Grevian powers to take a look at the mess he wanted them to clean up. It was a dangerous hand he was about to play, but the sight of the carnage would make them aware that Special Agent Velasco was something more than his Justice Department credentials claimed. Bolin had to do something to flush them out, force their hand, create a window of opportunity. With any luck, they'd come gunning for him. Then the tables could be turned. The soldier was heading for the open door when he spotted two 55-gallon drums in the murky depths of the far north corner. At first, he couldn't quite make out the markings on the drums, but as he approached, the universal sign for radiation leaped out at him. He changed direction, recalling Brognola's mention of a dirty bomb laced with radioactive waste. A harder search, and he spotted a tarp covering a bulky heap behind the stairs. Reaching the hidden mass, he slid the tarp off a stack of unmarked wooden crates. Unsheathing his commando dagger, Bolin pried the lids off of two of the crates. The first contained plastic-wrapped bundles of gray-white bricks. Bolin figured he was looking at approximately 300 pounds of C4. At least two dozen Italian Spectre submachine guns were loaded in the other opened crate. Bolin had to assume there was hardware and explosives in the other crates as well, and it left him wondering just how vast and entrenched the terrorist cell in Boston was. With a renewed sense of urgency, the executioner beat a hasty retreat from the warehouse. More now than ever, he was grimly aware he was racing against some doomsday clock. Powers waited until Grevy slid his black unmarked Ford into his parking space in SCTU's underground garage. Searching the area, satisfied they would be alone, the colonel slid the Beretta 92F from the shoulder rigging beneath his bomber jacket. Threading the sound suppressor to the muzzle, he held his ground. Hidden behind the concrete post beside the basement door he knew Greavy would have to take to get to the bank of elevators. Powers felt his grip tighten on the Beretta. A whiff of Greavy's aftershave passed him, and Powers whipped out from hiding. The shock forming Greavy's expression was instant as the colonel slung the SAC against the concrete pillar and jammed the Beretta's sound-suppressed muzzle under his chin, pinning him there like some bug beneath a microscope. You want to tell me what the hell is going on, Greavy? Yeah, maybe you'd like to tell me why you've got a gun shoved under my jaw. One word. Velasco. <laughs> what about him? Where have you been the past two hours? Out. Driving around. Clearing up my head. Then I guess you don't know? Know what? According to Luther, Velasco followed him on to our boys near the river. Seems Luther wants us to head out with a special issue hazmat team and eight body bags. What the hell are you talking about? Seems this Belasco waxed all eight of our terrorists there, by himself. Turned up two 55-gallon drums of radioactive waste that may or may not get tracked back to us. I've gone to considerable trouble and expense, mister, to make sure my man out west safely delivered that little radioactive mix. Wait a minute. Velasco took out eight men? Luther wants us to go there and personally clean up the guy's mess. But I think you know more about Special Agent Velasco than you're telling me. <laughs> you actually think I'm going to cut my own throat at this stage? 
Hey, asshole. If this guy is something other than what he's pretending to be, maybe he came from your part of the country. I already checked the jackets of current and former black ops from Bragg, A to Z. He's not one of mine. So what are you going to do now? Blow my brains out? Go solo? Go ahead, Colonel. Pull the trigger if you think I brought Pulasco here to ruin your life. Don't tempt me. Look, lose the gun. I'm not the problem. Powers searched the man's eyes and decided Grevy was playing it straight. Slowly, he pulled the Beretta away and stepped back. Here it is, Grevy. Belasco has to go. I'm stepping up tonight's raid. Look, I don't think my overseas man is going to appreciate us sacrificing any more of his recruits. I don't give a shit at this point. I informed Luther about our strike. He gave it a thumbs up. Strangely enough, given what's happened, our commander doesn't even want to be on site when it goes down. That's the last part of the cell here in Boston. We wiped them out. There's more where that came from. Boston's finished for us. Okay, listen up. I'm gonna bail right before we strike. Tell Belasco I've got a lead on another cell. Take off on one of your little hunting expeditions, you mean? Only Belasco will follow. I'll make sure he catches a bullet. Powers tucked the Beretta away, his gaze falling off Grevy. Yeah. Oh. 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 When the stars cleared, Powers felt his brain threaten to become jelly, his legs nearly folding at the knees. Somehow he held on, staggered back, considered reclaiming the Beretta when he saw Grevy holding his ground, flexing his fingers. Next time you pull a gun on me, Colonel, you better pull the trigger. Are we clear? Powers worked his sore jaw, massaging it with his hand. <laughs> Crystal, I'll let that one slide. But the next time you so much as lay a hand on my shoulder, I'll tear out your throat and hold it up before your dying eyes. Are we clear, Crystal? Boland took a room in a hotel near the Heinz Convention Center and quickly went to work getting the sat link up the wireless modem on the laptop computer relaying the encrypted data from the confiscated disk to the farm. Some thirty minutes later, there was good news and bad news coming out of Hal Brognola's office at the Justice Department. Bolin listened, indulging in a rare cigarette, as the big feds spoke over the secured line on the sat link. There are things we may be looking at contacts, phone numbers, locations of other cells in various U.S. cities. And? That's the good news. The bad news is it's all in Arabic, and it's all in code. How long before they break it? It could be hours. Or days. But the farm turned up something else, Stryker. Unless they miss their guess, we've established proof of a link overseas to what's happening here. Bolin listened as Brognola launched into a long revelation about the Omani Sheikh in hiding. According to the Big Fed, the Sheikh was a known rabble-rouser, having spewed anti-West diatribe all the way from his native soil to Sudan, where he was under the care and protection of the country's military. It seemed the CIA had a full complement of military advisors from their Special Operations Division, in other words, mercenaries, who were taking Nafud's money for weapons and explosives that were supposed to go to the SPLA. These weapons, according to a communique to Langley that the farm had intercepted, had somehow found their way back to the U.S. This had just been learned from two of the mercenaries in Sudan that were now on the run and hiding from their comrades, apparently having grown some sense of patriotic duty in the past couple of days. Sudan was a known breeding and training ground for international terrorists, and it appeared that a few fanatics had recently been shipped out of Sudan straight to America. The rogue CIA element was believed to be shipping men and materiel via their new Air America. There's your source, Hal. I get the feeling you want to go after the Hydra yourself. Bolin had already brought the Big Fed up to speed on his activities, from the engagement with the Arab terrorists to the discovery of nuclear waste. Now he'd learned from Commander Jeffries that his suspected rat bastards were planning a raid on some terrorist cell later that evening. The soldier had a decision to make. Stay on in Boston, or pay Sudan a visit. How long would it take Barbara to prepare to drop me into this people's palace where Nafud is holed up? The soldier referred to Barbara Price, the farm's mission controller. Well, we're talking about flight arrangements, logistics. I know we have a Joint Special Forces Israeli base in the Sinai that might make a good launching point, but using that will require some arm twisting. Grimaldi is over in Indonesia doing a flying honor for Phoenix Force. Hell, it'll take a good six, seven hours to nail down the details. 
Jack Grimaldi was Stony Man's ace pilot. Whatever it takes, have Barbara get me to Sudan ASAP. I'll need six black suits at my disposal. Whenever the next satellite pass over of Sudan is, I'll need a full and comprehensive layout of this palace. I'm going in, Hal. I cut one head off the Hydra, and my gut tells me all the others will die, too. And what about Powers and Greavy? I'll go along with them on this raid tonight. I've turned up the heat, and I'm hoping they'll show themselves for the traitors I believe they are. You know what happened during their last two so-called raids? I'm hoping three's the charm. By then, Barbara should have worked out the details to get me to Sudan. Striker, Sudan is the biggest hellhole on Earth. It's infested with killers, terrorists, starvation, disease, every plague of humankind. They're staunchly anti-West. The legitimate world powers, the UN and the Red Cross, have denounced the Khartoum government as a brutal and corrupt regime. They make any criminal cartel out there now look like choir boys. There's no other way to do this, Hal. I'm going in just as soon as Barbara makes it possible. I intend to hit this people's palace like the fifth horseman of the apocalypse. Some missions took longer to organize than others. Bolin hoped this wasn't one of those missions. He was counting on Stony Man Farm to get him on his way to Sudan in three or four hours tops. Not that Bolin didn't have something to do in the meantime. Far from it, in fact. The executioner never waited for any problem to come to him. So as the day faded to night, he had Commander Jeffries fill him in on the night's proposed raid, then ordered the commander to remain available at his office. The soldier wanted to see Greavy and Powers in action for himself. After showering and ordering room service in his hotel, Bolin grabbed a quick combat nap, anticipating that once the Sudan operation was launched, it could be days before he slept, even eight. Brognola would call him when the farm was set to fly him out. Now all hands were assembled in the parking garage of the SCTU command center. The soldier counted 12 commandos equipped with full body armor, balaclava helmets, and comm links with throat mics. Each commando was toting an HK MP5 subgun, and they began boarding three separate black vans. Bolin had skipped the briefing and gone straight to Greavy and Powers for the particulars about the raid and the terrorists in question. Supposedly, three Iraqis had been linked to the dead men Bolin had left near the river. What a coincidence, Bolin thought. Powers claimed their intel-gathering wizards had traced the phony paperwork found at the warehouse to two INS agents, one in Boston, the other working out of the Manhattan office. Conveniently, they weren't available for arrest. According to Greavy, both INS men, who might have been valuable sources of information, had packed up and vanished. Packing into their bank records, the SCTU cyber team found they had earlier that day made hefty withdrawals from mid-six-figure savings accounts, sums that hardly jived with the salaries of civil servants. None of this explained how Powers and Greavy always came up with locations for suspected terrorist cells, but Bolin wasn't going to waste his time asking questions about it, only to hear the same old bullshit in response. It also struck Bolin as curious that neither Greavy nor Powers had offered any comment about his one-man takedown of an eight-man terrorist cell right under their noses. And since Greavy and Powers always seemed to know right where to find the bad guys, how come they couldn't find the bunch Bolin had terminated? Bolin intended to do more than just go along for the ride on this next raid. He intended to help lead the charge, take a prisoner. From his parked SUV, he took the war vest, filled with spare clips, a flashbang grenade, and HE rounds for the M203 grenade launcher. Then he shrugged on the vest and checked the loads on both the Beretta and the 44 Magnum Desert Eagle autoloader. I wasn't aware that kind of cannon was standard Justice Department issue. Bolin found Greavy looking his way, the SAC locking and loading his own HK MP5. Personal favorite? Or is that a throwaway piece in case you blast the wrong guy? Bolin dropped the mammoth gun into the holster, riding his hip. Interesting question. I don't know. I've never blasted the wrong guy. <laughs> well, that's comforting. Now you want to saddle up, Belasco? The soldier looked around for powers. He spotted the colonel striding toward a black Ford, a cell phone pressed to his ear. What's that about? The colonel won't be joining the party. And why is that? He received a tip there may be another cell operating somewhere in Roxbury. He's going to check it out. If we get confirmation, this could be a doubleheader. Bolin was catching a whiff of some hidden agenda. You coming or what, Pelasco? 
The executioner didn't answer, opening the door to his SUV. From the way Grievy was acting, the soldier guessed something was being staged for him, that he was meant to head out and follow the colonel. But why? Didn't matter. Whatever powers his game, Bolin would play it out. Velasco, I'm talking to you. Three Iraqis against twelve heavily armed commandos. I don't see where the bad guys stand a chance. What the hell are you talking about? Looks like you've got everything under control. I'd just be in the way. Velasco! Oh, and Grievy? Try not to blow the place up. There might be hard evidence there. Of what? When I find out, you'll be the first to know. Power saw Velasco's SUV in the side view mirror, four or so car lengths behind, right where he wanted him. The colonel kept a nice easy pace as he headed down Columbus, and the first grim telltale signs he was entering an urban combat zone began to show themselves. The creatures of the night were out in force. A few of the more paranoid, he noted, would scurry down alleys at the sight of what they feared was a lone, unmarked cop car on the prowl. The more defiant ones held their lounging positions in stairwells or in the steps of tenement buildings or the nooks and corners of the triple-decker department buildings. One loitering cockroach gave him the middle finger salute. <laughs> Welcome to the jungle. They were smoking crack in full view and defiance of the law, he observed. Some tall black guy in white pants, white shoes, and pink fedora was slapping around one of his girls. Animals, he thought. What was their contribution anyway, he wondered, besides keeping the courts busy and the prison guards employed. Another block or so and powers slowly eased the big ford into a long alley. A few shadows stirred midway down and decided flight was called for when the unmarked Ford hit them with the lights. Powers parked the car, doused the lights, and took a quick look in his side view mirror. He saw Belasco's SUV roll slowly past the mouth of the alley. Outstanding. The colonel unzipped a small black nylon bag and hauled out the mini Uzi. He threaded the sound suppressor to the compact SMG, then hung it beneath his jacket in the special shoulder rigging. He dropped four spare clips into his pockets, then figured, what the hell, and stowed away two fragmentation grenades. He never knew what might turn up on a hunting expedition. He climbed out, smiling into the enveloping darkness. It was time to go hunting. And if Velasco caught up to him, well, Mr. Special Agent might just get caught in the crossfire. Life was tough like that sometimes. The executioner found an empty, weed-choked lot near the alley where he saw Powers park the Ford. He was glad he'd left the war bag behind in his hotel room, since mere glass and metal wouldn't protect him in this part of town. With only the necessities to see him through whatever was on SCTU's menu for the night, Bolin stepped out of the SUV, locked it up, and slipped an arm through the HK-33 strap. He did the best he could to conceal the bulk beneath a black leather trench coat. He stepped through the gaping hole in the chain-link fence and hit the sidewalk, heading for the alley where Powers ditched his Ford. He could feel the night people watching his swift progress, measuring him in paranoid silence, the thundering of rap bellowing from somewhere in the rows of tenements. In the alley, he gave the abandoned Ford a once-over, then searched the far-reaching darkness ahead. He was stepping deeper into the alley when a shadow stumbled around the corner of a tenement building. <laughs> You a cop, man? Maybe. You gotta help, man. You a cop? This crazy white dude, he just started shooting up my homeboys. All we done, asked for a smoke, and he smiles, but saying sure. Then, then pulls out a piece and just starts blasting. How did you manage to make it? I ran, that's how. I'll take it from here. And do me a favor. Yeah, anything. Just nail that crazy bastard. He did my homies, man. Don't call the police. <laughs> they wouldn't come anyway, man. Why's that? You ain't never seen a cop around here. Got more guns in this neighborhood, automatic weapons. No cop crazy enough to take a stroll here, unless he picking up his cut from the crack man. When Bolin rounded the corner into another alley, he spotted three bodies stretched out near a dumpster, the blood still running from their shattered skulls. The executioner unleathered the Beretta. Powers was on a roll. First, the three homeboys. He'd popped off three quick ones, putting one nine-millimeter hole each between their eyes. But before he knew it, he'd lost one. The guy moved like a rabbit. What could he do? Shit happened. 
Two shadows were scrunched up in the framework of some broken-down door, the glass stems lowered away from their lips, the flames of their lighters dying at the sight of the lone armed man in black headed their way. Didn't your mothers ever tell you smoking that garbage is bad for your health? Powers saw their drug-addled brains were having difficulty understanding his little joke, so he decided to drive home the punchline. It was cherry pickings out here tonight, he thought, rolling past them as they folded at the knees and flopped to the alley. He needed something more dramatic, like a drug den, whorehouse, maybe a nightclub, a whole slew of zombies he could send home to hell. With any luck, he'd find it. A real challenge to keep the juices flowing. All Bolin had to do was follow the trail of bodies. He found two more heaped on another alley floor before a darkened doorway. Like the first three bodies, he found they were unarmed after a quick pat-down. The soldier could well imagine the sort of bigoted hatred that fueled Powers' killing march. He'd gone up against it before, too many times to count. But why would Powers risk showing what he really was to a man he suspected of smelling him out as a rat bastard? Powers wanted him to see this, follow him deeper into this maze of alleys. This was staged, and even if the colonel had gone off before on what he saw as some kind of righteous vigilante hunt, Boland's hunch was that he was being led into an ambush. Now Powers was winging around grenades. It took a few critical seconds, but Boland holstered the Beretta, stripped off the top coat, and filled his hands with the HK-33. The executioner set off, picking up the pace. Powers became lightheaded with glee, fueled by a fresh burst of adrenaline when he hit major pay dirt. He'd found the steel door at the bottom of the stairwell, heard the racket of rap music thumping away, hardly muted by the thick barrier. He armed the grenade, banged on the door, and took cover back up the steps. The door opened just wide enough to reveal a paranoid face framed by an afro. Powers charged through the boiling smoke. A few armed hulks draped in gold jewelry tried to stop him. A few wild rounds snapped past the colonel's head as he peeled off, taking in the large room with its oversized couches and chaos at a flying glance. The compact SMG stuttering in his fists, Powers stitched three would-be heroes with 9mm parabellum rounds. A blur in the corner of his eye turned out to be some guy charging him like an enraged rhino. Powers bent at the knees, and the dealer's momentum carried him over the colonel's shoulders. Powers hit the guy in the back of the skull with a three-round burst on his way down, cleaving off chunks of shaved head. Holding back on the trigger, he started spraying the room at random. <laughs> the barrage sent one of the semi-clad females flying headfirst into the stereo. Powers didn't want to waste more time here than necessary. Velasco couldn't be far behind. The colonel saw people pouring out of the bedrooms in a narrow hallway dead ahead. He armed his second frag grenade and pitched the steel egg into the human pack, bodies bowling into one another as they stampeded, heading for what he assumed was some back way out. He took cover behind the wall. Something was staggering near a massive fish tank. An angry black face, fists filled with a Tech-9, loomed up behind the fluttering stuffing blown out of the couch by Grenade Blast-1. Powers burned up the SMG's clip, dumping the guy into the fish tank. Powers slammed a fresh magazine home and began raking long bursts down the hallway. He nearly caught a bullet as he flew past an open door. Some guy was hunkered down inside, pulling the trigger on a semi-automatic pistol for all he was worth. Powers tapped off an SMG burst, catching the guy square in the chest with a figure eight goring. At the end of the hall, Powers saw a few runners heading for the door. He held back on the trigger, slamming them into the steel partition in a rain of shredded flesh and crimson. Checking his rear, satisfied it was a clean sweep, the colonel hit the door and burst out into the night. The sight of such indiscriminate slaughter, whether these folks were engaged in illicit activity or not, coiled Boland's gut with rage. Squinting through the smoke and the feathery fall of stuffing, the soldier could tell they were all dead. Was this a not-so-subtle message from Powers? Was Agent Belasco supposed to be next? Apparently, Powers saw himself as the last line of defense between the criminal element and his vision of a better America. 
Bolin assumed this wasn't the first time the colonel had gone on a murderous vigilante rampage, but he intended to make it the last. Cautious but quick, Bolin advanced down the hallway, stepping over sprawled, leaking human remains. The door was open. He could almost feel powers somewhere beyond the opening, lying in wait. The stink of blood and emptied bladders and bowels was hitting him in the face like an invisible hammer, but the executioner stopped at the doorway and crouched. A gentle push at the door, and he saw he'd come to another narrow alley. Strangely enough, just as the terrified runner had told him, he didn't even hear a hint of a distant wailing siren. If he thought about it, the soldier would be disturbed that the residents of this neighborhood didn't rate a visit by the cops, even when it was obvious to anyone with eyes and ears that all hell had broken loose. But he didn't have time to think about it at the moment. Bolin spotted a shadow at two o'clock, the familiar marching gait betraying to the soldier he was mere seconds behind powers. The executioner made two abrupt decisions. The first choice was to turn the hunter into the hunted. His second decision, if he pulled it off, would leave the colonel so stunned he wouldn't find himself capable to even eat, much less sleep any time soon. The constant adrenaline rush seared his combat senses to new heights. Even as his blood boiled and he hungered to keep killing, Powers had held his ground in the alley until he caught the door cracking open a hair, then set off into the mouth of an adjoining dark alley. He settled behind a garbage bin, aware that Belasco was within striking distance. There was enough light still spilling from the doorway of the drug den. Velasco was a tall shadow, stepping into view, wielding an assault rifle, a searching, confused expression on the man's face, clearly framed in the soft glow. What the hell was Velasco doing? Silently, Powers urged the guy to come his way, finger taking up the slack on the SMG's trigger. Another second of hesitation, and Velasco moved away, setting off down the alley ahead. Powers broke cover, reached the alley wall. Peering low around the corner, he found Velasco picking up the pace before he vanished into another alley, thirty-some yards away. Powers bit down the chuckle at the sight of the guy looking baffled as hell. This was the gunslinger who waxed eight tangos? Power set off in pursuit, hugging the red brick facade. He hit the mouth of the bisecting alley and looked around the corner. What the hell? There was no sign of Belasco. It was hard to see down to the far end of the alley, although the street lights beyond cast a murky white sheen. Still, it was enough light, so he should have seen some sign of Belasco, even a shadow. Then he noticed the garbage bin. Belasco had taken cover. Powers started down the alley, sights set on the bin. Mini Uzi poised to start blasting as soon as the guy came into sight. Freeze! Lose the weapon! The crack in the brick wall had been wide enough to barely allow Bolin to squeeze through, weight in blackness that was choked with the stench of urine and vomit. It was a fluke finding the dark slash in the side of the building, and he could only wonder how it got there. It was enough, just the same, to conceal the executioner until he could issue the warning to the colonel's back and paralyze the man in his tracks. Powers cocked his head and smirked. <laughs> Is this the part where you read me rights? The gun. Powers released the mini Uzi, sent it clattering to the broken concrete. Grab some air, Colonel. You so much as twitch for that sidearm under your yeah, coat. Yeah, yeah, you'll shoot me down like a dog. I'm thinking about it. Powers raised his arms. But you won't. Not now. Am I under arrest? No. This is your lucky night. You're free to go. What? Bolin wasn't about to show any more of his hand. We're the only ones who need to know what happened out here tonight. Why am I having a hard time buying that? That's your problem. See so you shrink if you start having anxiety attacks. You don't even want to hear the speech why I did this? Skip it. I've heard it before. It doesn't wash with me. So if you're not arresting me, if you're not going to shoot me down, then what? Face front. Turn your head again, and I'll put a few in your legs. I don't get you, Belasco. It's obvious you're no G-man. What are you, CIA? NSA? The colonel might eventually realize that Bolin wanted to get him running scared, use him as bait, maybe bring to light whatever contacts he had in the shadows of the conspiracy. There was Sudan for Bolin to consider next. Then there was Grevy and perhaps a whole slew of unknown targets out there, scattered around different U.S. cities, oiling their guns and priming the charges to high explosives. While Bolin left Powers and Grevy to sweat it out, Brognola and the farm should have no trouble keeping tabs on SCTU.
Sudan was the Hydra, and it sure as hell sounded to Bolin as if the place needed a personal visit from a fifth horseman. I'll be seeing you around, Colonel. Powers couldn't remember the last time he'd felt the first shred of fear. He found he was actually shaking, but somehow willed away the trembling. There was something in the guy's icy voice, something in the way Belasco had just blindsided him out of nowhere. Powers sensed he was alone. Slowly, hesitating before he lowered his arms, he turned. Belasco was gone, vanished like some ghost in the night. Whoever the hell he was, he was good, and Powers had reformed his opinion about the man. The distant wail of the first siren snapped the colonel back to the present. He snatched up the mini Uzi and beat a fast exit out of the alley. The way Velasco had issued his last statement left Powers believing the man was bailing from his watchdog duty over SCTU, going elsewhere to do whatever. But what? Leave him twisting in the wind? Make him sweat and worry when and where he'd show up next? No matter, the guy had just blown his one and only chance to take down the hunter. Next time he even so much as glimpsed Velasco, Powers vowed to shoot the man on the spot. Texas. Cody Caldwell was having serious doubts about the future. As he listened to McClintock briefing the 30-plus members of God's Crusaders in the conference room, Caldwell had to wonder how he had sunk to this point. Once he'd been an FBI agent, supervisor of the Organized Crime Task Force in New York, now he was on the brink of aiding and abetting international terrorists who would massacre countless citizens in cities across the U.S. He felt as if he was on another planet, listening to McClintock's angry us-and-them rhetoric. How had it all come this far, gotten so crazy? Sure, the money was nothing shy of fantastic. Another eighty grand had been dumped into his offshore account in the Caymans yesterday, putting him well into six figures since Grevy had talked him into joining up a little over a year ago. And when the Holocaust was finally underway, another hefty cash sum was promised to each man. But he'd been a lawman, damn it. He used to value bravery, integrity, honor. In the beginning of his career, he'd seen himself as something of a crusader against the shadowy monsters of organized crime out there in the streets, reeling in mob turncoats for the witness protection program, chalking up a few major busts along the way, doing something to be proud of, making a difference. But like a lot of lawmen, he let his personal life go down the tubes. An endless war raged between himself and two ex-wives who never understood the job, much less a man's need to be somebody important. He soothed his inner turmoil first with booze, then later on with coke and crack. Naturally, the end wasn't long in coming. Some bastard he'd always believed was his buddy clued in his superiors that he was snorting and tippling on the job. So the door on his FBI career had slammed shut in his face, but another door had opened wide, revealing the abyss where he now stood on the edge, staring at a new monster. But he'd been stone-cold sober, not even a cup of coffee or a cigarette for the better part of nine months. Now that the fog had cleared, he looked at the world and himself in a different light. He was no longer blaming everyone and everything for his own personal failures and screw-ups. The way he'd lived was wrong, plain and simple. And what he was mixed up in now was beyond wrong. Hell, as far as he was concerned, it was downright treasonous. He watched McClintock standing tall and sure behind the podium, addressing his legions in the straight back metal chairs, all of them armed with the computer printouts of their marching orders. This is it, gentlemen. This is what we signed on for. Speak for yourself, Caldwell thought, wishing to God he could just run out of that room, but knew that was impossible, unless, of course, he was willing to take a bullet in the back. Once you've boarded your assigned jets, you are to read, memorize, then burn the orders on your printouts. We all understand what is about to happen. A lot of people will die within the next two days. Just make sure it's them and not us. Now, for some of you, a little voice in your heads may be whispering that we're traitors. No, gentlemen. We're the ones who have been dumped on, abandoned. Just look at your lives. Disgrace, lost jobs, divorces, broken families, your women sleeping with other men, taking what little money you may have left. You came here, most of you, with no money, no hope, and no futures. If it makes you feel any better, just look around at what this country has become, and don't look back when it's finished. We are already, gentlemen, living in a society that is on the verge of anarchy and self-annihilation. 
Even the powers that be know this. Why do you think so many politicians hunger for nothing more than re-election? It's simple. They want to fatten their own bank accounts, grab up what they can while they can. Our government has turned corrupt, pandering to the whim, to the unwashed, and the immoral who make up the majority of so-called American citizens. I know. I was a former Secret Service agent. I have no qualms about the mission we are undertaking. By helping enemies of the United States, we're sending a wake-up call to the high and mighty. Who knows? Martial law imposed on the masses might just be a good thing. When the firestorm is over, the real America will rise like a phoenix from the ashes. Of course, when this is done, and I've already informed a number of you, we're all on our own. Bail the country. Live out your lives. Watch it all unravel from a safe distance and smile. And tell whoever is near you, I told you so. It wasn't the most rousing call to arms he'd ever heard, but he saw the hypnotic effect it had on a few of the others, guys on the edges of their seats, heads bobbing in tune to McClintock's spiel, eyes lit up with a strange fire to get out there and kick ass. But there was a note of rage and desperation Caldwell had yet to see in McClintock's eyes. The man was telling all of them to do what they were told, then jump ship because it was going to sink anyway. What did McClintock know that he didn't, Caldwell wondered, and why was half the force remaining behind? He didn't like it, was already envisioning a knife in his back once he headed out. Any questions? Caldwell watched as McClintock held eye contact with him for a moment. He wondered if the man read the doubt and fear churning in his gut. Forget McClintock. Caldwell had to find a way to save his own bacon. When McClintock looked away, Caldwell made his decision. He still had a couple of friends in the Justice Department, guys who had helped him clean up his act a while back, even though they didn't have a clue what he was set to get involved in. Dismissed. Caldwell stood, linked up with the four members of his team. The first chance he got, he would put in a call to the Justice Department. He figured he owed it to himself as much as he owed it to the innocent lives poised to get slaughtered in the coming jihad. The Gulfstream C-20 had long since topped out at its maximum ceiling of 46,000 feet above the Mediterranean Sea. In less than one hour, according to Boland's calculations, they would touch down at the joint U.S.-Israeli military base on the Sinai. There, Boland would deliver the final briefing for his black suit team. Following that, they would board a C-130 Hercules, rumble off for Sudan, escorted by eight F-15Es in the event the Sudanese military scrambled some MiGs in search of a dogfight with U.S. fighter pilots they were sure to lose. The force behind the terrorist attacks in the U.S., Boland knew after receiving the latest intel from Stony Man Farm, was alive and seething in the People's Palace of Sudan, Aman Nafud. The executioner and company were going headhunting. Sudan wasn't exactly a sovereign, democratic country, smiled on by the rest of the free world. The Khartoum government was universally condemned by the UN, Red Cross, World Health Organization, and World Bank for blatantly committing mass genocide by starving their own countrymen. Every law enforcement and intelligence agency in the West knew that the military regime in Sudan was creating a breeding ground for international terrorists. However the action unfolded in Sudan, Boland had given the order that Aman Nafud was to be taken alive and hauled back to the States. The soldier poured a cup of coffee. The cabin windows were closed, blocking out the blazing sunlight beyond the sleek military jet cruising along at top speed. Boland had wrapped up a long initial briefing for the team 30 minutes ago. He now found a few of the commandos attempting to catch a quick combat nap. Others reviewed intel jackets, complete with farm photos and background on the key players and a full detailed layout of the compound, down to Lieutenant General Yousef Saeed's crocodile pit. According to farm intelligence, Saeed was little more than a mass murderer of black rebels in the South, armed or otherwise. Saeed's record was rife with accounts of mass torture on women and children and the burning of entire villages, leaving the displaced masses terrified and starving as they fled for the borders of neighboring Ethiopia or Kenya and Bowen suspected Saeed's crocodiles served as more than just some bizarre entertainment for visiting VIPs. Before heading out from the farm, armed with updated intel and sat imagery of the palace, the soldier had increased the number of commandos to nine. He wanted three teams going in, with himself the lone man out, advancing from the east. 
They would halo to the compound, guided in by their GPS modules, allowing them to land at their respective points of attack within six feet. According to the farm, they would go in facing at least forty or more armed Sudanese soldiers, throw in a smattering of officers and their cronies from Khartoum, so-called businessmen, and the soldier expected to find quite the contingent of players when they hit the ground. The intel from Langley, which Brognola had received from his own sources within the company, warned of innocence held against their will at the palace. Women. Apparently the ranking Sudanese officers at the palace, not satisfied with mere genocide, were involved in slavery and kidnapping for profit. Females ranging in age from 15 to 30 were being abducted from various countries in Europe and as far away as the Philippines. This assertion came straight from a reliable CIA contract agent working deep cover in Khartoum. The soldier intended to give the women a choice when the time came, fly on from Sudan and the Herc, or stay behind in whatever they left standing of the palace. Already Barbara Price was working her usual logistical magic, inserting a team of CIA agents on the Sinai compound, ready to help see the women back home to their respective countries. The main event, though, was still hours away. Boland decided a call back to Brognola was in order. As he headed aft for his cubicle where the Satlink was housed, his thoughts wandered back to what he'd witnessed in Roxbury. It galled a part of Boland to know he'd let Powers walk after his slaughter jaunt, but the soldier never second-guessed himself, and he was banking that his sudden departure from SCTU's doorstep would have the rats scurrying to step up their agenda. Sure, it would have been easy to have eighty-sixth Powers in that alley, and walked on feeling that justice had been done, but that would have left Grievy still at large, and, unless he missed his guess, the FBI, SAC, and the Delta Colonel were in league with an unknown jihadist. These were hunches, but the soldier had learned to rely on instinct, to know when to fold his hand at a critical juncture, or simply blaze ahead. When Sudan was wrapped up, the soldier was going back for the Colonel's head, by then, he hoped Powers or Grevy had chomped at the bit enough to make some glaring error in judgment, such as betraying whomever it was they fronted for. The soldier took a seat in his cubicle, slipped on the radio headset, adjusted the throat mic, working up the sat link until he raised the big fed. Anything new, Hal? I was just thinking about you, Striker. It seems we've caught a wave. First, Brognola stated the farm was still trying to crack the code on the disk he'd seized from Boston. They were hard at it, but vowed they were on the way to figuring out what was on the file. The farm had also done its homework on Leland property. The owner was Mike Leland, formerly of the FBI's Organized Crime Task Force in New York, retired two years ago. Leland had a sterling record as a Fed, on paper running a moving company with warehouse office complexes in Atlanta, Oklahoma City, and Richmond. Allegedly, Brognola said, the man snapped up the properties using an inheritance from his late father, who was some sort of real estate magnate on the East Coast. The Boston property where Bolin had found terrorists had ostensibly been sold back to the city. But the farm discovered that Leland had suddenly taken legal action to freeze the property one week ago, claiming that the city had reneged on its contract and still owed him money. Leland also owned small private airports in the three cities, plus one more airfield some hundred miles southeast of El Paso in the rugged scrub wilderness of Brewster County. The man had six Learjets, three twin-engine planes, and two executive choppers at his disposal. That must have been some inheritance. Yeah, well, I don't care if his old man was Howard Hughes. The numbers don't jibe on his end. If I wanted to, I could nail the guy now, since Aaron tracked two of Mr. Leland's accounts to a dummy offshore company in the Caymans. White-collar crime, Hal. Even if convicted, he'd put 18 holes a day for three years and he'd surf and turf for dinner every night. Yeah, probably. Still, he's connected to something. Just what, we don't know yet. Let's tie some of this together. Item. Leland worked out of the same office as Grevy. I made a call up there and found out the two were frickin' frack, best buddies, on and off the job. Item. Leland began his coast-to-coast -coast moving company about a year ago. Same thing with his airfields. The man owns a home outside Atlanta, but he keeps a sprawling ranch-style compound near the Texas-Mexican border that is apparently rented out to one Buck McClintock, formerly of the Secret Service. I had to get that from the FBI office in El Paso. So I contacted the sheriff down there. 
I got a definite feeling I was being stonewalled when I asked him about the land. The FBI did some low-profile snooping in a town near the compound in question, and they told me a rather strange little story about this place. Seems they've had an eye on this compound for about six months. They suspect it's something more than just a bunch of good old boys, or in this case, former lawmen, running around playing weekend warrior. Nothing they can pin down. They just think it's weird to see a bunch of ex-feds and cops shooting up the hills down there. Finally, you've got Greavy and Powers, and after my conversation with the man, it turns out it was Greavy who recommended the Delta Force involvement in SETU and convinced the President personally to bring Powers on board. You saw the Colonel's vision of urban renewal firsthand. We're getting closer, Al. But we don't have concrete proof of any involvement between terrorists and Greavy and Powers. They're dirty. I'm sure they are. These bastards sacrificed their own men, probably to show their jihad paymaster they were straight shooters. Problem is, SCTU took down three more terrorists last night while Powers was out shooting up Roxbury. The whole thing was staged. The nail special agent Belasco, whom Greavy and Powers thought had smelled them out for the traitors they are. I passed on your uh, words of praise to Commander Jeffries, by the way. If your angle works, we might just get lucky and flush all the rats out of the dark. Question is, where do we go from here? We're looking at a conspiracy, Hal. This trucking company has three different warehouses in three separate cities, situated in a near triangle. Plus trucks big enough to transport weapons or 55-gallon drums of nuclear waste. Or entire platoons of fanatics. They could be assembled at these three Leland properties, then flown to different targeted cities, or rolled down the interstate in semis. Can you get a few teams of your own people to stake out all Leland properties? And have someone keep an eye on SCTU's finest while you're at it? Until you return from Sudan? Right. I want to lock and load as soon as I'm airborne for the States. Powers and Greavy are going down. It'll be a definite plus if you bring the food back here in one piece as a guest to the U.S. penal system. That's his call. All I want to do is shut down the monster on this side of the ocean. Time to reload. Mac Bolin is continued on the next CD. Graphic audio is the best entertainment on the road, but it's so popular, it's always sold out. We get a lot of emails and calls like that. Maybe you too sometimes can't find the graphic audio you want at a truck stop or store. Or maybe you missed the title. Well, don't worry. Every graphic audio ever released is waiting for you at our website. That's right, we have any title you want, and you don't have to drive around to find it. Just call 1-800-670-5220 or visit our website at www.cuttingaudio.com. You can also use the enhanced CD included in this graphic audio title to take you directly to the huge, exciting world of high-impact graphic audio. Once again, call 1-800-670-5220 or visit us at www.cuttingaudio.com. Due to intense violence and sexual situations, graphic audio is rated for mature audiences. Graphic Audio, a movie in your ears. McClintock was copying the disc in the computer room when the call came through on the secured line. He listened as Grevy told him to fly out a jet for Mr. L's Atlanta facility right away. Then he ordered McClintock to send along four of his best guns to beef up his own security detail. Something was wrong on the FBI man's end, but before McClintock could pose a few choice questions, Greavy hung up. McClintock relayed the order to Monroe, but Jansen, the worrywart, put in his usual two cents worth. They're ready for it to go to hell. You know that, don't you, Buck? I only know we're getting paid to take orders and not ask questions. I only know we're waiting two more days tops for the final payment. Then we're gone, gentlemen. McClintock took the discs, slipped them inside a pouch of his briefcase, then paused so long that Monroe felt compelled to break the silence. What? I'm not sure. Who's Caldwell riding up front with? John Peterson. Why? I don't know. It's just a feeling I can't shake. Raise Peterson after they land in OKC. Tell him to keep an eye on Caldwell. If Peterson smells a problem, he's to use his own judgment handling the matter. 
If somebody decides to start singing, Buck, this whole place will be swarmed over. Shit, it'll make Waco and Ruby Ridge look I like I know a that, damn it. I want every man here armed with fully automatic weapons. I want four men patrolling the perimeter at all times. I noticed you didn't delete the file like our Arab friend wanted. It's called an ace in the hole. Life in the witness protection program is better than a lifetime at Leavenworth. Before you get your drawers in an uproar, I'm going to make sure that doesn't happen. You mean if we're hit? If the ship sinks, I intend to go down with it. Any man not game for that kind of action can walk now. Squaring their shoulders, Monroe and Jansen held their ground and their leader's fanatic look. Boston. Powers let Greavy walk into the basement elevator first. When the colonel was inside, Greavy threw his hand out, holding the door back. I'm telling you, Colonel, if Luther's going to sink you because Belasco saw you in action, you sink alone. What could he say to that, Powers thought? If he was about to find himself arrested, well, the Beretta was coming out, and he'd blast his way out of the building, even if it meant suicide by cop. Well, if that's the case, let's not keep Luther waiting. Greavy released the door and hit the button for the top floor. Jeffries had ordered the two of them to remain on site with the local cops after the three terrorists had been terminated. The entire night had passed before he ordered them back. Weird. The elevator finally reached its destination. As the doors opened, Powers looked at Creevy. Good to know I've got a real stand-up partner covering my back. Piss off, Colonel. I practically begged you not to do what you did. What can I say? Shit happens. Yeah, will you excuse me if I step away from you when that shit hits the fan? Not a problem. You just gonna deny everything? We'll see. They headed down the short, narrow hall for the double doors with the plaque reading Commander Luther Jeffries. When they were summoned here, they never bothered to knock. Powers felt his heart racing as he grabbed the knob, twisted it, and led the way into the spacious office. For a moment, Powers felt relief. No Belasco in sight. No squad of cops with cuffs ready. Jeffries, he saw, was hunched over some file on his desk. When Powers and Greavy stopped in front of the desk, Jeffries looked up, and the colonel found himself pinned by a menacing look in the man's eyes. Powers was lifting his hand, a twitch in his fingers, when he heard something about Belasco calling. Seemed Belasco had seen enough, Jeffries said. Seemed Greavy and Powers appeared to have everything under control. They didn't need the Justice Department breathing down right, their necks. Up. Powers was waiting the for the punchline. It never came. Seems he's he wasn't sure he heard Jeffries right. The Sounds ringing like in his ears, job, the pounding of his heart obscuring the man's words. Sir? Clean the shit out of your ears, Colonel. Belasco said job well done. Man said keep up the good work. Man said I couldn't have two better men working under me. That the SCTU program looks solid. Man said to pass on his regards, Colonel. Said he hoped to see you someday soon. That's it? What the fuck else would there be? Greavy looked as puzzled as Powers felt. No, studying the FBI man's face another second, and Powers spotted the fear behind the mask. Now, I've read your report from intelligence, gentlemen. You state there's a clear and present danger down in Atlanta. I suggest you pack up and get to Logan ASAP. Your work's far from finished. Dismissed. Somehow, Powers moved his feet, following Greavy to the door. He couldn't believe it. Wondered what the hell kind of game Belasco was playing. Whatever it was, he knew he'd see the bastard again. In fact, he was counting on it. Powers was saving a special hollow-point bullet for that guy's brain. Sudan. The executioner was the last one to parachute off the Herc's ramp. Touching down approximately a dozen yards inside the east wall, Bolin had the chute pack off and HK-33 in hand, locked and loaded in a few quick moves. Combat harness snug in place, webbing hung with a mixed bag of grenades, features obscured by black cosmetics. The soldier padded into a tangled nest of tropical vegetation, hugging the razor-topped wall. Hitting the vibrating button on his comm link from the cover of darkness, the soldier got his bearings, waiting as three silent signals shimmied against the side of his head. The black suits were hunkered down on the far west edge of the compound. Showtime. Up close, the People's Palace looked immense, 
The building was two stories tall and ran the length of over a football field on just his side alone. Boland surveyed the lit-up white granite structure to penetrate and clear the place of enemy guns, secure his hostage, and march the women to safety was going to be quite the task. He wasn't even going to bother counting all the windows, most of which were curtained, or worried about how many rooms held what sort of occupants with how many guns. The word from Brognola's CIA mouthpiece was that the soldiers here pulled double duty as waitstaff. That helped his plans some. Few non-combatants to contend with or keep out of harm's way. Almost everybody was fair game. No guards were visible in his vicinity. Someone was having an evening swim. A slope, pocked with scrub, led to the wall. The soldier would stick to the game plan, go over that wall, and advance through the back door when the fireworks erupted. Once the shooting started, the women could pose a problem, perhaps scurrying all around, terrified and in danger of getting caught in the crossfire, perhaps even used as human shields by the Sudanese soldiers. Bolin would deal with situations and individuals as they came his way. On the surface, the plan was simple and straightforward enough. Bulldoze inside the palace, mow down the enemy, round up Nafud and the women. Team 3 would penetrate from the south side, while number one manned the front and two secured a fire point from the west. If the officers and their corrupt lackeys chose to run outside to bolt for safety while Boland brought the roof down, they would be greeted by a hail of lead. Whether they toted a weapon or financed terrorism from behind the safety of some desk in a bank, they were all guilty. Once the Omani and the palace's sex slaves were in tow, Bolin and the black suits would make their way on foot to a nearby airfield. En route, the soldier would raise the C-130. After the F-15E escort neutralized the main control tower and eliminated anything that might take to the skies after them, the C-130 would land for Bolin and company's extraction. Or so went the soldier's battle scheme. The executioner searched the black waters inside the fenced-in pit. He spotted the scaly torpedo bodies slicing across the surface, dark, bulky shapes sliding around in the dim light from the nearby swimming pool. Some structure, perhaps a guardhouse, was near the wall ahead and beyond his cover. Bolin didn't make out any Sudanese soldiers on patrol near the crock pen. Further on, the soldier saw the motor pool spread out in front of the massive colonnaded entrance to the palace. The fleet consisted of twelve luxury vehicles and three APCs with tripod-mounted machine guns. It was Black Suit Team 1's job to fix C-4 to every vehicle. Sat Recon had shown two choppers grounded on the roof. If they flew, Bolin had given the order to blast them out of the sky. There was no sign of armed guards out front. Another tap of the vibrating signal let Team 1 know he was clear of human traffic. Bolin checked his chronometer. Striker to 1-1. One, one. Move out. Two minutes and counting to lay the gifts under the tree and fall back into position. Roger, Striker. Two minutes and counting. The executioner held his ground, cradling the assault rifle. In the distance he made out the three shadows breaching the front grounds. Swiftly, their rear covered by teams two and three, they began sticking blocks of plastic explosive under the chassis of each vehicle, all hell packs wired into one radio frequency, these soldiers, like all hands who came to Stony Man Farm, were hand-picked from the U.S. military elite by Brognola, Price, or Buck Green. To a man, they had been sworn to an oath of secrecy about the farm's existence and its covert operations. Army Special Forces or Rangers, Delta or SEALs, they were the best at what they did, which was make war. One last look at the enormous running facade of the palace, and Bolin took in the giant saucer jutting over the edge of the roof. The enemy's link to the airfield and any help beyond would have to go first. The warrior fed the breech of the M203 attached to his assault rifle, a 40mm HE round. Bolin held back for another minute. Then he started for open ground, preparing to haul himself up the side of the crock pen. Bolin froze. The matting of ferns and vines obscured his vision. A full two seconds later, he saw two shadows standing in the sheen of light spilling through the doorway of the guardhouse. They were looking toward the crock pen, seemingly glued in place. The beasts were suddenly agitated by the presence of humans, and Bolin was aware of a distinct coppery taint of blood in the warm air, mixed with an odor of meat. Bolin wondered how much human flesh was part of the crock's diet. 
Bolin slipped the HK-33 around his shoulder and drew the Beretta 93R, the muzzle already threaded with the sound suppressor. There was a chance that once he dropped them with a headshot and the blood started running down the muddy grade leading to the pen, the crocodiles would start thrashing and growling loud enough to alert any more soldiers who might be standing guard inside the wall of the pool. No choice but to risk a little reptile fury. Bolin sighted down the Beretta, gauging the roughly thirty-foot distance to the closest guard who was lighting a cigarette when the executioner caressed the trigger. The first guard dropped like a pole-axed steer. Two down. But were there any other soldiers in or near the guardhouse? Bolin broke cover, his grim focus alternating between the wall and the palace proper to the guardhouse. Sure enough, the crocs had caught the scent of blood. Not good. It turned worse for the soldier in the next heartbeat. Hitting the front of the guardhouse, Beretta tracking the doorway, Bolin was about to burst inside when a shadow whipped around the corner less than two feet ahead. The warrior was bringing the Beretta to bear, but the AK-74 was already whipping around like a club in the shadow's fists. Before Bolin could fire off a fatal shot, the AK-74's muzzle swept across his gun hand. Ah! The executioner was right on top of the guard, knew then he'd missed the guy from his point of concealment, the Sudanese soldier more than likely having gone beside the structure to relieve himself. The AK-74's muzzle came flying back for Bolin's face, and the warrior ducked. Nafu didn't even want to think about the tens of millions he'd burned up over the course of the past year to see his dream of jihad come true. It was gone, and the remaining money, even though he figured he still had forty or so million at his disposal, was now beginning to worry him. Cut off from Oman and his father's endless supply of petrodollars, he needed to find out exactly how much was left in the one remaining Swiss account. At his age, he still had fifty, sixty years or more to live, and he would need all the money he had left to assure him of a life of pleasure and, of course, safety. Unfortunately, his own expenses and the payoffs to every bastard who came crawling out of the brush were adding up at an astonishing rate. The CIA war dogs and Saeed were growing impatient for more money, and he'd stalled them all day, claiming a stomach virus, insisting that he needed rest if he was going to haggle with his men in Switzerland. He had promised them he'd make the call the next day, and wire some more funds to the bank of Khartoum. The fact was, he wasn't feeling good. Was he coming down with some virus? Perhaps it was just his nerves, all this talk from Cragen about trouble on the way. Perhaps it was being cooped up in the palace for a year. Could it be contaminated drinking water? How much would it cost him if he had to pay for medicine or a vaccine? A sudden burning flared up, right behind his eyes. He touched his face, and the skin felt hot and clammy to his touch. He was feverish. Just his luck, coming down with dysentery, malaria, or worse, at his hour of triumph. Maybe Sudan was a big fat mistake, he thought. If his recruiter could have so easily created forged documents for the holy warriors who had infiltrated America, why not him? No, his face was too well known. He was a sheikh, worth around two hundred million dollars. He'd be worth ten times that much had he not slain his brother and left Oman. Now food let his gaze wander around his suite. The two Swiss women were asleep beneath the black silk sheets in the massive sunken bed. He smiled, recalling how he'd spent the afternoon wearing them out, and went to the bar for a glass of red wine. He decided some fresh air might help, and moved onto the balcony, where he sipped his drink and hoped it would calm the queasiness in his belly, gazing at the scrubland of the plain to the west. When, what was that? It was a darting shadow. Maybe two, somewhere in the dense vegetation near the wall. Silently, he cursed the lack of lighting on that side of the palace. He peered into the vegetation, searching for movement, but found only total blackness. And where the hell were all the guards? Of course, it was that time of the evening. The guards were serving the drinks and appetizers for another Yusef Said production. Fools, barbarians. Nafud lifted the glass to his lips, still searching the darkness below. The wine glass slipped from his fingers. He turned toward the point out front where all the vehicles were parked and saw night turn into day as the crunching din of explosions continued. Nearly collapsing from terror, it was all Nafud could do to keep from throwing up. The headbutt might have knocked out Bolin if he hadn't felt the man recoil at the last possible instant. As soon as the bullets had torn past his scalp, the executioner charged forward, 
wrapped his fists around the AK-74. The dark face on the other side of the assault rifle was growling, rearing back. The warrior twisted his head, took the blow off the side of his cheek to a blast of stars in his eyes and a hollow thud in his ears. Bolin held on to the weapon, nothing but iron will keeping him on his feet. The Sudanese soldier was good, lightning quick and pumped on adrenaline, aware he was locked into a fight to the death. He'd taken Bolin by near fatal surprise, and now the guy sounded the alarm again. Bolin and his adversary danced, grunted, strained to wrench the rifle free. The executioner was spinning the soldier, looking to hurl him toward the fence when his adversary lashed out with a leg whip. Bolin took the boot to the shin, white hot pain shooting through every nerve ending. He felt himself falling, but somehow held on to the AK-74, taking the soldier down to the sludge. With the Sudanese hammering on top of him, Bolin felt himself skidding down the slope on his back and slamming into the fence. Bolin wrestled the soldier off to the side and was yanking the guy to his feet when he slipped in the mud and his opponent seized an advantage. The Sudanese soldier hurled his weight into Bolin, pinning him against the fence, driving the AK-74 across his throat, wedging him there, straining to force the big American up and over the fence. The ominous roaring sounded nearly on top of Bolin, so close he could smell the stench of digested food like some noxious cloud washing over his face. Feeling as if his spine were a mere heartbeat from snapping in two, Bolin speared his knee into his enemy's crotch. It was all the edge the executioner needed. Bolin felt the soldier's grip loosen on the AK-74, the guy going slack long enough for the warrior to twist, shift his weight, and sling his enemy over the fence. As the Sudanese soldier was going over the edge, a hand shot out and clamped onto Bolin's webbing. Bolin couldn't be sure, but glancing down, he thought he saw the soldier's finger curl through the pin of a frag grenade. The executioner unleathered the 44 Magnum Desert Eagle and put the muzzle square between the Sudanese's eyes. The frag grenade went with the body, only it plopped in the thick soup resting against the base of the fence. The crocodiles came roaring up the bank, gaping jaws clamping over legs and arms, Bolin catching a glimpse of the raging reptiles ripping the body apart before he started scrambling away from the fence. He made it all of 20 feet, barely clearing ground zero, when he nosedived and covered his head. In that one moment, as the fireball sent shredded chunks of the fence flying over Bolin's head, he knew the whole program was about to change, and for the worse. Max Cragen could appreciate greed. Money made his world go round, always had. It didn't matter if he dealt in gold, diamonds, teak, or female skin, as long as it yielded a fistful of cash so he could go his merry, marauding way in search of his next pot of riches. During his five-year stint in Sudan, he'd sold everything from drugs to diamonds to slaves, and right under the very noses of upper echelon CIA operatives, Naturally, he'd greased a few palms along the way. A few of the wiser spooks were willing to look in the other direction as long as they got their cut. As it stood, he already had enough money squirreled away in numbered accounts in the Far East to allow him to vanish, create a new identity, and start over, living out his days swimming in booze and sex. Taking Nafud's blood money was simply an honor he figured he owed himself. Greed was good. Cowardice wasn't which was why he'd just as soon pump a bullet through Saeed's face as look at him. The man was an obscene joke, Cragen thought, standing up there, hurling bald-faced lies about how he personally led kill hunts into the bush, and the circle jerk of suits and uniforms looked as if they were buying it. As soon as the lights dimmed and the giant screen TV flared up yet again, Cragen had eased up to the bar to stand beside Manson, his fellow Merc. Cragen was working on bourbon number three, attempting to consume enough alcohol to drown out the chortling voice of the fat baboon Saeed. Cragen lit a cigar and drew deep on the smoke, hoping to calm a sudden murderous impulse. The CIA mercenary knew the truth about Saeed's exploits in the killing fields of the Black South. There was a floating rumor that Saeed had wet his pants the first, and apparently the last time he'd heard a shot fired in anger. The reason for the ruling military junta's barbarity toward the southern blacks went deeper than just ethnic or religious differences. All Cragen had to do was take one look at the arid wasteland beyond the palace walls and compare it with the fertile paradise of the south. There was tobacco, 
hardwood, cotton, gold, not to mention vast crops of corn and rice, herds of goats and cattle. Sudan should be one of the richest countries in all of Africa, instead of its citizens barely surviving on 330 US dollars per capita per year. Who cared? He decided it was time to leave. After five years of the devil's butthole, he'd concluded there was little he could do except take the money and run. And by the next day, if he had to, he'd call in his troops from the airfield and take the palace by storm. Shouldn't be much trouble. He'd seen Sudan's finest in action down south, and if they were outnumbered and outgunned, they had a tendency to turn tail and run. He'd heard the rumors of all the gold and diamonds and cash stashed away in vaults in the palace, and yet the sheikh had gotten snippy earlier when he inquired about the rest of his money. Hell, Saeed even insisted he move his jet to his own airfield where his soldiers could keep an eye on it. Sudan sucked. Manson ran a nervous tongue over his black mustache. The longer we stay here, the greater the risk we may never leave Sudan in one piece. I say they settle up within 24 hours, or we give them a taste of what they're only dreaming about doing to U.S. citizens. Cragen was about to agree with that, a mouthful of bourbon poised to go down his throat. He knew that sound for what it was, and nearly choked on the acid liquid in his throat. He was looking toward the foyer, felt the freeze of pure terror all around, when the bank of mahogany doors was blown off its hinges. Something resembling a sheet of metal came winging down the foyer, scything through a couple of palm trees, bowling down a trio of figures in brown uniforms, smashing them like lifeless toys. A harder look, and he saw it was the hood of a Rolls Royce, smoking and warped to hell from whatever launched it through the doors. Holy shit! Cragen instinctively reached for his holstered 45 Colt. The trouble he had feared the past two days had finally arrived. The executioner scrambled to his feet, senses choked by cordite and the stink of blood. His bell rung to an agonizing chime by the concussive force of the grenade blast. Searching the ground beside him, he found his Beretta, retrieved and holstered it, then adjusted the comm link in place over his ears and throat. To hear his own voice, he'd have to shout and tell them to bellow back when they copied. He was about to race Team 1, sound the order to blow the motor pool, when the black suit with the hell box took the initiative, obviously figuring out something had gone terribly wrong on his end, and lit up the night. Waves of fiery debris were slammed off the palace facing, scarring the granite facade, blowing in windows, cleaving off whole hunks from the roof's edge. For a dangerous moment, Bolin was outlined in the dazzling firelight, instantly making the soldier the potential target of two types of predators. First, he saw the black waters ripple and heave with the surging mass of reptiles. The number of crocs hadn't been figured in during the formulation of his battle strategy. But a sweeping look of the countless reptile torpedoes slicing over the water's surface, glowing beneath the halo of firelight, and the executioner guessed a ballpark figure of 80, maybe a 100, judging from the size of the pen and the roaring chorus flaying his ears. Time to go. Steel-jacketed bullets stammered out of AK-74s. Bolin began a serious run for the hillside, beelining from the divots slapped up in his wake by tracking lead. Out of the corner of his eye, he caught the first of ten or so monsters shooting through the gap in the fence, noses, no doubt, filled with the scent of blood, their pea-sized primal brains charged up and consumed with one purpose only, to devour. HK-33 filling his hands, the shouting voices breaking through the ringing in his ears, the warrior set his sights on three armed soldiers on the wall, then found himself smack in the middle of a white light beamed his way. Angling out from the light, Bolin held back the HK-33's trigger. Bolin hit the button to his comm link that tied him to one frequency for all three teams. Striker here. Number three, go in, take up position at the end of the hallway nearest you. I'll let you know before I drop a flashbang in that living room. I'm moving in now for the pool. Your orders stand. If it runs your way, drop it, unless it's one of the women. The rest of the team acknowledged the transmission. We've got a problem on this end, gentlemen. Keep your eyes peeled for hungry crocs on the loose. The black suits copy. Didn't bother asking a slew of unnecessary questions. Seasoned pros, they knew a soldier more often than not had to improvise on the spot. A look over his shoulder as he hit the bottom of the incline, and Bolin found three of the larger beasts had won the foot race to his first two victims. It was a fearsome sight that not even a battle-hardened soldier such as Bolin could stomach. Within a few eye blades, massive jaws had shredded the two bodies into small red chunks. 
enormous heads snapping around, swallowing other grisly slabs of human flesh whole in one gulp. Feeding time, the soldier suspected, had only just begun. He wasn't any nature buff who claimed to know what might turn a crocodile into a man-eater, but he was bearing witness to bloodthirsty machines that had, thanks largely to Saeed and his soldiers, no doubt, developed an insatiable hunger for human flesh. The soldier heard the loud voices before they materialized into AK-74 wielding figures on the wall. Tapping the trigger on his M203, Bolin blew them off the top with an HE round that punched a hole large enough in the wall to get him through the poolside. He made out the terrified cries of female voices beyond the boiling smoke, men barking orders, climbing higher, scanning the wall, then the gap ahead. The executioner filled the M203 with another 40 millimeter HE round, just as he saw three or four muzzles jutting on either side of the gaping hole. Forging into the swirling cloud, the soldier crouched beside the jagged teeth, peering beyond, taking in the chaos as bikini-clad women stampeded the rows of French double doors at the other end. The soldier looked up, loading another HE round into the M203. The satellite dish was lost inside a saffron fireball, shredded debris streaking back over the roof. No calls for reinforcements would be made this night. Poland hosed down a group, charging past the cabana midway down the pool. As bodies sailed and splashed into the water, the executioner decided to up the ante. Slipping an anti-personnel round into the M203, Bolin wheeled around the corner and cut the bomb loose. The executioner stepped through the hole, cracking home a fresh clip into his assault rifle. Bolin drilled the screamers with a quick burst. Bolin marched on. He could see more soldiers just beyond the fluttering drapery, hands flapping, uniforms bouncing around as they tried to get it together. The executioner filled the M203 with a flashbang grenade. It was time to ratchet up the heat. This is your doing! Bullshit! Kragan didn't have time to dance around with Nafu, answer a bunch of accusations, simply because the Omani didn't have the stomach for the kind of action ripping apart the palace downstairs. With Manson behind him, Kragan topped the stairs. Down the hall, a few of the women were peering out the doors, clutching sheets to naked flesh, while a couple of Saeed's higher-ranking officers were fumbling into trousers, snapping on gun belts. Nafud was shaking a finger in Kragan's face as the CIA merc rolled up on him. We're bailing, Sheik. I'm not going anywhere with you. You have to take me. Ah! Kragan cracked a backhand over the Sheik's mouth, then reached out to wad up a handful of hair. He jammed the gun in Nafud's ear and locked an arm around his throat. Don't worry. This is where me and my buddy earn our keep. But you try and run, I'll shoot you in the back. You will pay for this! Wrong again. You're going to pay for this, as in a fat seven figures soon as I clear out. In cash. Kragan started hauling Nafud down the stairs. Even as his eyes were scalded, and it felt as if hot needles were piercing his eardrums, he knew some bastard had just dumped a flashbang into the living room. Despite the agony, Kragan realized that the situation down there had just turned into a turkey shoot for the unknown enemy. The executioner burned through one clip on his way through the smoking fangs of hanging door jams, raking long concentrated bursts over the large group reeling and hollering around the horseshoe couch. He chopped up white uniforms that soon turned scarlet and flopped to the marble floor. One tall figure, festooned in enough metals to anchor a small boat, was stitched up by Boland's 5.56mm barrage and performed a bizarre-looking tiptoe jig before he crashed through the screen of a giant television. Return fire was wild and way off the mark, since the Sudanese soldiers were blazing away blind and deaf. Even still, Boland dropped to cover at the edge of the bar. He slapped home a fresh clip, swung the HK-33 around the corner, and went back to work as a row of liquor bottles blew up and glass needles pinged off the bar top. With the intel photos of Nafud and Saeed mentally filed away, Bolin had already done a quick but hard scouring of faces in the crowd. The Omani wasn't a part of the panic herd in the living room, and the blubbery mass of Lieutenant General Saeed waving a pistol, was waddling his way to cover behind a massive pillar across the room. He made it before Bolin could drop him. Putting the man out of mind, the executioner let the HK-33 rip free. Tracking on, he mowed down a dozen or so blind men holding back on the triggers of AK-74s, kicking them into the walls or sending them flying into the jacuzzi. A few officers somehow gathered themselves, went into a drunken-looking march down some chamber that led to the southern courtyard, and blundered right into Black Suit Team 3. 
By now, the soldier found the women who'd raced in from the pool, bolting up the winding staircase, a few of them stumbling, crying out in terror from the other side of the living room. It was then he caught sight of Nafud and what looked like two Westerners. As Boland surveyed the carnage, he stepped out from cover. The trio melted into the pack of women, vanished somewhere down the hallway. Boland raised his commandos. Stryker here. I'm going after our pigeon. My guess is he's headed for the choppers on the roof. Team 3, penetrate and begin a room-to-room -room sweep. Round up the women. I want this wrapped up in 10 minutes. Team 3 copied. Then Boland saw the mass exodus going for the smoking hole at the end of the foyer. A moment later, he heard Team 1 greet them. Grimly aware of what he'd left behind, the soldier looked toward the pool. Beneath the still wavering band of firelight, he spotted the first monster sliding through the hole in the wall. Two more behemoths emerged, began helping their cousin out with quick savage chomps on the arms and legs of dead men. With any luck, the slaughter he was about to leave behind would keep them busy. If not, Boland shoved that particular mental image out of his mind. The executioner broke across the living room and hit the stairs running in pursuit of the quarry he'd crossed an ocean to bag. To Yusef Saeed, it sounded like a full battalion was out there, blasting away beyond the foyer. Considering the number of people he saw getting gunned down as soon as they hit the steps, some of the dead his bankers, frontmen, and weapons exporter cutouts for the CIA mercenaries, a hundred commandos, must be storming the People's Palace. A mere hundred men? No, too puny a number for sure, to wreak all this death and destruction in just a few furious minutes. It seemed more like a thousand commandos with guns, he thought, were circling the grounds, closing in and coming for his head. Yet as he looked over his shoulder and took in the strewed bodies and the smoking ruins of his prized giant TV, the screen still impaled with the body of one of his officers, he was certain that just one man had created the slaughter he was so desperately trying to run from. Visions of that tall, black-clad figure burned in his mind, urging him to get the hell outside and fast. Luckily, it sounded like the battle was now raging upstairs. Questions such as who these commandos were and where they had come from could wait until he was safely on his way back to Khartoum. At the moment, it was all Saeed could do to keep his sphincter under control. Images of himself years ago, that first and last time he'd ever ventured with a gun into the bush and come under rebel fire, threatened to leap to mind. This was no time, he told himself, to feel shame. He needed to save himself. But how? Wishing he could squeeze himself into the pillar and just disappear, he looked through the hole in the wall and saw that the entire motor pool had been obliterated. So much for riding out in one of his three Rolls Royces. And to try for the choppers on the roof was suicide. The kind of firepower that was bringing down the palace walls would most certainly be brought to bear on the helicopters. Then he'd be stranded up there, nowhere to run or hide. What to do? From his hiding place, he counted seven of his soldiers looking his way, their eyes full of fear, wanting to know what they should do next. Saeed knew there was only one plan that would get him out of the compound. The problem was getting his soldiers to offer themselves up as sacrificial lambs, human shields that would take the bullets for him once they bolted outside. Saeed spotted a discarded AK-74 near a fallen corpse. He reached out a trembling hand, clutching and hauling back the assault rifle. At least he could make it look good, act the hero, inspire them to unwittingly lay down their lives while he ran off in the opposite direction. He reasoned no army anywhere could ever survive unless its generals could live to plan and carry out the next battle. Why should he be expected to give up his life? Listen to me. On my count of three, we all go through the door at once. Shooting. Where does it sound like they're firing from, Sergeant Assam? The sound of their fire is coming from the west corner. You are positive? Yes, sir. Saeed nodded. One. They stood, bracing their weapons. Two. To a soldier, they drew a deep breath, stealing themselves. Three. Saeed hung back a full second, but knew he couldn't wait any longer as his soldiers made the charge. The only thing that got him running and risking death was the mere thought of the devil being anywhere close enough to reach out and touch him. <laughs> Pure terror and adrenaline fueled his bulk, propelling his legs as he started hacking and gagging when he bowled into the smoke. He thought he was going to vomit as, sure enough, the unknown enemy opened fire and started dropping his soldiers ahead, then beside him as he ran on. Blood hit him full in the face, his nose pinched with the acrid bite of burning fuel and bodily waste. 
He heard the cry deep in his throat, the world on fire around him as he commanded his legs to carry him at an angle away from his dying soldiers. They were screaming, but they were holding hard, their AK-74s flaming even as their twitching frames absorbed lead. When he found he wasn't falling for the ground, discovered he had somehow reached cover and safety behind the flaming shell of a Rolls Royce, he could see the finish line ahead. But now what? He only knew he needed to get as far in the opposite direction as possible from those hundred-plus gunmen at the west edge of the palace. He peered through the black smoke, his uniform drenched in sweat, his breath heaving in his ears. He looked east, focused on the thick vegetation along the wall. If he could make the east wall, somehow keep moving, stay hidden, he had the code to open the front gate. It would be a long hike to his airfield, but if he could get there, he could radio Khartoum, call in the reinforcements. First, he needed to get to that wall. Saeed heaved his bulk away from the burning hulks, scrunched himself low, hoped that if they spotted him they'd figure he was too small a target, or maybe not worth the trouble to go after. They were here, he had to believe, for the Omani Sheikh anyway, which meant they had to be American commandos. They could have the Sheikh, every man for himself. If the Americans had wanted Nafud so badly, he could have negotiated a reasonable sum with them to hand the Omani over. They didn't need to come here like this, wrecking his palace, killing his soldiers, upsetting his women. Maybe later, he decided, once he made Khartoum and the dust settled, and they had Nafud in custody, he could make the Americans see it was all some big mistake, that he didn't know anything about a jihad against U.S. citizens. Later... Saeed kept moving, glancing back, waiting for bullets to rip into him. They never came. Aside from the crackling sound of the burning cars, it was strangely quiet back there. He was about to look ahead when he thought he heard something. He tripped on something, his heart feeling like a frozen weight in his chest as his mind registered that noise for what it was. Looking back, he spotted the piece of fender that had sent him plunging. Saeed smelled the stink of blood and guts in his face. He was rolling over, wondering why he couldn't find his legs when he saw the dark mass boiling up in his direction. No! 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 The last thing Yusef Saeed saw before the blackness took him away was two more sets of jaws going for the legs. Some poor sap down below was in pure agony, terror, or both. It was a scream that would have chilled even Craig to the bone, but at the moment he had problems enough of his own. Between jacking the shake along and barking out the orders for the Sudanese pilots to get the choppers fired up, Craig was also forced to constantly check his six. One bastard in black was bringing down the palace. If he hadn't seen it with his own eyes, he would have laughed it off. One guy. Before hitting the roof, Craig had barely outrun that bastard's lead storm. The nameless commando had topped the stairs to the second floor landing and just started shooting, cutting down the officers and the gentlemen from Khartoum alike. The bastard wasn't there to take prisoners. That much was clear. Who the hell was that guy? Over the years, Kragen had heard unconfirmed rumors about a covert commando operation so secret even the Pentagon wasn't privy to it. Was he running from them? Kragen and Manson kept the pace up across the roof the way to the choppers lit by the climbing spirals of fire from the motor pool. He counted 12 officers who had survived the mayhem below and opted to fly on. Then he looked back and saw the bastard in black emerging from the granite housing of the stairwell leading to the roof. That assault rifle was swinging toward him, but it was the grenade launcher that made him dive for cover. Hit the deck! Kragen slung Nafu to the pebbled roof. Even as he nosedived, he glimpsed the missile streaking overhead before it pounded into the sleek executive chopper. The fireball pulverized there right out of there, a crooked finger of a rotor slashing into the cockpit of the other bird. Flaming fuel shot over the roof, setting four of the officers on fire. A few of the more brazen stood and began capping off rounds from semi-automatic pistols or AK-74s. Where the hell was Nafu? Kragen swung his 45 Colt around and discovered he wasn't a second too soon. Nafud had found a discarded AK-74. Kragen blasted Nafud in the gut. Even before the Omani folded, Kragen knew he had to get off that roof. The second chopper was obliterated inside another fireball. Whole chunks of the bird sheared away and sent sailing off into the night. Manson, let's go! If I remember right, there's some thick brush and trees off to the side. 
Looks like we jumped. Kragan dashed for the western edge and smiled as still more flaming shards hammered behind in their wake, interfering with the shooter's target acquisition. There was still some hope that he might live to spend his hard-earned loot. Holding his ground, Colin swept the HK-33 left to right. He eliminated the shooters first, then delivered the flaming screamers from their misery. The soldier was cracking home a fresh clip, ready to lock onto the white-haired runner and his buddy, when they vaulted themselves over the edge of the roof, Flying out for a free fall, arms windmilling before they were lost to sight. Team 3, give me a status report. We're clear, sir. In the process of rounding up the women. I thought you said you were clear, 3. Of humans, we are, sir. The crocodiles were going to present quite a problem. Bolin wondered how much ammo they'd have to burn up to clear the way through the man-eating beasts. 3, use whatever discarded assault rifles are available if you have to to take out some crocs. Save your bullets. We still have to take down the airfield. Roger, Striker. Team 2, blow me a hole in the south wall. We're coming out through the courtyard. Roger, copy that. Bolin had one confirm the sighting of the runners. Before the black suits could open fire, the two men were up and over the west wall. Moving along the edge of the roof, Bolin spotted two shadows racing across open ground, heading most likely for the Sudanese military airfield, just beyond a chain of low hills in the distance. Bolin ordered Team 1 to assist with the evacuation, then patched through to Eagle Leader, ordered the F-15E squadron to fly in and drop the hammer on the airfield. That copied with an ETA for the bombs to start dropping. Bolin patched through to the C-130 pilot and ordered him to tag along with the fighter escort. Three to strike up. Go ahead. We got a Sudanese general who claims to have intelligence on Saeed and Afud's terrorist operation. Says he'll spill his guts. If we promise not to do it for him. Sounds like a smart man. Have at it, three. Signing off, Bolin was about to leave the roof when he saw movement near the flaming chopper cockpit. Now food stirred, rolled on his back as the executioner rolled out of the dark and stood over him. American? Yeah? You, perhaps one here, will not stop my jihad in, in your country. A man's got to try. <laughs> Cragen was wondering what else could go wrong when he stopped cold in his tracks. The black shapes materialized, coming in low, blowing over his head. Cragen already knew what they were about. They were so close to the airfield now, yet they might as well have been standing on the other side of Africa, as far as Cragen was concerned. He stood in the darkness of the sprawling plain, breathing hard after his 30-minute run for freedom. Those were F-15s, American, or possibly Israeli. No matter. They were going in to eliminate any threat of pursuit. He took in the control tower with its banks of satellite dishes sticking up high above the crisscrossing ribbons of runway. The whole picture, a perfect target. One sidewinder shot away from its pylon and took out the tower, a perfect bullseye. The MiGs, twin-engine planes and choppers grounded near the hangars, went next. He lost count of how many sparrows and sidewinders were cut loose. All things considered, it was more than enough. His own jet was parked in one of the hangars at the far southern edge of the airfield. He glimpsed a bunch of guys racing out of the hangars, wished he had his handheld radio. At least he could have warned his men to get their bird clear. Now this. He watched for another few heartbeats, maybe six 20-millimeter Vulcan Gatling guns, shredding apart anything that could fly. He saw the shadows running from the line of explosions, racing for the deep cover of a teak forest to the west. That, he hoped, would be his men. Cragen looked back at the night sky and made out the massive bulk of the transport plane soaring in for a landing. A C-130 Hercules, come to round up the troops from the palace. Cragen looked at Manson. Come on, I've got an idea. We might just get out of Sudan yet. Holding down the People's Palace before evacuation proved a far more difficult and worrisome task than even Bolin had anticipated. The reasons were varied for the time-consuming chore, and none of them were good. His previous order for clearing out in ten minutes was a whopping long shot, but the soldier knew that already. Whatever the time frame, he wanted all hands hustling to wrap it up. Beyond the hell grounds here, it was still a good hour's march to the airfield, with no telling who or what would turn up along the way. Landsat imagery had indicated that the terrain leading to the airfield from the palace was too broken and craggy for the C-130 to attempt a landing. They would simply have to leg it all the way to their ride out and hope some Sudanese reinforcements didn't show up along the way. 
At least 100 rooms in the palace had to be swept, top to bottom. Even then, Bolin heard some auto fire stammering from somewhere in the building as pockets of resistance blazed at black suits 2 and 3 of Team 2 from behind closed doors. Then he heard answering auto fire from the HK-33s. Team 2, what's your status? Clear. Bolin had dispatched Team 1 to the roof to stand watch for any APCs or curious Sudanese aircraft that might want to take a look at the hell grounds. Team 3 was downstairs with the women, who were now dressed and calmed down. Despite the wide variety of languages among them, they had all been assured they were safe and would soon be going back to their home countries. Unfortunately, it turned out Saeed also had several wives on the premises who were seriously bent out of shape at their change in fortune and issuing all sorts of colorful threats to Boland's men. Well, life was tough like that, he thought. Then there was the crocodile problem. Bolin had ordered all entrances locked up with a member of Team 2 standing watch in the courtyard for any lurking beasts. Luckily, it looked as if thick jungle vegetation out back, toward the east, would prevent any more hungry predators attempting to interrupt the coming evacuation. Where the doors had been blasted off by the pool in the foyer, Bolin ordered Team 3 to build fires, using any fuel they could lay their hands on. Initial croc sightings told Bolin the predators appeared content to feed on the dead out front and poolside. Still, there were so many crocodiles roaming the grounds, and the fires wouldn't deter them forever. The executioner was making his way down a side chamber on the second floor when something began to nag him about the two runners. He'd only spent a quick minute or so grilling the general and the other two officers who wisely opted to surrender, but the executioner knew enough about what had really gone on here to keep his combat senses on full alert. They were still a long way from the home stretch, and he knew this was no time to be overconfident. Sure, the majority of Sudanese soldiers and their officers had cut and run, and Bolin and company had chalked up a staggering body count, but something warned the warrior that the easy part was over. Bolin and the black suits had burned up ammo at a furious rate, and whenever he had to bother counting up the clips and the grenades, Bolin could always feel the enemy ready to put the squeeze on. The Sudanese prisoners had confirmed CIA involvement with Nafud's scheme to unleash jihad on America. The agents' names were Cragen and Manson. They had been in South Sudan for several years, supposedly to equip and train the black rebels, only they'd worked both sides of the fence. It also seemed that they and Said had capitalized on Nafud's hatred for the West for some time, providing a safe haven for him here at the palace, for a hefty price, of course. Bolin would learn more later. But at the moment, he suspected Cragen and Manson wanted only to leave Sudan any way they could, retrieve whatever money they'd taken from Nafud, and vanish. The C-130 was a very large sitting duck, an invitation to the treacherous mercs to either commandeer a ride or blow it up. Bolin raised the Hercules pilot. Get that ship in the air until you hear from me again. He patched through to Eagle One next and ordered the squadron's leader to take out any threat that moved on the airfield. Just as the pilot confirmed the order and Bolin signed off, the door ahead flew wide. Cragen found his men at least had the good sense to bring along some M16s, plus a few rocket launchers. With some luck and a little initiative, he could shape things up in a hurry. He addressed their angry and questioning faces simply. Problems at the People's Palace, gentlemen. Time for us to fly. Enough said, and he was grateful no one bothered to push it. As he stepped toward the edge of the forest, he searched the skies. Like circling predatory birds, the fighter jets were patrolling the air above them, winging north to south, holding crisscrossing patterns, as if something out there in all that raging inferno would rise up and pose a threat. It would be tricky, walking up to that giant transport he knew, convincing the flight crew it was in their best interests to let them climb aboard. Cragen really didn't want to die in this cesspool, but if he couldn't catch his taxi out of Sudan, he intended to make life miserable for every living thing there. Cragen addressed his mercs. Just follow my lead. We're taking that big bird out of here. If they don't want us on board, shoot the tires out. Blast away at the cockpit, wings, whatever. If we don't leave here, no one does. Getsman, feel free to unload with that law if those flyboys won't cooperate. Let's march! He was moving out when he suddenly saw the C-130 rumbling down the runway, rolling north. Cursing, he was breaking into a sprint as the crew put some thrust to the turboprops when he looked up and found one of the F-15Es swooping down, leveling out, and boring in for a strafe. Someone had anticipated his move, and he had a good idea who it was. 
the unknown one-man army. It was as if that rat bastard could read minds, and from a distance. Fall back! Beside him, Cragen saw Manson burst apart from a direct hit. Flaming projectiles started tearing apart the forest in a solid wall of fire. Cragen found the edge leading down into a gully, went airborne as his whole world once again went straight to hell. Bullets snapped over Boland's head, gouging furrows in the wall, whining off down the chamber. The executioner caught sight of an enraged face, a guy naked from the waist up, then hit the trigger of his HK-33. The hardman bounced back into the doorframe. As he slumped on his haunches, bleeding out, Boland made the door. No shoot! Please! Peering inside, the executioner found a Filipino girl, no older than fourteen, clutching a sheet to her chest. He scanned the large bedroom. You alone? She nodded. Get dressed. Hurry up. She went to the closet, Bolin watching her, listening for any sound, any movement that would betray a gunman in hiding or creeping down the hall. She found some pants and a shirt, several sizes too large, then made her way with tentative steps toward the big, black-garbed invader. She stopped at the door, and despite her tender years, Bolin read the feral hatred in her eyes toward her abuser. She spit on the dead man. <laughs> These, they are like animals. You not believe what they do to us. I could only imagine. And Boland damn well could. You here? Take me home? Yes. The soldier gently took her by the arm, leading her out of that chamber of horrors. When the F-15E screened off, Cragen discovered he was down to eight men, soon to be seven. Gutzman was minus his left arm, blown clean off at the shoulder, the glazed stare in the man's eyes telling Cragen he was quickly lapsing into shock from blood loss. Cragen took care of the wounded man in short order. Anybody else can't make it? They were struggling to their feet, dazed, but the survivors looked in one piece. Cragen needed to get it together in a hurry. He pondered the situation all of five seconds when the answer came to him. The simplicity, the beauty of it made him chuckle. Why hadn't he thought of it before? There was no way, given all the crags and generally broken up ground between the palace and here, the nameless bastard would have to come to them. Not only that, unless he was dead wrong, the guy wouldn't leave the women behind. If he was some western commando, he'd probably be bound to some sense of chivalry, honor, crap like that. An old-fashioned kind of guy, Cragen thought. If he played true to form, as Cragen believed, the commando's sense of being one of the good guys would get him killed or see Cragen commandeer that C-130. Listen up, gentlemen. This is what we're going to do. The army is coming. You American barbarians will pay for what you have done to Sudan. You will be captured and shot, I assure you. Bolin was about to enter the command and control room on the first floor when a woman hurled those words at his back. Turning, he dropped a level gaze on another of what he assumed was one of Saeed's bejeweled and well-fed wives. What's going on, three? Fifteen-foot croc got cranky and tried to headbutt the French doors. Well, he took the sucker out. Affirmative. Get the rest of the women out in the courtyard. Two minutes and we're gone. Bolin looked at the woman. If you feel that way about us, I can always leave you here. <laughs> Infidel pig! All right, ma'am, let's go. Get your hands off of me, you piece of pig shit! Bolin entered the command center. The walls were lined with radio and radar consoles, and a bank of computers ran through the center of the room. The Sudanese general and his officers watched Bolin with mixed curiosity and fear, their hands fastened behind their backs with plastic cuffs. The black suit was holding up a video cassette. Stryker, you won't believe what they say is on this tape. Saeed made snuff films of prisoners he tortured, executed, even threw to the crocodiles. Bolin wasn't surprised, and according to Team One, Saeed had met a similar end. Cosmic justice, he thought. The black suit shut down the monitor and punched out the hard drive. One of the prisoners had volunteered the information that Saeed kept records of all the women he brought here as sex slaves, their places of origin, how much they cost him, and how much money he might make if he decided to resell them, were all on disk, along with a diary about not food and the terrorist operation. How many women did you count? Sixty-eight. The general here says we also have all of Saeed's wives who are on the premises, sir. Any way to find out if they were able to call out an SOS? The black suit indicated the radio console. According to our prisoners, they didn't have time. The only frequency was a military one. Everything that hooked them to the outside world, even their cell phones, was linked to the dish you took out. You take us hostage now. 
Don't come here and murder Sudanese citizens, declaring war on a sovereign country. Now we are prisoners. Even though there was fear in the short, beefy general's dark eyes, Boland heard the undercurrent of defiance and resentment. The more Boland learned about the people's palace and its occupants, the more he felt he hadn't gotten here a minute too soon. Let's move them out. The black suit took up his HK-33 and a satchel full of potential intelligence materials and waved the officers to the doorway. The executioner fell in behind two black suits ushering out the last of the women down the corridor that led to the courtyard. Boland heard the first of the crocodiles bullying his way into the living room. Putting the palace of death behind, Boland gathered speed, hit the courtyard, and quietly urged the women to pick up the pace. The last time Cody Caldwell had been in Oklahoma City, he was so strung out on Jack Daniels and dope he couldn't remember what month it was. How things had changed, he thought. Sobriety had certainly helped him to memorize the entire war sheet, as it had been called. Marching orders, the names, phone numbers, and addresses of safe houses for terrorists in the Oklahoma City area, the route and final destinations for depositing the fanatics, every detail committed to memory so effortlessly he couldn't help but be impressed with himself. He and the other God's Crusaders of the OKC unit had burned the papers on the jet. Now he had two other problems, unfamiliarity with the city and getting through to his friend at the Justice Department. He was grateful when he spotted the payphone in front of a deli only three blocks from Leland moving. With any luck, no one would miss him at the warehouse. All day, they had pretty much just sat around after riding in from yet one more private airfield owned by Leland, waiting on God only knew what. He didn't understand the delay, but overheard something about last-minute details, whatever those were. He picked up the phone and slipped the calling card out of his wallet. It was rush hour. The street was choked with traffic. He felt his paranoia flare up, suddenly believing somebody would notice he was gone and decide to come looking for him. But he had to do this. If innocent blood was shed because he stood by and did nothing, he knew he wouldn't be able to live with himself guilt driving him to one final binge that would take him over the edge. Urgently, he punched in the 1-800, his pin, then the direct number to his buddy's office. Come on, Jack, you've got to be there. The familiar voice finally came on the line. Skipping past any catch-up between old friends, Caldwell got right to it. He gave his friend everything he knew about the operation, wrapped it up by telling him about McClintock, the compound, how transport and hit teams were flown out likewise to Richmond, Atlanta. He wasn't sure when they'd move their human cargo along with weapons and explosives down the interstates, but it could happen any time. Jack, you need to get this to someone high up the chain of command. How can I reach you? You can't. I'll have to call back. Caldwell's heart lurched at the sight of John Peterson rolling his way, the big man in the black leather bomber jacket grim as the devil. Yeah, that's right, honey. I shouldn't be more than another two, three days. I love you too, baby. Peterson stepped up to his face, looming over him, suspicion frozen like chips of ice in his eyes. Listen, gotta go, baby. Yeah, I miss you too. See you soon. Caldwell smiled and shrugged. <laughs> Women... You couldn't make that call from the warehouse? Hey, you know how it is. No, I don't. Why don't you tell me how it is? Macho posturing, women wanting you to tell them you love them in front of your buddies, that kind of thing. I wasn't aware you had a woman. New love. Six weeks we've been seeing each other. Since I got sober, I've tended to lead a quiet, simple life. Not the man I used to be. Meaning? I'm not some swaggering braggart anymore when it comes to the women in my life. Peterson didn't move. Caldwell was certain the man was set to call him a liar. Okay. Well, we've got serious things to do. Forget your woman. You'll see her soon enough. No more phone calls. You understand? Caldwell nodded and managed not to let the breath he'd been holding explode out of him. Sure. No problem. There was more fear and less confidence in his voice than he would have liked. Washington, D.C. Hal Brognola was jolted by the phone ringing just as he drifted off for some desperately needed sleep. Jerking awake on the couch in his office, he checked the time. Oh, God damn it! He saw the light flashing on the phone bank for the inter-office line. Brognola made his way to his desk, grabbed up the phone, hit the inter-office button. Brognola here. Sir, this is Special Agent Jack Turner. I know this is highly unusual for me to call you like this. Skip the explanation, Turner. What is it? Sir... 
I just received a very strange phone call from a friend of mine, a former FBI agent. In light of the three terrorist attacks, he told me a disturbing story regarding a situation out west. Brognola listened, couldn't believe what he began hearing. But the Big Fed found himself hoping they'd just caught the wave that might take them into shore. Sudan. Cragen stifled the urge to laugh. It seemed too good to be true. The nameless bastard had to have seen himself as some kind of Moses heading up his own version of a 21st century exodus. In this case, the wandering tribe was a flock of women. Cragen and his men were concealed, or, so he hoped, near the edge of the hardwood forest, looking down a rise that led to the northern edges of the airfield. He had taken one of the two M16 M203 combos for himself, full clip in place, a 5.56 millimeter round chambered with a 40 millimeter grenade up the snout of the attached launcher. Strung out beside him, the rest of the troops were hunkered dark shadows, eyes wild with adrenaline. The damn fighter jets, he noted, were still roaring across the skies above the airfield, the noise and the constant threat of another strafing run raising the hackles on the back of his neck. After what he'd seen those warbirds do, and considering the carnage he'd left behind at the palace, he knew he could find himself blown off the map. His choices were few. Some edge, maybe some deception on his part, was all he needed. Perhaps make it look as if he'd been one of the good guys all along, simply playing Saeed and Nafud, gathering intel for the company. He watched the parade of shadows advancing. Without infrared binox, he couldn't hope to estimate the armed opposition and the number of women. But there were plenty enough targets down there to choose from if he had to cut loose. All he had to do was announce his intentions. They trudged over the broken ground, the gentlemen in combat black suits assisting the women if they stumbled. What a swell bunch of guys, Cragen thought. At 100 yards in closing, he began to see his targets take on shape as they moved into the outer limits of the light thrown from the flaming wreckage on the airfield. One last look at the troops, and he found them holding tight to their weapons. Two law rockets were ready to dump their loads of destruction into either the Exodus or the C-130. At that point, Cragen didn't much care which. He was ready to give it all up, if only to see Mr. Asskicker eat it here in Sudan. Where that guy was concerned, it was now a little personal. Come on, just a little closer. That's right, come to daddy. He heard the distant rumble of the C-130, made out the dark mass as the behemoth bird came their way. Ass kicker, he thought, had called the bird back, feeling he was clear and home free. Or was it something else? Why did he feel so uneasy? Cragen stood, moved out and held his ground at the edge of the rise. Freeze it up now or I'll start shooting the women. Eagle one, striker, come in. The executioner had anticipated trouble once they made the airfield. A mile or so out, he had passed on the orders for the black suits to keep moving after raising Eagle One. The pilot had turned up eight live ones on his heat-seeking screens. No movement in the forest's edge at the point Bolin and his party would come walking in. Stationary positions for the enemy spelled ambush to Bolin. The executioner crouched and surging up a long rise, swiftly shadowing in on their blind side from some hundred yards out, made the edge of the teak forest, froze, and got his bearings. Striker here. I've got movement somewhere just beyond the bonfire. Don't ask me how we missed it, but it looks like a full squad of Sudanese hostiles are ready to bail the premises in an APC. Bolin mentally gauged the distance he'd need to cut the enemy before he opened up with his recent acquisition of hardware. The soldier was toting a squat stainless steel rocket launcher. Ten chambers were filled with 40-millimeter grenades. It was called Little Bulldozer, the weapon created and nicknamed by John Cowboy Kissinger, Stony Man's resident weapons genius. Two minutes and counting, then take that problem out. Copy. Eagle one out. Bolin, hoping some more fireworks would distract his enemies, moved on at a cautious pace. Opting not to use NVD goggles, Bolin was counting on the firelight striking the forest edge where they were laying in wait to guide him in closer. It did. Moments later, he pinpointed the white-haired Merc standing on the lip of the rise, bellowing out his situation. It was obviously a smokescreen. The soldier had seen enough action to be able to read Cragen like a Dick and Jane book. We don't want to have to kill you, hell. I assume you're Americans. We're on the same side, right? I can explain what happened at the People's Palace if you give me a chance. I was using Saeed to gather intelligence about a major terrorist operation about to be launched against the United States. Take care of me and mine, and 
I've got what you need to root out the mother of all jihads back home. Bowling closed, lifting little bulldozer, ready to drop the first couple of rounds into the middle of the pack, the assault rifle slung around his shoulder, bouncing gently off his backside. It was only a backup piece in case he needed it, but he didn't expect to. Bolin intended to blow them off the ridge in so many pieces there wouldn't be enough left for croc bait. He heard Eagle One driving some thrust to his turbofans, and Bolin saw the F-15E streaking low over the airfield, bearing down fast and hard from the north. The distant glowing wash of the fireball flared like some oversized illuminated screen off to the side of the executioner's enemies. I hope that's not your answer. I've got eight guns aimed your way. I can mow down plenty of those women. You hear me, damn you? Say something! Little Bulldozer told them everything they needed to know. The first explosion tore into the heart of the mercenaries as planned, hurling ripped scarecrow figures toward the head merc. Bolin squeezed the trigger repeatedly, raking the launcher down the line of hard men, eating them up. Downrange, a few guys were scrambling for their lives, trying to outrun the fireballs, as if a quick sprint would save them. Somehow, Kraken was lost to Bolin's sight as blazing sheets of flames ate up the forest's edge. The warrior loosed two more bombs, further spreading a blanket of pure raging noise. Rising, Bolin shouldered little bulldozer and slipped his arm through the strap. He took the HK-33 in hand and rolled ahead into the floating grit and wafting smoke. One of the mercenaries squirmed up, a bloody and mauled figure, one arm bent at an impossible angle, jutting gleaming shards of bone. Evil men, Bolin thought, never knew when to gurgle out their last foul breath. Where was Kragan? You last son of a... Bolin honed in on the cursing. When he reached Kragan, there was so much blood covering him, Bolin couldn't judge the extent of the man's injuries. Kragan rolled on his side, craning his neck, staring at the warrior. The way Kragan held his arm out, Bolin knew the guy was holding a weapon and not his guts. Kragan wanted to go out with a bang. Fair enough, the executioner thought. He raised the C-130 and gave the order to land, then told the black suits to wrap it up. You know, it could have been different. I don't see how. I have money. Get me help. I I don't want to die in this shithole. It was your choice from the start. Hey, give me a chance. I already did. You drew the losing hand when you took Nafood's money. You rotten. Hold on a second. It's easy. Two, three million. Hey, come on. I, I fought for America. Cragen made his move, somehow finding that last reserve of strength, the forty-five Colt coming up, swinging across his mangled body. The executioner let the HK-33 give Cragen his final answer. Bolin was on the sat link, updating Brognola, as soon as they were airborne, and all radar screens showed they were free of approaching air traffic. Soon they'd hit Red Sea airspace, where an Israeli backup squadron of F-15s was already scrambled, just in case. Sudan was almost a wrap. Standing aft in the huge belly of the Hercules, Bolin watched for a few moments as the black suits handed out blankets and water to the women. They were going home, back to some semblance of normalcy that had been temporarily stolen from them. There would be scars, both physical and emotional, but time, the soldier knew from his own heart experience, always healed the wounds inflicted on the human heart and soul. Saeed's wives would be quietly shipped back to Sudan, if that's what they wanted. The Sudanese government might cry foul on the diplomatic front for the rest of the fanatical Muslim world to hear, railing about some future call to arms against the great Satan. So be it, Bolin thought. There would always be another Nafud or Saeed. But the campaign was far from over as he heard the news from the big feds end. According to Brognola, a stealth B-2 had been scrambled from the American airbase in Saudi Arabia and would be parked and waiting to whisk Boland back across the Atlantic. With a max cruising speed at just under Mach 1 and a high altitude range of 7,600 miles, it was the fastest available ride to get the soldier back to the States. The good news was that Powers and Greavy appeared content to remain for the time being in Atlanta, and so far, there had been no more terrorist attacks on U.S. soil. If Boland's hunch was right, that was about to change, and sooner than he wanted, if his enemies on the other side of the ocean tried to contact their Sudan sponsors. The hours ahead could prove an eternity. 
but there was little else the warrior could do except hold to grim hope the savages were only sharpening their blades, biding their time, and waiting for their own date with the executioner. Atlanta. I've been trying to reach you for almost 24 hours now. What the hell's going on? Do you realize at what hour you are calling me? Grievy checked his watch, scowling, thinking only about the entire day he'd wasted trying to find out about his money with no luck, so he could finish tying up the loose ends and fly onto his tropical slice of heaven. He felt his expression harden even more as the front door opened and he saw Powers stride in, two giant bags in hand, a foot-long stogie jammed in his yap, the guy just letting a couple inches worth of ashes drop from the glowing tip to the carpet. Since Boston, the colonel had been acting very strange, and for a solid 12 hours, Powers had been AWOL. This pissing contest was getting old. It had been a long, nervous day already, mounting a snow job at SCTU Small Command Central in downtown Atlanta, putting bogus strikes against phantom terrorists on the drawing board, ducking calls from Jeffries, then riding out to Leland's airport in his rental, paid for under one of his half-dozen assumed identities, to double-check and make sure McClintock came through with the jet and extra guns. For hours, despite the fact he'd been unable to reach their cutout to the man overseas, Grievy had been grateful for the solitude. He'd gotten fed up with the colonel's sullen demeanor and bizarre behavior, believing the earlier disappearing act was staged as some sort of warning. Now what, he wondered. Then Grievy watched as Powers dumped the bags on the couch in the living room of the apartment in suburban Atlanta they used as their private retreat. The colonel zipped open the black nylon bag. It was a big one, the kind they used for diplomatic pouches, large enough to carry the corpse of a full-grown man with room to spare. I didn't think you'd be able to sleep, not with what's in the wings. He felt his hand twitching toward the holstered Glock 17 beneath his windbreaker. His heart started to race as something dangerous crept into the colonel's eyes, powers acting oblivious to everything but the bags. A cautious step forward, and Grievy saw enough hardware in that dip pouch to field a full squad of commandos. Like some kid checking out his Christmas gifts, making sure he got what he'd asked for, powers hauled out one, then two HK MP5 subguns, cracked home clips, ran an appreciative eye over the SMGs. Some kind of slotted belt came out next, stuffed to the gills with hand grenades. That got dumped on the couch, too. As Grievy watched Powers, he heard the silky smooth voice of the Arab on the other end of the telephone line. I believe I know why you are calling me. There has been a most unfortunate development, if I am to believe a source of mine over there. Actually, I have been forced to deal with another troublesome situation also. Improvising the operation due to unforeseen circumstances has created delays for my launch. I don't like the sound of this. Grievy sidled away from the couch. Semi and automatic handguns were getting the loving once over from Powers. There was a bullpup configured Austrian AUG in 9mm and an Uzi subgun getting deposited on the couch. Powers took out a sheath and slid out a commando dagger, its razor honed edge winking in the lamplight. The colonel lifted a leg, snapped the sheath with tucked-in blade to his ankle. There was a pair of brass knuckles displayed for a moment, then disappearing into the pocket of his black leather bomber jacket. A closer look inside the bag, and Grievy found a Spaz-12 automatic shotgun, more clips and bandoliers of shells, a stun gun, and five or so mini handheld radios, the high-tech variety that could be scrambled once the Keynote microchip was installed. Powers put everything back, except for one HK MP5, zipped the bag up, slipped an arm through the SMG strap, hanging it around his shoulder. Beer? In the fridge. Grievy wasn't sure what he saw in the colonel's eyes, but he suddenly felt he couldn't trust the man any further than he could spit. Cold, I hope. Grievy nodded and trailed Powers a few feet as the man marched into the kitchen and helped himself to a Heineken. Are you there? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm still waiting to hear about the rest of the money. As I was attempting to tell you, there will be no more payments. Not for you nor your friends in Texas. Grievy heard the blood roaring in his ears. What did you just say? You heard me correctly, I believe. Before you start hurling around abusive language, listen to me. You have not been able to reach me because I have done little else today except cover my tracks and make that call overseas. Information just reached me that our source, our sponsor as you call him, is believed dead. 
Reliable sources tell me they were hit by an unknown group of commandos. I am told the body count is so staggering, it is believed a small army must have stormed the place. You're telling me that nothing... No names! Yes, I am telling you he is dead. Likewise, I understand, the pipeline has been effectively closed. Who, Americans? They believe so. Okay, so what's the problem? Just proceed with what you've got. <laughs> oh, my American friend. It was not supposed to be this way. But as I sometimes say, hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. As you suggested to me, take what you already have and be grateful. I'm out another three mil and I'm supposed to be happy? Listen to me, friend. If it weren't for me and my contact, you wouldn't have shit. It was a mutual effort. We extended our hands to each other at the time the critical juncture. You for the money, me for principle. Powers came back, sucking on his beer. That may be true enough, but if this is the end of our arrangement, let me be clear on something. Should I even see a shadow following me where I'm going, I can still find you. That will not happen. And I'm just supposed to take your word for it? It's all sweetness and light? Yes, something like that. You see, what you don't understand could never possibly fathom. Well... Within 24 hours, I will be dead. What? You heard me. Dead. I did not come all the way here, risk my life, convince many others to sacrifice their own lives, just so I could live to reap the glory of their sacrifice. So you're... Yes. I will lead them all to paradise. Although I will be the last martyr to follow them to heaven. Whether or not the man was bent on suicide, and this crazy Muslim nonsense about jihad and martyrdom was working on his last nerve... Grievy didn't much care, but he wasn't about to just drop the money issue. Listen. No, you listen. This will be our last conversation. What is done is done. You have most of what you want, and I am about to get, or rather give, what I so richly deserve to give. As soon as I hang up, this line will be disconnected permanently. Goodbye, and good luck. Wait a second. Hold on. Son of a fucking bitch! Problems? Grievy shot power as a look. No more money? You don't sound too upset we're out three million dollars, which for your information was to be our last payment. Power shrugged, worked on his beer. Oh. Man has to plan accordingly. What the hell does that mean, Colonel? Means a week ago I liquidated all my assets, cashed in on some stocks, cleared out three accounts, some IRAs, a few other investments I've made over the years, plus what I've received for my... Our part of the operation. Gee, now I can sleep at night, knowing you're so well situated. Yep. My money's sitting down in the Bahamas already. I could live comfortably off the interest alone. Who knows, if I get bored with sitting on the beach drinking rum and getting blowjobs from island girls, I might go farther south. I hear the cartels are always looking for a few good men. Brazil still has a few death squads. Maybe they could learn something from a man of my experience. If, of course, the price is right. You know... Something isn't right here between us. Really? <laughs> I think we need to talk. First, you mind uh, losing the peace? Come on, Greeby. After all the bullshit you put me through, after I've got my island paradise paid for, you think I'm going to risk it all by shooting you? You tell me. Powers drained his beer, set it on the coffee table, then unslung his subgun and laid it beside the dip pouch. So I'm assuming we're ready to <clears throat> catch our plane out of the country? You assume wrong. A dangerous shine lit up the colonel's eyes. Do not fuck with me, Greavy. I'm not. You knew the particulars. You knew the timetable. Refresh my memory. Our friends down in the islands? That Panamanian freighter they arranged? The shrimp boat? The one the Coast Guard will be told to stuff with 15 or so tons of coke? Yeah. All available Coast Guard and Customs folks will be moving out at the appointed hour tomorrow night to board that vessel and search it stem to stern. That's our window to get through U.S. airspace and beyond Florida. I've been thinking about that. I got some problems with your scheme. Like what? Us crashing our jet into the Atlantic. We're not crashing. We're parachuting to a drop site where our island contact will pick us up by boat. What if he decides he already has enough pocket money? He could decide to leave us for the sharks. Then I'll swim all the way to the island, cut him up into a thousand pieces with a rusty machete, and leave him for the sharks. You know the arrangement, Colonel. He's contacted once our airspace is clear of any traffic. We make a visual of his boat first, then bail. If he's not there, we simply fly on. Oh, that's right. I forgot. You have all the answers. What's the matter? You losing your nerve? 
<laughs> ah, what the fuck? We've gotten this far. I figure I owe myself a few days just sitting on the beach doing nothing. All work and no play makes the colonel a mean mother. So we have to sit around another 12, 15 hours with our thumbs up our fundaments. Maybe Belasco will show up in Atlanta. I get it now. Get what? Belasco? You think I'm worried the guy will piss on our Wheaties? You certainly came here prepared for that eventuality. Damn straight I did. You haven't even seen what's in the other bag yet. Our Sudanese sponsor was taken down by an unidentified group of commandos. No food is history. No no food, no more money. Maybe they got to him before he croaked and he talked. Maybe the CIA goons I used to bring him on board squealed too. And maybe they didn't. All the more reason to get the fuck out of the country. I'm sticking to the timetable. All right. But I'll tell you this. No one, not Belasco, not you, not Luther, is going to keep me from leaving the country and starting over. I want what I want and I'll have it. If the Arab doesn't get his jihad, that's not my problem either. My only problem is maybe how many bastards I have to drop on my way out. Grievy knew not to push it. The colonel was getting that frenzied glitter in his eyes, telling the world he was tougher, smarter, better than everybody else, and he could prove it. FBI profilers had pegged guys like Powers, serial killer, sociopath, psychopath, However, they chose to categorize a man who killed for pleasure, who felt nothing for anyone but himself. There was always something weird in the eyes that the profilers never failed to comment on. Guys like Powers, he thought, went about their daily business, laughing at the world, treating other humans as pawns on their own personal chessboard. Wasn't he like Powers in some ways? Grieby wondered. He didn't want to believe that, but they were alike in some ways. Twice divorced married more to careers or personal agendas than they could have ever been to a woman, wanting something larger than life, a bigger slice to call their own. Power? Control? Shaping their own destinies? Grievy decided not to think about it. You know something? If our relationship with Sudan has been severed, it shouldn't bother you, more money or not. And why is that? That's just one less asshole that can point the finger our way. New Mexico. No one was coming. Cody Caldwell became convinced many miles and hours ago his SOS was in vain. He was in a world of hurt, if that was the case. No saviors from the Justice Department, no preemptive strike against the terrorist operation he was an unwilling accomplice to. No shot at redemption. He was on his own, twisting in the wind. Damn it. If it went down the way he believed it was going to, He'd either be dead or in jail within two days. What was planned would make the Oklahoma City bombing look tame, with 20 or 30 times the casualties. What could he do, he wondered, not only to save himself, but to stop this madness from happening. It would take at least 20 more hours just to get to Los Angeles. Their first stop was Phoenix, so it could end up being as much as a full day, maybe more. There, 12 terrorists would be unloaded from the cargo hold. Four groups of three, equipped with wraparound bundles of dynamite and plastic explosive, suicide soldiers for the jihad. Between the two trucks, that left another 74 fanatics to be dispersed around Southern California, a group of 24 shipped up to San Francisco. It coiled his guts to know that at least six of the planned strikes were against private and public schools, both elementary and secondary. How many children would die unless he did something? And what about the four 55-gallon drums, two labeled toxic waste, the other two stamped with the universal radiation sign? How were they going to be used? Unfortunately, he wasn't armed, and Peterson was. A big 357 Magnum Colt Python shoulder holstered beneath his jacket. Peterson's silence ever since their confrontation at the payphone back in Oklahoma City didn't inspire Caldwell with confidence he would be rescued much less lived to proclaim his own innocence. The brown lunar landscape of New Mexico only served to deepen his despair. For as far as he could see beyond the interstate, there was nothing but scrub brush, broken ground and cactus, with only an occasional mesa or line of sawtooth hills to break up the monotonous terrain. Despite the air conditioning running full blast, Caldwell's shirt was pasted to his back from sweat. The way the sun beat down on the hood of their 18-wheeler he figured it was a hundred plus out there, and he wondered how long he could make it on foot without water. A day? Two tops? That was provided, of course, he could manage to slip away, 
reach some form of civilization and make another call. He adjusted his shades and glanced at Peterson, who was a stone fixture at the wheel, staring ahead at the arrow-straight black ribbon. According to his watch and the last posted sign, they were still an hour or so out of Albuquerque, if Peterson maintained 65 miles an hour. Oddly enough, there was next to no traffic, just a couple of SUVs, a travel trailer up ahead. But this was desert country, and several county roads posted signs warning travelers to make sure they didn't travel without drinking water. In the side-view mirror, he saw the second Leland truck behind them. Caldwell wondered what his chances were if he flung the door open and bailed. If he spotted a suitable and deep enough gully, something with brush in it, he figured he could survive the fall. And what would Peterson do? Stop the truck? Send out a hunting party and risk throwing away the whole operation over one man? Caldwell found just what he was looking for, a deep swale off the roadside. He was reaching for the door handle when he felt the iron jammed into his ribs. Where do you think you're going, Cody? Caldwell turned slowly and saw the big man grinning behind his dark shades. Something's been bothering me, little buddy. I checked back with Buck in Oklahoma City while we were waiting around last night. It's funny how things happen. Man knows everything about you, everything you've been up to the last year. Buck, he put in a call to a buddy of yours. You know Jimmy from AA, from downstairs in your apartment building? Turns out old Jimbo says you don't have any girlfriend. Part of the first year of getting sober, something like that. No relationships with the opposite sex. Doesn't it bother you, Peterson, that you used to be a lawman? Those fanatics or terrorists or whatever you want to call them back there are being sent out to murder children, for God's sake. God doesn't have anything to do with it. And no, it don't bother me. I'm getting paid well, more than I ever made with the FBI. All I gotta do is drop them off at the scheduled stops. It's all about the money. <laughs> A man with enough driving ambition can always make it in this great country of ours. I always said America is about to be very, very good to me. Kids, Peterson. They're going to be shooting up grade school kids. You need to talk to somebody who gives a shit about this country, or rather what it used to be, before we let the great unwashed masses air their filthy laundry all over the TV talk shows, before the criminals took over and armed themselves with more firepower than the police departments and the friggin' U.S. Army put together, or we allowed the courts and the politicians total access to every area of our lives. This society's finished. I'm getting out before it all really goes to hell. I was tossed out of the FBI for roughing up a few of those kids you want to coddle so much. The kind with a bag of dope, a gun, and a lot of attitude. I sure hope our Arab friends do some urban facelifting before they check out. But I guess you never understood the philosophy of God's crusaders, little buddy. It's us against them. I guess since you sobered up, you've seen the light. You're better than the rest of us. I called the Justice Department, Peterson. They know. And no, I don't share your attitude. Probably never did. What is it they say about evil? It flourishes if a few good men stand by and do nothing. Something like that. Caldwell was sure Peterson was going to pull the trigger when the hand held crackled on the seat. It was Mulroy, the driver of the other truck. Peterson, pick up! Pick it up and hold it for me. Real slow. Real easy. Something's going on, Peterson. I've been wondering why there's no traffic out here. I've been watching three Smokies on my six tell me about four miles just drop back and form some kind of barricade to the east. No westbound cars tells me the same thing as maybe set up down the road. Not only that, I just spotted a chopper flew in over the hills headed your way. It's a military chopper. What do you want to do? Pull up ahead of me. I want to take a look. Keep going. Under no circumstances do we stop. Order your human cargo to arm themselves and be ready for anything. Got that? Roger. Okay, you can put it down, asshole. I guess you think the cavalry's arrived. And you can just turn yourself in and start squealing. You're a gutless wonder. You know that, Caldwell? Caldwell inched his hand closer to the door handle, saw the trailing semi loom up beyond Peterson, gather speed and thunder on, finally swinging back into the right lane. Peterson pounded on the sliding window of the partition. It opened, a bearded, swarthy face edging up to the screen. We may be looking at trouble. Arm yourselves. Get ready to bail and go for broke if we're stopped by cops. Without a word, the angry face disappeared. Then Caldwell spotted the black chopper in the side view. Nose down, it was hugging the desert, blowing up dark funnels of grit, racing up the side. It blew past, right on top of the truck, the rig shuddering. Peterson fighting to control the wheel with one hand. 
Oh, fuck. It's a Blackhawk. Caldwell's cavalry. The former FBI agent thrust the door open and prepared to leave his seat. He was so pumped on adrenaline, propelled out the door by pure fear and airborne in the next instant, Caldwell wasn't even aware at first his guts had been blown out the other side of his ribs. Tireless dedication, red line phone calls authorized and backed by a presidential directive, and a stroke of good fortune, found the executioner unleashing the next phase of the campaign against the enemy. They were surging past the lead 18-wheeler when the soldier gave the order to his two-man crew. Set me down a good two miles beyond this point, then clear out and stay in the air. The interstate was now free of non-combatants, blocked off in both directions by New Mexico Highway Patrol, as good as it would get. The soldier still counted his good fortune in several areas as he moved into the fuselage and took up arms. The long hours in the air during his transatlantic flight hadn't been wasted. In near constant contact with Brognola and the farm, Boland laid it out. The fickle gods of war had seen fit to smile on his mission. A former FBI agent named Cody Caldwell had put in the call to a friend of his at the Justice Department detailing the direct route, the enemy numbers and targets for their terrorist cargo. That cargo was now housed in the backs of two rigs, clearly marked Leland Moving. All of the intel had been forwarded to the office of Hal Brognola, who immediately put all three Leland operations under surveillance. For reasons unknown, the enemy at these locations had stayed put the entire night, the Oklahoma unit the only one moving out sometime in the morning. But according to what the farm had decoded, there was a method to their madness. The Oklahoma unit was to move out first since they were headed for California. If the enemy stuck to their timetable, Richmond was moving out at 20 hundred hours, Atlanta leaving five hours later. The brains behind the operation, it appeared, had calculated the distances and travel time to some 60 plus targets, then worked out dispersal by van of the individual suicide teams. The army of terror and murder, according to the farm, was going after schools, museums, and government institutions, including INS and IRS buildings, post offices, police precincts, shopping malls, movie theaters, trains, buses, car bombs on crowded city streets, or walking human time bombs setting themselves off in restaurants and hotels. Of course, Boland couldn't be in three places at once. Just to get to this point had taken the moving of logistical mountains on the part of Brognola and Barbara Price. His stealth ride had ferried him to Kirkland Air Force Base in Albuquerque, where the farm's hand-picked crew was on standby with the Black Hawk SOF MH-60. State police had been brought on board to tail the targets, ordered by Brognola, who could use his presidential directive if need be, to seal off a 10-mile corridor on I-40. With the interstate free of innocent travelers, it was the soldier's task to bring down the trucks. A special Justice Department hazmat team was already in the sky, circling beyond the distant hills, prepared to clean up any toxic or radioactive spills. After mopping up in New Mexico, the executioner had a date to keep with someone named Buck McClintock, the leader of a right-wing group that was now shuttling and driving around their army of fanatics. If the Richmond and Atlanta teams moved out, Brognola was prepared to have units of heavily armed agents monitor their movements. The President of the United States was more than willing to let this be Boland's show, start to finish, unless the enemy panicked and rearranged their doomsday schedule. The executioner wasn't about to disappoint the man, much less let the enemy snuff out so much as one more innocent life. Boland felt the Black Hawk stop, hover, then touch down. Dropping a 40 millimeter round into the M203, the soldier hit the door and dropped to the highway. As the chopper lifted off and the rotor wash died, he walked across the right lane and felt the first few drops of sweat beat up on his forehead. It was hotter than hell and quiet as death. He looked down the empty highway, peering into the haze, listening. He didn't have long to wait. The bulk of the lead rig materialized through the shimmering heat. The executioner held his ground, the road beneath his boots vibrating as the monster rig with its savage cargo drew closer. He waited then lifted the HK-33, sighted at the engine housing, and squeezed the M203's trigger. Boland thought he glimpsed the driver jumping up in his seat, eyes popping out of his head. The 
executioner had officially declared war. Hot air gusted through the cab, flinging specks of Caldwell's blood in Peterson's face, spattering his lips with a bitter reminder of the guy's treachery. Peterson caught the flashing image of the guy tumbling off the road in the side view mirror. Then the desert swallowed him up. Good riddance. Peterson wished to God he'd had an hour or two to work on the traitor. Lead pipe, sparking electrical wire, glowing cigarette tip, anything to hear Caldwell scream and blubber for mercy while bleeding out just what he'd told whoever was now coming to crash the party. It couldn't be that bad, he told himself, eyes ahead on Mulroy's rig. One chopper was all he'd seen, and there was nothing else on the road. But where was all the traffic? And why weren't those Smokies pursuing them? It all felt wrong, somehow. He was sure any minute he'd find an army of feds waiting down the road. If that was the case, he'd bulldoze his rig right through the heart of any barricade, pedal to the metal. Peterson! He snapped up the handheld radio. What? There's a guy in the middle of the road! It looks like he's got a grenade launcher! Run the bastard over! Fuck! He's firing! Mulroy was laying on the brakes. The rig's end sluiced away, whipping out across the highway, the whole thing jackknifing. Peterson heard about dying people who claimed to have seen their entire lives flashing before their eyes. Peterson saw the future instead, and all the money he'd never spend if he didn't bail out of the cab. He still had a good hundred yards before impact. Screw the load and the job. Everybody was about to find themselves on their own, and he offered up a silent good luck to them. He tapped the brakes just the same, cutting the speed by maybe ten miles per hour. He hoped it was enough to keep him from getting pulped to a sack of broken bones and spewing innards when he hit the pavement. He bowled into the door and jumped. The cargo was in a state of frenzy. Jim Barker and his three pals, ordered to ride in the back and keep an eye on the terrorist death squad, were getting nervous. Barker was looking at a mutiny, unless the guys got it under control. What is going on? What is the talk I am hearing about police? You and the others had better do something. You have made a ruin of the whole operation. We should have known better than to trust fucking Americans with something so important as this. Barker was digging out the Italian submachine guns, handing them out, while the dark face kept on bellowing in his ear. He would have sworn he heard a gunshot from up front, but with the Arab in his face, he could barely hear his own thoughts. If this is some sort of fucking American trick, I will kill you myself. The jackal shall feed upon your car. Everybody, shut the fuck up! Thank you, Petey, Barker thought. He looked around and saw they were somehow pulling it together. They were all bunched up near the crates, but way too close to those 55-gallon drums of poison for Barker's liking. If Peterson bounced them through a pothole, he could just see the drums tipping over, seals broken. Hey, listen up! If this truck stops and that door opens to a bunch of cops, I suggest you start blasting away. End of discussion. Now they got it. They were all going to sink or swim together. A heartbeat later, and Barker knew they were sinking fast. He was feeding a clip into his Uzi submachine gun when he found himself flying, Peterson hitting the brakes without warning for some god-awful reason. Airborne, Barker was vaguely aware of shadows pitching all around, blurring ahead right beside him, human missiles, then angry weight bounced off his back and shoulders, slamming into the sides of the wall, guys grunting and hollering in two sets of languages. He was tasting the cold steel of the partition that separated them from the cab when he felt the entire back end of the cargo hold swerving, first one way, then the other. Barker fought hard to stand, guys cursing and shouting out their fear. He grabbed the steel handle to the partition slat, slid it back to a blast of wind. He was ready to bellow at Peterson when he found the cab empty of their driver. What in the... It was only a blur, something looming up right beyond their unmanned rig and he knew what was happening even before he looked through the windshield. The cargo hold shot up in front of him like some ghastly billboard advertising his own death. Road Rage did he say that out loud, or was it just a thought, attempting to make sense out of the carnage he saw? He knew he was dying, wouldn't last but maybe another minute or two. 
Whatever had happened down there to cause it, Cody Caldwell was witness to the worst open highway wreck ever. Somehow, someway, he had staggered out of the ditch, his landing cushioned by dense brush, like something wanted him to live long enough to watch the trucks mesh on impact, the walls of both rigs blowing up, stick figures hurled skyward. Road rage. He was vaguely aware of a dust storm. Then the ground rushed up to meet him. The world spun. He was suddenly unbelievably cold, but had to give it all one last look. Finally, Cody Caldwell rolled onto his back and stared up at the sky on fire. This wasn't exactly how he imagined himself dying, not even in his worst drunken nightmare. Alone, bleeding like a carved up steer, sucking in his guts. Now no one would even be aware it had been his call that had saved hundreds, maybe thousands of lives. Children spared, parents who would never grieve. Maybe that knowledge alone, he decided, was tribute and honor enough. Maybe his slate was wiped clean. It was simply time that his marker got called in. Fair enough. It was all starting to fade away. Then he felt the grit slapping him in the face, reviving him, cutting away some of the haze. He heard the loud throbbing, his mind putting it together then. The chopper had landed. A shadow fell over him, some guy in black standing between him and the relentless sun. Hey, I'm Caldwell. You get them? It's in the works. I guess, had I been on truck, my tough luck. Was that compassion on the face of the man in black? You did good, Caldwell. Good enough. Thanks. I needed that. The shadow disappeared. Caldwell suddenly felt no pain, no cold, nothing at all. The sky faded to black. The executioner was digging hard, sprinting for the desert when the lead truck's cargo hold started to topple for the highway. This strike, Olin knew, could have been dropped on the enemy here by air, but the soldier wanted to do this up close and personal, even though he was grimly aware he risked exposure to radioactive waste, not to mention getting nailed by rocketing debris. But this was his show, and he was determined to nail it down and move on. A few more yards, bounding over a boulder and landing inside a ring of rocks, and he looked back. The trailing 18-wheeler blasted into the cargo housing, shredding the length of both walls. Explosions marched down the highway, bodies spinning out of the shooting debris, sailing on. Most of the occupants lost to Boland's view, bodies slamming off the road, skidding off to be devoured by flames when fuel sparked almost right away from ruptured tanks to create a roaring wall of fire. As he rode out the thunder in the fire, Boland looked back down the highway, clear except for some ragdoll figure flopping off the shoulder of the road. The executioner was forced to hold his cover for a full minute while balls of flaming wreckage, human or otherwise, plummeted to earth around him. Above the climbing black smoke, Boland made out the distinct shapes of two 55-gallon drums that spun in midair then dropped, slamming into the road and spewing their contents on a few unlucky survivors. There were other survivors, somehow thrown clear, trying their damnedest to stagger to their feet. They wobbled, choked on all the fumes, a few of the wounded looking around, dazed but searching for weapons. Boland decided it was time to announce his presence. Little bulldozer paving his way, the warrior strode ahead, pumping out three quick rounds, he caught them in tight packs of six or seven, maybe more. With all the smoke obscuring them, it was hard to estimate the body count. Not that the numbers really mattered. The executioner wasn't in the mood to take prisoners. The cylinders of the squat rocket launcher kept chugging out 40 millimeter doom. Peterson dragged himself out of the ditch on his elbows, wondering why he couldn't feel his legs. Tasting blood in his mouth, he stared through the blur in his eyes. Craning his head back and around, he saw his legs were still attached to his body. But what had happened during his fall? No, he heard his mind cry. His back was broken. Or worse, did it mean he was paralyzed from the waist down? If he was in agony, somebody down the road was in pure hell. With the invisible knife digging into his back, he fumbled through the shredded holes of his jacket. Incredibly, he found the 357 Magnum still hanging in its holster. 
Some sound he couldn't identify left his mouth, and he couldn't tell if he was laughing or crying. The mist started to clear as the pain reached some fiery point between his shoulder blades, digging up the back of his skull, cleaving his brain. What was he doing? He was actually crabbing along, delirious from pain or shock or both. Some big guy was down there, something like a rocket launcher in his hands. The man in black was adding yet another firestorm to that inferno, driving one series of explosions after another into whatever was left over from the crash. Impossible, he thought. One guy? He was lifting the 357 Magnum, thumbing back the hammer, when the sky fell. Something heavy that sent fresh bursts of fiery agony slamming into his lower back, pinning him there like a bug on a cork board. Peterson started to black out from the pain, but somehow the picture of one guy down there laying waste to his golden years of sun and fun drove him to crawl on. Stepping back up the highway, Boland squeezed little bulldozer's trigger and dumped one last explosion into the inferno. The soldier hoped that creating a hot wind blowing from the east would drive toxic fumes or radioactive contamination in the opposite direction. The soldier had already seen the figure crawling down the highway, trying to raise a big handgun. But the hardman was groaning in mindless agony, the gun shaking, clearly unable to draw a clear line of fire. Bolin listened to the firestorm and wondered if anything human could have possibly survived when he spotted a couple of guys who obviously had. He drew the 44 Magnum Desert Eagle, since Little Bulldozer was now spent. Two armed shadows were weaving around somewhere inside the tendrils of smoke. The executioner dropped them both with two quick taps of the hand cannon's trigger. The soldier turned toward the crawler. He saw the Black Hawk hovering at some distant point to the east, watching, waiting for the pickup. Bolin eased away from the cloying stink, the wind hurling the stench of what he suspected was toxic waste the other way. It was quite the mess he would leave behind but he was far from wrapping it up. If Bolin had anything to say about it, the worst was yet to come for any survivors of this conspiracy. He was already thinking ahead, hoping the enemy wouldn't get word by way of the media about this incident on an isolated stretch of desert highway. Bolin needed to touch base with Brognola as soon as he was in the air. Somehow, he needed the big fed to make sure this slaughter show was kept quiet as long as possible. The crawler looked like some great crimson slug to Bolin, his bomber jacket and jeans tattered from his dive to the highway. Bolin stopped a few feet away. <laughs> I was so close. I can't believe it. Believe it. You're finished. <laughs> yeah. A broken back's the least of my problems. Bolin heard the fire raging stronger during the silence as the doomed guy looked set to burst into tears. Where are the rest of them? Rest of who? The others. Where's the rest of you guys? Stole my retirement. The executioner lifted the Desert Eagle. We're it. The leader of God's Crusaders could feel the imaginary bullseye stuck to his back. Buck McClintock felt the trouble coming even before it showed up on the monitors. A few belts of bourbon didn't erase the images of gunmen boiling up, ready to storm the premises, raise the walls. The end was out there, moving in. He wasn't about to go out with a whimper. Was he just paranoid? Maybe someone had simply stumbled onto the grounds by mistake. It was dark out there, with the exception of a few lights fixed to the hangars, and they probably hadn't seen the posted no trespassing signs. No, his gut told him the end was on the way, and he didn't need Monroe, Jansen, or any other wannabe revolutionaries to tell him that. So he sat there in his office, barren except for his big teak desk, the mini wet bar, the hanging gun rack with its assortment of rifles, shotguns, and pistols, even as he heard Monroe sound the alarm. McClintock tipped back the glass and drained it. What was he thinking, sucking down the booze? This was the sort of crisis where he was expected to lead. Oh well. After he built another drink, he finally looked at Monroe. You said what? Jesus, Buck. I said the infrared beams have been broached. There's an invader out there. One guy? That was it? Lit up on the screen like some alien visitor from a distant galaxy? 
McClintock killed the drink, slammed the glass down. Maybe it was his desktop, even the floor. Who cared? Some uncontrollable rage took over, jolting him, warning him once again his own D-Day had arrived. It had been, what, a day or more since he'd gotten a call from the cutouts and sponsors? Standing around, wondering when it would hit the fan. Where was the rest of their money? No mystery, Arab. No greedy. Not so much as a kiss-off. Everyone's on their own. McClintock found himself staring at the wall, wondering where the hell it had gone wrong and why. Monroe, go take care of our mystery guest. I'm looking at one guy out there. He just made the east corner of hangar number one. Jansen watched the darkness, crouched on the edge of the rise, waiting to hear the order from McClintock. Their fearless leader, he thought, didn't sound so confident when his voice crackled over the radio. Proceed, Jansen. Muller and Jenkins are with you, right? They're on the way. What about that chopper I saw? What about it? That was a military bird I saw. Monroe's coming out there. If possible, I want you to take the intruder alive. Jansen took the infrared binox. He couldn't believe just one armed invader was looking to tackle more than 12 men. There had to be more gunmen, maybe more moving in from the hills. Jansen, you hear me? I heard you. He jumped, grabbing up his M16 as the shadows of Muller and Jenkins, making more noise than a Macy's parade, stumbled up behind him, their assault rifles poised, fanning this way and that. Both of them reeked of whiskey. Wonderful. They were being hit, and while those two were supposed to be guarding the fort, they were busy getting tanked. Morons. This God's Crusaders thing he thought was dead, and maybe he was long overdue to find a life. How many guys down there? Just one, Muller. One? Come on, Muller. Jenkins, you wait here for Monroe. M-16 in hand, Jansen set off down the incline. He gave the desert to the north one last search, but the big chopper that had dropped their mystery guest off was gone. Jansen listened to the silence down there. He didn't like it. Their guy was heading right their way. He was certain, a big assault rifle in his hands, tripping their electronic security devices, several of which were out in the open. It was as if this unknown gunman didn't care whether he sounded the alarm. It was spooky, but Jansen wasn't about to let one shooter put the fear of God into him. Bolin actually didn't care whether he sounded the alarm. The soldier wanted to bring the troops running straight into his gun sights. Aerial recon earlier in the day had provided him with detailed blow-ups of the compound. He had the lay of the land, his sights set on the ranch house in the distance. He needed a quick wrap here. There were still Richmond and Atlanta to consider, Greavy and Powers on the other end. He was making his way up the back of the hangar when he heard, then smelled them, as they edged up to the corner. Lowering the HK-33 to the ground, the squat rocket launcher loaded up and hung down his back. The warrior palmed the Beretta, the sound suppressor already snug in place on the muzzle. The few lights that hung along the hangar revealed them as they stepped around the corner. Two down. The executioner peered around the corner. At the top of the rise, he made out the shadow watching the hangar. The range mentally marked off. The soldier tapped the Beretta's trigger. There would be others. The number didn't matter. Little bulldozer would even the odds. Before moving up behind the hangars, Bolin had counted three aircraft parked on the tarmac. A twin-engine Cessna, a Bell Jet Ranger, and a Learjet. He was considering backtracking, unloading some of the C4 he'd brought to the party before making his final move on the main house. Or maybe he would just blow back into the hangars with Little Bulldozer. The latter made more sense at that point. Oh, shit! Monroe didn't know whether to report to McClintock that Jenkins was dead, grab the infrared binox, or proceed down the hill. He couldn't possibly know another decision altogether was about to be made for him. He looked down at the body, framed just barely in the moonlight, but it was a good enough view to spot the dark line of blood trickling from the hole in the side of Jenkins's head. He looked at the ranch house, spotted a few more heads near the SUVs. They were armed, but they were just standing there. What the hell were they waiting for? He was about to report to McClintock when he saw the big shadow rise no more than 10 feet away, some black wraith that seemed to just grow right out of the ground. The last thing he heard was a chug, and then the lights went out.
The executioner crouched beside his third victim, looked toward the main house. He counted maybe ten shadows, most of them grouped near the motor pool. A big man filled the doorway, barking out orders. Half the group began to fall back inside the house. The soldier decided it was time to announce his presence to the standing guard. McClintock ordered half his force back into the house. He couldn't raise Jansen or Monroe all of a sudden. The silence out there was fueling his paranoia. The shock waves knocked McClintock down in the foyer, where he skidded on his haunches. Somehow he managed to keep his hold on the M16. He was standing, survivors scrambling inside for the safety of the house. The second explosion tore into the heart of the motor pool. Another fireball blossomed out front. McClintock hauled himself into the sprawling game room. He was just in time to see a giant sheet of wreckage come hammering through the bay window. The executioner saw the runners retreating into the main house. They would take up defensive positions, wait for him to come to them. Fine. The soldier had more than enough firepower to bring down the house. Just in case a runner or two should make the airfield, he wasn't about to leave anything to chance. He heard them shouting, wondering out loud what the hell was going on as he forged down the runway. Little bulldozer in hand, he closed rapidly on the trio of birds. The night was lit up as fireballs took to the sky. As it rained fire and trash behind him, the executioner marched for the scrub land that would take him to their back door. It was far from a wrap, he knew, but the end here was in sight. Turn up the killing heat a few more degrees and the soldier could quit this place and move on to the next target. This was crazy, he told himself. This shouldn't be happening, but it was. All he wanted was to get the money, clear the premises, start a new life. Now his whole world was going straight to hell. McClintock was searching the area beyond the wavering band of firelight. It was all he could do not to shriek his outrage at the sight of the balls of fire climbing for the skies in the distance. He didn't need to see it to know his aircraft had just been blown off the face of the earth. This was some kind of military strike, some commando out there winging around grenades, dropping trained so-called professional former lawmen like they were nothing. All of them were being hunted like animals, and they were marked for extinction. Enough time was spent knocking out the aircraft, and enough of the edge of surprise was now lost that Boland knew he had to turn up the heat. Brognola and the farm had already run a background check on his enemies here. They were former FBI and ATF, with an ex-Secret Service agent from the previous administration heading up the path. As a general rule, the executioner didn't gun down lawmen, legitimate or not. He knew there were cops out there grabbing up a bag or two of dope before it went into the evidence locker, or getting greased to look the other way, even helping the criminal maintain his ongoing enterprise. Sometimes, though, even ironclad principles became little more than guidelines. Whatever these men had been, they had now become traitors, willing to sell out for a buck. They had long since spit on the oaths they had taken, retired or not, bounced out of their jobs or leaving under other circumstances, whatever, they had forfeited their right to any consideration from Bolin. Two extremists materialized in a doorway that looked as if it led to a kitchen. Crouched beneath a bay window, the soldier armed and let fly a frag bomb. He slipped into a narrow crevice beside the bay window when the metal egg blew. HK-33 leading his charge, ears ringing some, the soldier burst through the swirling cloud, jumping over sprawled bodies, the assault rifle sweeping, searching for fresh targets. He ran toward a source of light at the end of the hallway. Senses primed, he dropped an anti-personnel 40mm buckshot round into the M203. Auto fire was unleashed from some point in the living room, spraying the corner. Bolin dropped to one knee, pulling up a few feet from the corner as angry voices lashed the air. Hold your fire! He came in from the kitchen! Move it out there! The executioner pinned down the direction of the voices, knew he'd get only one shot before all hell broke loose again. He hit the floor, crabbed ahead, turned on his side as he made the edge. In a second, he saw a group of four make a beeline for cover behind the first pool table. The soldier sent the buckshot charge zipping their way, then threw himself back as auto fire opened up. Arming two more frag grenades, 
Bolin whipped his arm around the corner, lobbed the first one toward the foyer at the two runners, then chucked the second bomb toward the pool tables in the direction of the screamers. The executioner rolled out, the HK-33 fanning the smoke and the flying debris. A bloody figure staggered, choking out of the boiling cloud. Minus an arm, the hardman still tried to draw a bead on Bolin, the M-16 snapping a few rounds across the living room. Then the soldier cut loose, stitching a figure eight over the shooter's chest. The executioner checked his six. Clear. You. Who the f... Bolin stepped into the smoke. A big man shredded to scarlet ribbons by buckshot and shrapnel was stretched out on the last pool table. Bolin couldn't be sure who he was looking at, even though he'd mentally filed away Brognola's fax jacket with photo on the leader of God's Crusaders. You McClintock? Yeah, why? I just wanted the money. I was set to retire from this boat. Money, huh? I'm hearing that a lot these days. Must be a sign of the times. The guy was delirious, going fast, lost in the ashes of his dead dream. Sheriff, a lot of good he did me. The soldier gave the carnage a last look, hearing nothing but the firestorm raging outside. A room-to-room -room sweep, covering all points of the compound, and Bolin found he was alone with the dead. After calling in his ride, the soldier entered McClintock's office. An aluminum briefcase on the desk caught his eye. Inside were rubber-banded stacks of cash and a few computer disks in leather pouches. ETA for the jet was five minutes, so Boland booted up the computer. He assumed McClintock would have whatever was on file coded, but found that wasn't so. Before he knew it, he was reading about the organization called God's Crusaders, names of operatives, backgrounds, duties, and other data. Scrolling on, he read a running diary, complete with routes the terrorist cargo would take from Oklahoma, Richmond, and Atlanta. Looked like the bulk of McClintock's followers were drivers or watchdogs, and the name Greavy popped up on the file. Blackmail on SCTU's field general in case it hit the fan? Some more blood money going into McClintock's pocket? Bolin wasn't surprised. The soldier was in the act of dropping the disc in his pocket, when he heard movement in the living room. Holy! I want to see the army that done this! Bolin stepped through the doorway. That would be me. They wheeled, started to swing their revolvers at the soldier, when they froze at the sight of the assault rifle already trained on them. Lose the guns. They hesitated, thinking about it, but knew they were SOL, then dropped their revolvers. One big fat guy in a Stetson, a short skinny version of the law to his side, the county's Abbott and Costello. Cautious, Bolin stepped across the living room, the HK-33 aimed at a point between the two lawmen. You alone? No reply. Yeah, we're alone! Shut up, Biff! You must be the sheriff that McClintock was talking about. You did this? You killed all these men? Cuff the sheriff. Why, you son of Okay, okay! Okay, Biff. You get on the floor, too. Now I suppose you're gonna kill us, too. Bolin snapped the cuffs on Biff. No. But I'm gonna make a suggestion you'll want to consider very seriously. Tomorrow, both of you will retire. You're crazy. I just might be. Crazy enough to come back to your fine county. Maybe pay you a quiet visit some midnight when you're tucked in bed and counting McClintock's money instead of sheep. Thing is, if I come back here and find either of you still wearing a badge, I'll be very unhappy. And we don't want to see you unhappy, is that it? Sounds like we understand each other. The executioner left them to ponder their next career moves. Outside, he found their cruiser. Just in case they freed themselves somehow, Bolin held back on the assault rifle's trigger, hosing down the interior, reducing the radio to sparking ruins, then shot out the tires. The lone warrior found his ride touching down in the distance as he moved off for the low hill that would take him to the airfield. Richmond was next on the executioner's hit list. Atlanta. You what? Greavy listened as Powers handed off the lame explanation. All day they'd holed up in the apartment, putting in the obligatory call to SCTU command in Atlanta. Jeffries, 
apparently, was flying down, armed with a list of angry questions about the sudden AWOL status of his top field commanders. Agents Riley and Burton should be here any minute. If it makes you feel any better, I ordered one of my own people, Stanton, to come along for the ride. I figured I owed them a talk, try to clear up a few matters. Deflection, that's all. You actually gave them the location of this place? I'm assuming we're leaving shortly? We would've been gone already. Now this. Hey, understand, we can't have a few nervous guys tailing us out to the airport. So what are you intending to do? Grievy didn't need to ask. The colonel's bags were heaped on the table in the dining room, just on the other side of the wall. The nylon dip pouch opened. Just get them to talking. Find out what they know, or think they know. By the way, something's bugging me about our drop to the ocean. What? Powers went to the kitchen and helped himself to a beer. How in the world are we going to get out the door of that jet without getting sliced and diced in the engines? It was all Grievy could do to keep from bolting for the door, running from this maniac. It's already taken care of. How? I had a section of the floorboard in the cabin of all the jets redesigned, cut out. A hole in the floor? A chute. A small ramp will jump down, slide off. We'll clear, no problem. Powers smiled around his beer. Like I've been saying, you got all the answers. Anything else? There they are. Powers faded away into the dining room, rounding the corner. Grievy sucked in a deep breath, heart racing, sure he would find himself staring down assault rifles when he opened the door, that it was over. Jeffries knew about the colonel's ideas on urban renewal thanks to Belasco. Grievy considered pulling the Glock, ready to blast his way outside, make the car, tear ass for the Leland Airfield. He looked through the peephole instead. He calmed down some, the pounding in his chest subsiding to a sick flutter at the sight of the three SCTU men standing there, no weapons in hand. Come on in, gentlemen. Was that suspicion on their faces? He tried not to look at them, aware why Powers had called them here. He knew they weren't much older than thirty, wives and kids, all three of them. He wanted to be sick, but he'd come too far now to let a few kids stand in his way. You guys want something to drink? Riley? No, sir. Have a seat. Grievy held an arm toward the couch. Burton folded his arms. If you don't mind, sir, we'll stand. You want to tell me what this is all about? Commander Grievy, after the colonel informed us you were here... Uh, wh where is the colonel, sir? In the can, Stanton. He'll be out in a minute. Something was seriously wrong here. Riley, get to the point. I don't know how to tell you this, sir. So just say it. The word is that Commander Jeffries is en route as we speak. En route to where? Here? The command center? He's just left Logan, sir. We don't know all the particulars, but word is he had a long talk with the Justice Department. More silence. The three of them trying to say something without saying it. They were on the verge of dropping some bomb. Rumor, sir. It, it's just rumor. Commander Jeffries hinted at some suspicions about the three previous operations. He did some investigating. He wanted to know why Colonel Powers wasn't on hand for the last raid. Uh, sir, there was, um, how do I say, a mass murder in Roxbury. The room threatened to spin as Grievy heard how an eyewitness to the Colonel's butcher run had given Powers' his description, a sketch artist doing a spitting image composite of the rampaging killer from Roxbury in question. The colonel, who had worked some with Boston police, he knew, was well known to the cops. Boston cops laid out their suspicions to Commander Jeffries not more than a few hours ago. Jeffries was finding gaping holes in the latest proposed strike by SCTU, ordered by Grevy and Powers. The snow job had melted, Grevy knew. So what's the bottom line? Sir, I'm afraid that... Riley never finished the ultimatum Grevy knew was coming. It died on his lips as Powers came around the corner. Grievy dived out of the way. <coughs> Despite the extended sound suppressor on the HKNP5, it sounded like some great trumpet blast in Grievy's ears, a death knell that would have the neighbors dialing 911. Stanton nearly cleared the Beretta from inside his coat. He died wheeling toward Powers, a look of confusion on his face as the man he'd followed from the military and beyond cut him down where he stood. Grievy looked up at Powers, as cold as ice, the colonel inspecting the slaughter, something close to admiration in his eyes. Believe it or not, I really hated to do that. Stanton was a fine soldier. 
Greavy picked himself up and watched for a moment as Powers towed the dead, confirming his kills. <sighs> now can we leave? I keep getting show-me-the-money from these guys, and it's really pissing me off, Hal. I hear you, Striker. Bolin strapped into the two-man cockpit of the bat-shaped B-2 stealth, listened as Hal Brognola gave him the latest update, taking in the star-lit black heavens beyond the canopy. The Big Fed's teams were monitoring the Leland properties in Richmond and Atlanta, with hazmat units on standby. Virginia and Georgia State Police and the FBI were alerted to both situations, but only on Brognola's need-to-know orders. All buildings within a six-square-block radius of targeted warehouses had been quietly evacuated and roads sealed off. McClintock's driver handlers and their terrorist cargo had yet to bail either location. Thanks to McClintock, Bolin had already passed on the final destinations where the murder crews would be offloaded. If they pulled out before the soldier could carry out the presidential order to terminate them all, Brognola would act with all available resources at hand. At this point, Bolin and Brognola agreed there was no way any one terrorist would reach his destination, even if that meant a whole army of feds and local cops shooting up the trucks, everything short of calling in an airstrike if the trucks managed to ram themselves through barricades. The possible scenarios were grim. They were clearly faced with suicide armies in both cities, and people were going to die, no matter what. If the trucks made the interstates, they weren't going to be traveling any lonely desert highways the possibility of hazardous waste getting dumped on well-traveled roads or innocent people getting caught in some running gun battle between Brognola's forces and the bad guys or maybe the terrorists would just set the trucks off rolling time bombs plowing into some populated area Bolin understood and he didn't need to spell out his own sense of urgency to get to the next stop there was worse news Boston PD wanted Colonel Powers for questioning and the killings of more than 20 people in the Roxbury area. Commander Jeffries and Brognola had been in touch, Jeffries laying out his suspicions, but the Big Fed told the man the Greavy Powers situation was under control. Part of the problem was that the two men had gone to ground. Jeffries was on the warpath, thinking some great conspiracy had been played out under his nose or that the Justice Department had duped him. He vowed he would be in Atlanta ASAP marshalling every resource at his disposal to find Greavy and Powers. Brognola had a team watching the Leland Airfield in Atlanta, where a jet appeared, fueled and ready to go. No one had bothered to log a flight plan for the jet in question. The soldier could already imagine Greavy and Powers slipping through the net. They'll try to leave the country. We both know that, Hal. So what do I do, Stryker? Say they show up. Have my guys put them under arrest when they try to board the jet? No. Do whatever it takes to monitor that flight. AWACS, a squad of F-15s, I don't care. I want to know where they land. I think we've already got some idea. Using the intel you got in Sudan, Bear traced three separate money wires from the late Omani Sheikh's Swiss account to the Caymans. Alert the Coast Guard, Customs, and every military base in Florida. Do not have your men approach Grevy and Powers. That'll just get them killed. If we can shut the operation down, the world's not big enough to hide Grevy and Powers. I'll find them. I get the feeling this is going to get real ugly. It's already real ugly. But one more thing. My Richmond team sent along some photos they took of a man who's been showing up at Leland Trucking off and on all day. He's been positively ID'd. Mohammed Amin. Syrian. The CIA had him under suspicion in Oman a few years back as a courier, a bagman for various terrorist organizations in the Middle East. He was more into recruiting new blood for the Jihad, establishing weapons pipelines, shoring up the finer details, such as phony passports and visas. The Interpol, the CIA, the FBI, and Mossad have charges on this guy that stretch clear across the Atlantic. Guess who wined and dined him when he was a guest in Oman? A grim, weary smile stretched on Boland's lips. And the first two guesses don't count? <laughs> Mohammed Amin was tired of waiting for the phone to ring. Something was wrong, and he needed to go to the contingency plan. One of the Americans came toward him across the warehouse, his sarcasm only fueling the anger and fear Amin already felt gnawing his insides. Staring at it won't make it ring. The American's name was Blake, the driver of the Richmond truck. 
Amin resisted the urge to take the Makarov pistol out and fire the fat right off his belly, aware he would need the Americans' demolitions expertise. We've got problems, and that phone call's just one of them. Amin tried to ignore the American, but knew it was pointless. The truck had been sitting in the loading bay for hours, its cargo of freedom fighters getting impatient, a few of them even having the audacity to bang on the walls and demand to know when they were leaving, when they could eat. He was beginning to consider doing something drastic, even if that meant scaling down the number of attacks, limiting them to the closest cities or towns, anything, just to get it all launched somehow. A dead infidel anywhere was one less future enemy and oppressor of his people. Perhaps it didn't matter if they died in New York City or some small town in the Virginia countryside. We've got cops. Looks like maybe FBI down the street watching us. The Syrian stared at the American. His mind was racing, wondering why the West Coast-bound unit hadn't called in at the appointed hour. Now cops were outside? How do you know? Because I used to be one, that's how. Open the truck. What? Hey, we should be rolling. Should have left... I want the detonators fixed to all the charges. One main radio frequency on a remote control box that I have. What are you waiting for? You know how long that will take to prime all those charges? You're looking at maybe two hours at least before Just you... do it! Hey, I'll do it, but you can get yourself another driver. I'm not here to commit suicide. Fine, go! The American grumbled something, but Amin wasn't listening. He went to a deep corner of the warehouse and opened a crate he had reserved for himself, ignoring the worried looks on the faces of his two men. He shed his jacket and quickly dug out the vest with its C4 bundles, wrapped it around his chest, and fastened the Velcro straps on the front. He was forced to hang the shoulder holster at an awkward cant over his chest. He palmed the smaller remote box and dropped it in the left pocket of his suit coat. Abdullah, go out there. See if what the American says is true. And if it is the FBI? Amin knew he had no choice. It was a shame, he thought, but he might never find himself walking into a throng of infidels on some crowded street to the north. He might just end up taking out as many American lawmen as possible, clearing the way for his truck to blow itself up somewhere in Richmond. Then we will begin the jihad ourselves, here and now. The Bell Jet Ranger soared in on the Richmond skyline from the southeast. Bolin had been in near constant radio contact with Special Agent Cowlins since his stealth had touched down at Langley Air Base. From Norfolk, Bolin felt each minute turn into an agonizing eternity. As promised, a fresh black suit flight crew was on hand at Langley, and Brognola had delivered the necessary ammo to beef up the soldiers' depleted supply of firepower. The warehouse complex in question was a quarter mile east of I-95. Poorly lit rows of red brick and concrete buildings came into Boland's sight as he stood in the rotor wash of the cabin doorway. Boland's justice contact informed him they'd been made, but for some reason, Cowlin stated, the terrorists had opened the back doors to the truck, disappearing inside for nearly the past two hours. Boland now ordered them to fall back and hold their positions, no matter what. Boland couldn't be sure, but something nagged him about the setup. If the enemy knew they were being watched, they might have decided to just rig the truck to blow, sending toxic or radioactive waste flying around. The soldier had no choice but to risk exposure once again. With countless innocent lives hanging in the balance, if the soldier had to sacrifice himself in order to take the enemy down, so be it. Brognola would have to carry the torch from there on. Bolin moved to the cockpit, told his black suit crew to make a wide angle to the west, then come in from that direction, more or less, on the blind side of the enemy. There was only one truck here to deal with, and only one SUV and a sedan making up the motor pool. From their surveillance positions in an evacuated office building three blocks east, Cowlins filled Bolin in on the action. The truck's doors were being shut. They were pulling out. Bolin marched into the wind, gusting through the open doorway. The executioner looped the HK-33 around his shoulder and filled his hands with little bulldozer. Amin wondered what the FBI, or whoever they were, was waiting for as Abdullah drove them out between the long rows of darkened warehouses, the truck following closely behind. The main gate was open, and all looked clear to the street beyond, which would take them to the interstate. Nothing, Amin thought, would stop them now. The larger of his two remote control boxes was in his right pocket, the smaller box he was hoping to use only as a last resort. If he was forced to, he wouldn't hesitate to blow the truck halfway across Richmond. 
He was wondering if there was enough explosive inside to take out at least a few square blocks and regretting that the last of the toxic and radioactive waste had gone west. Amin glanced in the side view mirror just in time to see the cab of the truck go up in flames. Every single window around him seemed to blow a storm of glass in his face. It didn't take but a heartbeat for Amin to realize some of the slivers had gouged into his right eye. Amin knew it was finished, that they'd never reached the interstate. He somehow got the door open, glimpsed Abdullah out of the stinging haze in his one good eye, slumped over the wheel. The sedan was racing for the concrete wall of a loading dock. Amin flung himself into the wind. The chopper swung away from the roof, and the soldier drew a bead with the squat rocket launcher and began firing as soon as he hit the edge. The truck's cab went first as Bolin pumped out two 40-millimeter rounds. The cab seemed to shear itself away from its cargo mounting, the housing behind it rearing up and through the fireball, then slamming down on the asphalt. The executioner already had the HK-33 in hand, running on, firing at the sedan, taking out passenger and back windows with a raking burst, then drilling 5.56-millimeter rounds through the roof, going for the driver. He scored the wheelman at least as the sedan swerved, roaring on a collision course with a concrete dock. A figure tumbled out the passenger door, found his feet, then headed for a garbage bin. The trailing SUV clipping the lead luxury vehicle's back end when Bolin caught the mixed bag of frantic English and Arabic shouting to clear the area below. The back doors were flopping open, the cargo disgorging, flailing about, most of them limping, but all of them screaming that he was going to blow the whole thing up. The executioner was racing across the roof when the sky lit up behind him in pure fire and rolling thunder. The door to the wooden housing that led to the stairwell looked flimsy enough, but Bolin wasn't taking any chances. He hit the trigger on the M203, blew the door away on the fly with a 40 millimeter blast. He could feel the superheated wind racing up from behind, heard it screaming like some living army of demons from across the roof as he hurled himself into the smoke. Bolin found himself tumbling down a short flight of steps, saw the glow of firelight framing a window as he rolled up on a landing. He felt and heard the volcanic eruption of the firestorm heading his way, could well imagine it taking out the warehouse facing, cleaving up the entire length of the roof. The executioner shielded his face with the HK-33 and launched himself through the window as rubble and fire poured into the stairwell above. The open dumpster garbage bin, heaped with boxes, broke Boland's fall. After rolling over the lift, the soldier had hugged the face of the bin. It curved on an angle, up and out, and he found himself covered as the sky dumped loads of rubble for a full minute before the pounding subsided to a few flying bricks chinking off the alley floor. The executioner stood and moved off down the alley. If anything survived out front, it would be a pure fluke. He found his handheld radio intact, raised Cowlins for a sit rep. The agent's voice sounded shaky, no casualties on their end. They'd hit the deck, but a few of them were good and dinged up from flying glass and debris. Cowlins asked for Boland's position, and the soldier told him. A note of urgency or disbelief broke through the ringing in Boland's head when he heard Cowlins inform him one survivor with a pistol and holding something in his other hand was heading the soldier's way. Cowlins said he was looking through his field glasses, and a moment later he confirmed a Mohammed Amin sighting. Boland picked up the pace, HK-33 out front and sweeping the smoke ahead. The blast had been so powerful, Boland spotted entire sections of the back ends of the warehouse walls that had been knocked down. Boland hacked out some of the grit and biting smoke, anxious to cut off Amin and end it. He slowed his pace, lifting the assault rifle, when the shadow limped into sight. Amin! The shadow whirled toward Boland, limped a few feet deeper into the mouth of the alley. The Syrian held something up in his left hand. Do not come any closer! Even from here I can blow us both up! Halting, Boland spied a hole in the wall about three yards off. I know you Americans have no wish to die. You will let me go. I don't think so. What? <laughs> you stupid fool! I'll kill us both! We both die! You first! <laughs> Boland hurled himself through the hole in the wall. As soon as Bolin was back in the cockpit of the stealth southbound, he got the bad news. The last terrorist unit had turned a chunk of Atlanta into a flaming kill zone. 
Boland found at least three or four blocks of the warehouse district in flames as his chopper lowered past the East Expressway. He shook his head. Bognola had passed on the story of the disaster. A police unit on routine patrol in the neighborhood of the Leland Trucking Warehouse called in that they had spotted three men with assault rifles watching two 18-wheelers getting loaded up with crates. Other armed men were moving into the cargo hold. SCTU was monitoring all local and state police bands from their downtown post. Luther Jeffries, determined to track down Grevy and Powers, had gone in with the team and the inevitable gun battle broke out. Armored SWAT vehicles rolled onto the premises. The terrorists, seeing the end of their jihad, made suicide runs for the police and SCTU and SWAT barricades, blowing themselves up. Not even Brognola knew the body count. And the word was Jeffries himself had gone down in a hail of gunfire. Finally, the terrorists had apparently mined the Leland warehouse. When SWAT and SCTU moved in, the whole warehouse went up, taking out about 10 police cruisers, two adjacent warehouses, and a nearby office complex. When the chopper touched down beyond the ring of fire, Bolin hopped out. The soldier's face was a bruised mask of cuts, scratches, and dried blood. It was over. He couldn't even begin to count up the number of dead, some covered with blankets, others just left in the heat of the firestorm. Paramedics were scurrying around, checking bodies for a pulse. Somewhere high above the rising smoke clouds, Bolin spotted the police choppers. They hovered or dipped into crisscrossing patterns, searchlights spanning wide areas. Hey, I know you. Bolin turned and saw a black-suited shadow emerging from a swirling mist of smoke and light. It took a moment, but Bolin recognized the face of one of the SCTU commandos from the garage in Boston. Justice guy. Special Agent Belasco, right? Bolin nodded. Where's Commander Jeffries? I heard he was hit. The commando jabbed a finger toward a row of body bags. Pick one. You know, I heard that Grevy and Powers might have had a part in this massacre. If you justice people had spoken up and shared a little intel with us peasants, this might have been avoided. What could he say to that, Bolin wondered. Sure, he could stand there and bounce around a dozen or more, maybe, scenarios. Maybe if he'd just shot Powers in that alley. Maybe if he'd had Brognola circle the wagons and send in the guns. Skip it. Bolin knew that if he hadn't proceeded as he had, a whole lot more innocent people would have perished. Or maybe if the forces here had held back and a solid plan had been put on the drawing board, instead of three or four different outfits bullying ahead, getting in each other's way. Nice work, Belasco. Maybe you need to stay behind a desk where you belong. The guy stormed off. Bolin held his tongue. The Coast Guard found the wreckage about an hour ago. Some point in what's called the Tongue of the Ocean, almost smack between Eleuthera and Andros. No bodies recovered. Another smokescreen, Hal. Bolin had taken temporary refuge in a motel on the outskirts of Atlanta to rest, regroup, and wait for word about Grevian powers. The only good news at the moment was that the dominoes on the edges of the conspiracy were toppling. Bolin's thoughts were somewhere else, down in the Caribbean to be exact, and he vaguely heard his friend go down the list of agencies and names found on confiscated disks who were getting snapped up by the Justice Department. He did, though, catch the note of cold anger in Brognola's voice when the big Fed informed him how either Grevy or Powers or both had just walked up to the agency he had placed at the airfield and mowed them down in cold blood. These guys are mad dogs, Stryker. When I think about how many innocent people have died, how many agents and cops have been killed in the line of duty... Brognola let it trail off. Bolin understood. He felt the same way. He wanted to be the one to hunt them down, though, and made that clear to the big Fed. I'm already on it. I got all available resources doing round-the-clock surveillance of an area that reaches all the way from the Florida Keys to Venezuela and Colombia. The only chance they have of getting away is if they're picked up by the mothership and flown out of the galaxy. I still think it would be a good idea to freeze their bank account, Stryker. No. When I find them, I don't want them to have the first clue I'm coming. We'll do it your way. Now, here's what I've been able to line up to get you moving again while you're on hold and waiting for a sighting of those two. Enjoying your second day on the beach, Colonel? Powers smiled, sank a little deeper into the lounge chair, then reached over and plucked an open beer out of the cooler. 
Indeed I am. Blue skies, green water, white sand, cooler full of cold ones, a handful of Havanas, money in the bank. Already sampled some of the local Bahama talent, and I have to tell you, it's nice to know this old war horse can still put a grin on a young girl's face. <laughs> what more could a man ask for? A shadow fell over Powers, and he peered over the top of his shades at Greeby. His holstered glock jutted out over his aloha shirt, and dark shades didn't mask the dark scowl on his face. Hey, you're blocking out my son. Greeby didn't move. For some reason, I never quite pictured you in a pair of Speedos. Hey, like they say, if you got it... The operation never went down, Colonel. Put that in your nut huggers and give it a squeeze. I was beginning to think it never would anyway. Too many people were involved. I said that from the beginning. But like I've been saying, you've got all the answers. True enough. That was then. Now maybe you need to start thinking about something other than your tan. The operation from the Sudan to the U.S. was 86th. By who or what, I don't know. You're getting a picture of our problem here, Colonel? Some of the people who helped us along the way have been busted by the Justice Department. Justice Department, eh? Next, I suppose Belasco's going to come swimming ashore, pointing a spear gun at us, telling us we're under arrest. This isn't some joke. I'd tighten it up if I were you. Yeah. You know, I was sitting here thinking, soon enough I'm going to get bored. Most likely I'll take myself right off this island. You'll have the whole place to yourself. Could be it's best that way. You know how far Yankee dollars will go on Caracas, Bogota, Buenos Aires, Rio? I could live like a king the rest of my life. Instead of watching you stand there, blocking my son, fucking with my head, wringing your hands like a little girl. Now, why don't you relax? Put on some trunks. Take a dip. The hard part's over. It's easy street from here on. Okay, Colonel, fine. Enjoy the sun. Go on, take your nap. I mean, I'm only the guy who set up this whole operation, landed us this little slice of heaven. Radar, sat dish, all the electronic surveillance and scanning gear. Listen to yourself. Now, I suppose you'll tell me I haven't kicked in my fair share. Do what you want. You're going to anyway. The sun again blazed in the colonel's face. He turned in his chair and watched as Greavy tromped up the sand, headed for the compound. Back to CNN or watching the radar screens or whatever. Powers killed two quick beers, forcing himself to relax and listen to the waves. Everything was beautiful. He put Greavy and all his fears out of his mind and finally felt like he could fall asleep. He figured some music, turned up to a decent volume, would help put him under. He slipped on the headphones, opened his CD box behind the cooler. What the hell, he figured. Some classic rock and one more beer. He felt his eyes grow heavy, the smile twisting one corner of his mouth, the sun on his face like a lover's touch as he drifted off. We've got them. It was late in the morning of his second day on Great Eczema when Commander Brockton, DEA Section Chief of Bahama Sector 1 Midway, made the announcement. Bolin was pivoting away from the computer-enhanced digital wall map of the Bahamas to South America, a number of keys and islands already flashing red where known pirates and drug runners used them as way stations or hideouts. Once again, Bolin had Brognola to thank for getting him down here. Bolin had poured over more aerial photos, map grids, even flying along for hours on end with the DEA, when he started to have some doubts. The Bahamas was an archipelago of roughly 700 islands, almost 2,500 islets and keys, stretching northwest to southeast for some 760 miles. Bolin was beginning to give up hope the combined resources of the DEA, CIA, the U.S. Navy, Customs and Coast Guard could pin down his quarry from a mere air search alone. It helped to have some eyes in the sky, but Bolin had been forced to wait for the necessary satellite passover of the Bahamas. It was done. Almost. Commanding Special Agent Brockton came through the doorway of the prefab corrugated outpost, went up to the wall map and pointed to an area due west of the Caicos. Then he handed Bolin an 8x11 color blow-up. The expression on his face must have been all too easy to read. Right. There's your guy, this bastard, Colonel Powers, sitting on a beach on this little island, not much more than a sand spit, really. Word is some businessman bought it from a crooked cop in New Providence a while back, then turned around and sold it to two Americans about a year ago. The latest budget allocation for our war on drugs brought us a Raven EF-111A. It primarily detects hostile radar, and the radar is letting up my Raven screens like a pinball machine. I'll spare you the particulars. 
I know you're anxious to be on your way. This other sheaf of pigs details every square inch of their little nest down there. Bolin looked at the map, gauging distance, travel time by chopper, and eventually boat, putting together an attack strategy when Commander Brockton rushed to assist once again. This should help you out, Agent Belasco. I took the liberty of marking off a point of penetration on the northwest edge of the island. Little cove, plenty of rocks there to conceal you, should you decide to swim in. The Raven tells me there's only two pieces of electronic surveillance in the trees from that point on. One heat, one laser sensor. I marked them off, too. A little trail cuts to what looks like a big hut, a couple hundred yards to the south. Maybe they figured the rocks and lack of white sandy beach on the north side would discourage a landing. What do you need? I could use a wetsuit, rebreather, a fast boat and a fast chopper, and a waterproof bag to stow my weapons and gear. Look, I've got an outpost right here on the edge of North Caicos. I can have you choppered there and have a cigarette boat some drug dealer no longer has any use for on standby. Save you a whole lot of time if you were planning on taking a boat ride from here. Bolin smiled from the heart for the first time in what felt like a hundred years and offered his hand. They shook. I appreciate all of your help, Commander. Yeah, well, I've heard that this Colonel Powers pulled a dirty stunt involving a couple of CIA guys down in Panama during that operation to grab Noriega. Rumor has it he and a couple of spooks helped themselves to a small plane load of coke after a failed hostage rescue attempt to free some Americans. My gut's telling me the reason you're here has something to do with those terrorist attacks back in the States, and that Powers was involved in that too. This guy's an animal, and he needs to be in a cage. Grievy tried to keep the panic off his face, but the object on their radar screen was coming in low and hard, aimed right for the northwest end of their island. A quick head count, wishing there were a few more guns than what they'd brought. Grievy pulled up the bamboo door on the floor of the living room, growling at someone to give him a hand. An extra pair of hands slipped into the narrow space, and grunting, Grievy hauled the large steamer trunk out of the floor, dumped it at his feet. He opened it, took an M16 with an M203 grenade launcher for himself. No way would he get caught short on firepower. If it was a Coast Guard plane, a DEA chopper even, he would blow it out of the sky, run and hop one of the cigarette boats on the other side of the island, be in Caracas by nightfall. Grievy headed for the open doorway, peering past the palm fronds hanging from the front porch. At a time like this, it would be helpful to have the Colonel's services. All that so-called military expertise, killing gusto, just in case a problem was, in fact, landing in paradise. But Grievy found the colonel slumped in his chair, one arm hanging over the side, head lolling, mouth open. At first, he would have sworn the colonel was dead. <laughs> Screw him, Grievy thought. If it is nothing... I'll just have to listen to more of his crap about how he's the only one here with a real pair. If it is something, then I'll handle it. Come back and I get to do some chuckling. <laughs> Grievy found he was the only one laughing. A hollow sound, trailing off for the wall of jungle vegetation, swallowed up by the cawing of wild birds. As soon as the soldier was hunkered down in a narrow clearing off the trail, hidden by vegetation, he tapped the button on his comlink. A vibrating signal was bounced back, telling him the crew of the Sea Stallion was on the way to get the enemy nervous and running. Bolin waited, scouring the trail in both directions. From the direction of his penetration, he heard the hard chop of water spraying against the boulder-strewed inlet. Nothing the other way. From the DEA dock at North Caicos, Bolin had ridden in by a cigarette boat to a predetermined drop-off point two miles out to sea, then gone over the port side after a check of the shoreline through his field glasses, the boat never slowing. It was a hard dunk into the water, but Bolin wanted it to look like nothing more than some speed jockey or maybe a drug runner out there, in case eyes were watching from shore. Coming ashore, climbing deeper into the rocky inlet, he shed flippers, mask, tank, and wetsuit, his skin-tight black suit worn underneath. A water-tight nylon bag contained his combat harness and weapons. The commander had been right about the lack of surveillance on this end of the island. So far, Bolin hadn't detected anything other than the two surveillance boxes hidden by foliage, right where Brockton had indicated them on the map. The soldier heard rotor blades, saw the foliage shimmy as the sea stallion went into its decoy maneuver. It came to a hovering point at the end of the trail leading out to the beach. 
HK-33 in hand, the executioner lowered the assault rifle when he thought he heard the rustle of clothes on leaves of the trail. He definitely heard someone grunting, maybe nearly tripping as he sensed the enemy picking up the pace. Reaching for the sound-suppressed Beretta, he expected them to send out one, maybe two hardmen to check out the blip on their screens. He didn't count on finding damn near a full squad marching past his point of view. Slow it down. Bolin held his breath, the shadows creeping by one by one. Five. Six. Then he glanced up and found that it was Greavy who was growling out the orders. Bolin crouched lower in the frond leaves as Greavy started to turn in his direction, eyes wild and looking around. The man slowly walked on. The soldier waited as they kept moving past. HK-33 in hand, he reared up, glanced back down the trail and found it clear. He managed to drop four right off, his line of slugs chewing through the heart of their ranks, up spines, shattering skulls. But at least three hard men were already looking to get off the trail, moving with the desperation of doomed men who still believed they had life left worth fighting for. Bolin winged two of them, small comfort when ragged bits flew from their shoulders, since he had the full and raging attention of survivors. The soldier was plowing ahead through vegetation, filling his hands with little bulldozer as a locust storm of steel-jacketed lead ate up the vegetation behind him. No time to accurately sight and seek out clear targets, the soldier began pumping out 40 millimeter grenades. Bolin dropped the spent rocket launcher, rammed a fresh magazine into the assault rifle, and stepped out onto the trail. He hadn't gotten a clean look at every face, but as he rolled over the dead with the toe of his boot or the smoking muzzle of his assault rifle, he didn't find powers. Something moved in the dense brush ahead. The bloody thing rolled out. Bolin saw the eyes widen in recognition. He couldn't be sure if it was anger or bewilderment he saw, but Bolin didn't care. Greavy stared at Bolin, spent his last breath on earth looking as if he'd been cheated out of something. Then the executioner hit him with a quick burst of permanent vacation. Primed for anything, the soldier fanned the HK-33 down the side of what appeared to be an upgraded sprawling Quonset hut. Somehow this picture of paradise, with its allure of peace and serenity, the birds, beach, and coconuts, didn't jibe with the kind of men the warrior had left strewed down the trail. He began to wonder if Powers was even on the island. Of course, the colonel could be heading out to sea in one of three boats the commander's raven had picked up. The executioner spotted the figure in the lounge chair just as he mounted the front steps to the big hut. The sun was setting by now, but the glassy smooth waters beyond the white carpet of beach still winked like countless glittering diamonds as they mirrored dying daylight. Why wasn't the colonel moving, Bolin wondered, as he slowly worked his way down the beach. Half of the soldier's focus was fixed on the wall of tropical vegetation to his side, wondering if a few gunmen were concealed there. There was no itch, though, between his shoulder blades. Advancing, Bolin noted the headphones attached to a CD player, then heard the snoring. The colonel had slept right through the mop-up. As the soldier walked up behind Powers, he spotted the Beretta under a dirty magazine. He hooked a finger through the headphones, tugged them off the colonel's head, and tossed the whole thing out to sea. Bolin had the HK-33's muzzle up and aimed at Powers' face as the man jerked awake. You'll never make it. The warrior saw about six different expressions cross the colonel's face. The man's head most likely buzzing with a slew of questions, eyes behind the aviator shades searching for some exit. Caught napping. But hey, what's to worry? This isn't Roxbury, right? Velasco. I bet that's not your real name. I bet you're no G-man either. It's over, Colonel. Is it? You want a beer, Velasco? I got some cigars. Some of Fidel's finest right there. Maybe later. Couldn't just kill me in cold blood, huh? Kind of like Roxbury. You're wondering what the hell happened. Where did I go wrong? Why would a war hero sell out? Maybe thinking, if you'd gunned me down in Boston, a whole lot of lives would have been spared. Bolin wasn't there to spill his guts to this traitor. He did, though, silently admit he'd perhaps made the wrong call in Boston. It was rare when the executioner second-guessed himself, but had it not been for Sudan, he caught himself, 
aware this journey through hell had carved a big piece out of him somewhere deep inside, seeing animal man sink to new lows where greed and desire were concerned. Okay, Belasco. I take you sent Greavy and his vaunted security to the happy hunting ground. One way of putting it. I'd offer you money to let me go, but I get the impression that you're not for sale. Could have made it big on one of those psychic hotlines, Colonel. <laughs> I was getting tired of Greavy and the others anyway. This island was getting real small. It was just never meant to be. I guess so. Now what, Belasco? Poland let the muzzle drift a few inches off the mark. I think you know. Paradise lost. That's the way it has to be. Whatever beast raged inside the man roared just enough to the surface to tip Bolin off that the colonel was going for it. The executioner let the spent clip fall. The surf rolled past Bolin, absorbing the crimson runoff, taking the blood of the savage out to sea. On the way past the sprawled body, which flopped once and rolled into the surf, Bolin helped himself to one of the colonel's Havanas. He might smoke it later, but right then, he just wanted off that island. No matter how many versions of paradise on earth were offered up his way, looking to entice him into something else than what he was, the executioner could take some small comfort he'd never become what the surf was now picking up to carry out to sea. It wouldn't be long now, and the hungry predators out there would give one of their own a fitting burial. Poland, Deep Treachery is a graphic audio production. Copyright 2006, The Cutting Corporation. Performed by Jeff Baker, Terence Aselford, Nanette Savard, Richard Rowan, Casey Jones, Thomas Penny, David Coyne, Christopher Walker, and Mort Shelby. Additional red shirts performed by The Dead Giveaways. Directed by Nanette Savard. Vocal editing and graphic audio sound design by Christian Parent and Matt Webb. Script adapted for graphic audio by Nanette Savard. The Mac Bolin theme was composed by Chris Rowan. Additional original music by Matt Webb, Nathaniel Perry, Chris Rowan, and Derek R. Audette. Produced by Rick Rowan and Dwayne Beeman. Executive producers, James Cutting, Mary Cutting, and Angie Cornett. If you enjoyed Mac Bolin, be sure to look for Don Pendleton's Stony Man and The Executioner. Keep listening for exciting previews of other graphic audio thrillers. Thank you for listening to our latest graphic audio adventure. We want to remind you that the CD you are listening to is an enhanced CD. This enhanced CD will take you to our exciting world of graphic audio on the web. So, don't delay. Just load the CD in your computer, follow the instructions on the screen, sit back, and watch the expansive universe of graphic audio unfold before your eyes. Mm -hmm.